Before We Say Goodbye by Louise Candlish Narrated by Julia Franklin This work is copyrighted 2009 by Louise Candlish This recording is copyrighted 2009 by W.F. Howes Limited The day Maggie Lane dies, she sends her daughter Olivia a letter containing dangerous information. The address of Olivia's first love, Richie Briscoe. Olivia has not seen Richie for over twenty years, not since his desertion of her as a teenager almost destroyed her for good. Convinced that the note represents an admission of guilt, Olivia sets off for the idyllic seaside village where Richie now lives. And now, before we say goodbye. Part One The mute swan is reported to mate for life. However, changing of mates does occur infrequently. The Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Chapter One I knew the moment Lindy opened the door that there'd been a change. Her eyes were several tones paler. The usual warm optimism drained right out of them. What is it? I demanded. Oh, God, she hasn't... No, not that. Her hand was on my elbow, reassuring and ushering in one. But something's not right, Olivia. She seems to be feeling a lot more pain than usual. I've just called for the nurse. I barely glanced beyond the herringbone parquet of the hallway before turning left into the ground floor room where my mother had been cared for these last months. I hardly thought now of the atmosphere that had reigned in the house when Alec was alive. When you'd come through the door and be tugged at once in this direction or that, drawn by a gale of laughter or some sudden whoosh of calamity. Now, in this home-come hospital, all voices, all gestures were designed to deter such excitability. Sometimes it felt as if the mood was controlled by a switch. How was the drive? Lindy asked me. These days she paid almost as much attention to my welfare as she did Maggie's. Fine. It's always better coming west, I started, but was quickly distracted by signs of motion from the patient's bed. She's awake. Olivia. Here. Now I saw the change in her, or rather heard it, for Mum's voice was not so much a whisper as a shatter, as if the original had been dropped on the floor and broken into a hundred pieces. As a small child, I'd felt protected by that voice, by its depth and swell and all-powerful presence. As an older one, I'd listened only for its insincerities. Lindy withdrew, pulling the door shut behind her, and I slipped into the bedside armchair. How are you feeling, Mum? You're not in too much pain? Her right arm, the one not attached to the ivy drip, was tucked under the bedclothes, but I quickly found the shape of her hand through the linen and gave it the gentlest of squeezes. I'm all right. She didn't see well now, and as she spoke, her eyes strained through heavy lids the skin puffed and discoloured. Despite the deterioration, I seemed to have caught her in one of her urgent, lucid moments, which meant there would be no small talk required of me this evening, none of the commentary of routine events at home that always seemed to offer more comfort to me than it did her. I wanted to say, there are things I feel uncomfortable about. Okay? In spite of the circumstances, I couldn't help smiling at that. Uncomfortable was Mum's word for guilty. She also favoured misguided, which had the added benefit of passing the buck to someone else, or better still, to some other higher power. You and him. I shouldn't. But each word was rasped so painfully that I couldn't bear to let her continue. Who? You mean Dean? At the thought of my brother... My chest tightened, and I wished that he was here beside me. For this was surely it. The scene we'd never really believed would come.
the big apology. Maggie Lane was finally ready to tell her children she was sorry. But the voice that spoke next was mine. It's all right, Mum. You don't need to say it. And we both looked a little surprised at that. It was the kind of platitude that belonged in a movie, and God knew I hadn't rehearsed it. After all, wasn't this the plea for forgiveness I'd craved my whole adult life? The truth was, she didn't need to say it. Yes, she'd been a difficult parent. Yes, she'd let us down, especially Dean, who'd begun as her favourite and had further to fall. But what did her crimes amount to, really? If I broke it down, and I didn't mean in a court of law, but in my heart, then there was actually just one thing I knew I couldn't forgive her for. One true betrayal. And it was a betrayal that I couldn't even be certain had happened in the first place. Her hand moved under mine. It had all the strength of a trapped butterfly, and her mouth struggled open once more. No, it's important I tell you both. Again, my voice easily smothered her broken efforts. Mum, don't worry, honestly, it doesn't matter. And I'm sure Dean feels the same. That was an outright lie, and I could see his incredulous face in my mind's eye, his hissed protest in my ear. Why are you letting her off the hook after all this time? Why, Olivia? But I wasn't letting her off the hook. Not exactly. For there was still that one unanswered question. Suddenly it burned hot in my throat. If I didn't expel it, I would be suffocated by it. There's something I need to know, I said in a low, urgent voice. It's about something that happened a long time ago. There was a pause in her breathing and a faint widening of those waterlogged eyes. She had no control of her tear ducts now. Under my hand, the butterfly lay quite still. In the silence, I became conscious of the sound of water splashing from the taps in the kitchen next door, Lindy filling the kettle. She'd soon be back to offer me coffee. I leaned closer to Mum's face. Did you keep us apart? That's all I want to know. She didn't reply, but I read the guilt in her eyes. Just say it, please. Yes or no. The tension between us could almost be smelled, until she at last made an attempt at movement, unmistakably a shake of the head. No. But she was not answering my question, I realised. She was simply feigning confusion. I know you remember, I cried, the sound abrupt and violent in the calm of the room. Did it happen like you said it did? Why can't you just tell me one way or the other? Don't you think I deserve that? My cry had attracted Lindy, and I turned to find her standing just inside the doorway, doing all she could to mask her alarm. Everything about her manner and appearance was gentle, from the slope of her nose to the curl in her auburn hair. I'd come long ago to rely on her as the pacifying antidote to Maggie, just as I'd previously relied on Alec, and in the beginning, Dad. But for once her presence did nothing to soothe me. We were just talking, I said breathlessly. She was answering my question, weren't she, Mum? But she had turned her face away, straining on the pillow to escape me, her throat making a noise like the whimper of an injured animal. Maybe she's a bit tired for conversation, Lindy said, kindly choosing not to point out that a seventy-year-old patient in the middle of a pain management crisis might not be best suited to drama of this sort. And if I weren't so worked up still, I'd have been mortified to have created such a scene at anyone's bedside. Why don't you just sit with her for a while while she sleeps? She'd like that. Indeed, when I turned back, Mum did seem to be slipping into sleep. I couldn't allow myself to suspect that that was feigned as well. Now, with no chance to apologise, I felt like the worst kind of bully. And it wasn't as if I didn't know the rule. Don't say something you might regret in case you don't get the chance to take it back. One I had followed assiduously until now. I ought to go, I said, rising. You said you've got the nurse coming. I don't want to be in the way. Lindy was dismayed. Not yet, surely. You've only just got here. Stay and have a cup of tea, at least. Thank you, but I won't. 
She watched me leave without further protest. And though she couldn't possibly have known what had caused this unscheduled bedside flare-up, her eyes let it be known that I had her sympathies. Often as I drove home alone from my mother's, I would see her face in the windscreen in front of me, crushed and cold like a reproach. Though a reproach for what, I was never quite sure. For having left her house so soon? I was in the habit of keeping visits short where I could, so as not to disrupt my family's schedule too much. Or for not having forgiven her her faults, when this was so obviously the proper thing to do, the right time to say it. Well, tonight I'd at least got halfway there. You don't need to say it. Before I'd gone and ruined it with all that sourness. But this evening it was a different Maggie Lane who appeared in front of me as I drove. It was the full-powered original, the ringmaster with the bright, all-seeing eyes. There were voices, too, beginning with my own, decades younger and painfully shrill. I need to know! Did you make it up? Did he really do it? And then my father's puzzled and anxious. What's she saying? What does she mean? Last came Maggie's reply, full of false tenderness. I think she must be hallucinating or something, poor love. We'd better talk to the doctor in the morning. I blinked the face away, my thoughts returning to the scene that had just passed. There were no two ways about it. I was in the wrong. A dying woman had been trying to make amends, and I'd interrupted her allowing old feelings of rivalry to rise at exactly the point where she couldn't be expected to fight her corner. Fight? She could scarcely speak. Well, I'd be the one to make amends tomorrow. I'd come back and I'd listen to whatever it was she wanted to tell me, however long it took. I'd let her be the judge of what needed to be said. As for my own question, the one that still had the power to keep my life in a suspended sentence, well... She hadn't answered it the first time, and I had to accept that she wasn't going to answer it now. On the passenger seat beside me, my phone was ringing. I pulled over at the next service station and checked the display. Missed call, Lindy. Still with the engine running, I dialed. Olivia, I'm so sorry, but is there any chance you could come back tonight? She's woken up and is asking for you. I'm almost in London, I said, sighing. It's just that she's quite distressed. Lindy never did this. She had to consider it exceptional. The problem was that my body was heavy as lead, and I wasn't sure I could find the strength to finish the journey in either direction. Home was closer. I need to see the boys, I said at last. Why don't I come back in the morning? And Lindy, I'm really sorry if I upset her earlier. I didn't mean to, I just... Of course you didn't she said, hushing my distress. There's no knowing how she's going to react at any given time. We all know that. Thank you. Tomorrow, then, Lindy said. Can I tell her you'll be here in the morning? Yes, I'll set off as soon as the boys have left for school. I told myself afterwards that there was no way I could have known that was the night Maggie would succumb to her last and fatal hemorrhage. It happened in her sleep an eventuality Lindy described as merciful. I told myself there was nothing to feel guilty about, that that was not what she would have wanted. The problem was with Mum, you never knew. Chapter Two The story begins when I'm eleven, or at least that is when it changes. That is when Mum leaves us for the first time. She goes out one Saturday night with a group of girlfriends, raging. Her own word, and one I find a little frightening, as though the women will spend the evening bellowing at each other in anger. Whatever it is they do spend the evening doing, all have returned to their families by the end of it, all except Mum. She has not come back. On Sunday morning, Dad tells us there must be some innocent explanation, a mislift home an eleventh-hour saviour and a sofa for the night. He sets about making the Sunday roast as if expecting her back, in time to help with the gravy. But by late afternoon, the beef is uneaten, 
and there is still no sign of her. Now, he tells us, he is calling the police. The officer who comes to the house is bemused. There has been no row, no incident, nor are there any local murderers on the loose to justify the setting of sniffer dogs on Mum's trail, or the launch of a police helicopter, like the one Dean and I have seen before from our bedroom windows. We're fascinated by the way the searchlight sweeps the neighbourhood's streets and playing fields like a giant's torch. As we watch, we hold our breath, remembering the day's crimes, rigid with the fear that we might be the ones its beam hunts. The two of us listen at the banisters as the officer asks our father questions. He sounds mechanical as if he's reading from a list. Dad hasn't offered him a cup of tea, I whisper. It's the kind of nicety Mum normally takes care of, and I feel a prickle of shame on his behalf. Cops probably only drink whiskey, Dean whispers back. I bet he's got his own hip flask. A sober voice carries towards us. Would you say this is out of character for your wife, Mr Lane? Is she normally a steady kind of person? As Dad hesitates, Dean and I exchange glances. Not exactly comes the answer finally, and we have to strain to catch the words that follow. She can be a bit excitable, I suppose you could say, but she's never done anything like this before. That's why I phoned. His voice cracks on the last word, and although I sense Dean turning again to me, this time I just can't bring myself to look back at him. OK, well, let's hold our horses for the time being. It hasn't been 48 hours yet. By Monday morning, 36 hours, Mum has still not returned, which means that Dad has to iron our uniforms. They still look creased. And drive us to school. We are late. I'm young enough to get so absorbed in the day that I can forget a background crisis like a missing parent, remembering it again only when it's Dad and not Mum who picks me up at home time. But Dean, sitting in the passenger seat in front of me, Looks as if he has not spent his school hours so easily. Is Mum back? He asks straight away. Dad keeps his eyes on the road. Yeah, she is. It's obvious even from here in the back seat that Dean wasn't expecting him to say that. Because when he speaks again, his voice matches the opposite answer. All pained and brooding, as if he wasn't able to switch in time. Where was she then? She was taken ill, Dad says. She couldn't get to a phone to let us know. What? She's been in hospital? No, not hospital. Where then? A pause then. Just drop it, Dean. The important thing is, she's back. This doesn't sound right. But I forget that the moment we reach the house, flying straight to the kitchen like homing pigeons. There is Mum, shuffling pans on the cooker, calling out an everyday greeting, and generally behaving as though nothing has happened. Dean hugs her, which is unusual now he's 13, and I do the same. Her answers to our questions are as short as Dad's, but gradually we discover that she became ill after her night out and spent the rest of the weekend at a friend's house, though not one of the friends she was out with. Dad can't pretend he didn't phone each one of them in turn on Sunday morning and draw blank after blank. Dean calls their version of events the party line. He points out that neither the friend nor the illness is ever actually identified. I am much too young to imagine that another man might have been involved. It happens a second time. This time Dad knows not to bother the police, and by now Dean thinks he has an inkling what the mystery illness might be. Do you think maybe Mum's an alky? Like Irene Robbins's dad, she could be out on a bender. I have no idea what a bender is, but I hope with all my heart that Mum is not like Irene Robbins's dad. Once, I was in Irene's kitchen having tea when he came swaying through the door, chuckling like a demented clown. He smelled so revolting I put my fork down so I could hold my nose. I would never forget how Irene had looked at her mother, panic pouring from her eyes as if to say, make him disappear, please. Then I remember how last time Mum returned magically to the cooker 
neither chuckling nor smelling, and I relax again. She'll come back, I say confidently. And she does. Again, she returns to us after only a day or two. But this time, Dean doesn't hug her. I do, and afterwards he takes me to one side and asks if I thought her breath smelled of rum. No, I say, considering. More like mint. He nods. Tic Tacs. A classic cover-up. It was definitely a bender. There are other times after that. Frequent enough for me to lose count, but infrequent enough for each to bring real fear into the house. It's like someone has walked from room to room, spraying the stuff from a bottle. Just as it fades, you get a fresh hit. A pattern develops. A running order. First, the announcement that she's going out with friends. Then, Dad's offered to collect her himself at a prearranged time and place. Next, her refusal. Last, her disappearance. Soon, Dean and I need only a half glance to read one another's lips. Here we go again. And then, when I'm fourteen, she really goes away. She goes away for a whole year, almost to the day, and my fifteenth birthday is the first family occasion she misses. This time, Dad is in the loop, or at least he's been formally dismissed from it. He explains to us that she has met someone new, a man from Croydon named Nigel, and that he and she are now separated and we will stay with him. It is, he says, a bit like what's happening or has already happened with many of our friend's parents. Does that mean you're getting a divorce? I ask, hating myself for beginning to cry. As far as I'm concerned, it doesn't happen that often. None of my closest friends comes from a broken home. Even Irene's mother hangs on in there with the giggling alky. I don't know yet. Dad touches me awkwardly on the shoulder. We've always been close, Dad and me. And Dean and Mum, too. That's just the way our family is naturally broken into pairs. I wonder how it'll work in a three. He says Mum has promised to be in touch just as soon as she's settled. She may not have a phone yet. Settled where? Dean asks. Why won't she have a phone? I don't know yet, Dad repeats. Why didn't she tell us? I demand. Why didn't she even say goodbye? But he has no answer to that either. It seems to me that he is protecting her, though, of course, what he is really doing is protecting us. Mum writes several times over the next few months. She never gives us an address to reply to, and Dad says this is because she is moving around so much. We inspect the postmarks for clues. Croydon, Harrow, Manchester. And then, after one particularly long silence, Los Angeles. This causes a stir despite ourselves. Maybe she's got a part in a soap opera, Dean says. She'd be good in Dallas. She's a shorthand secretary, not an actress, says Dad. But he doesn't look especially convinced. Chapter 3 The speaker's voice was steady and proud, easily audible at the outer reaches of the congregation. What I will remember most about Maggie is the life she brought to every occasion. Dean, by my side, muttered, Yeah, when she actually bothered to turn up. Shh, I told him, people will hear you. I hope they... Just listen, Dean. Dad's doing a great job. Hmm. If you were looking at it on paper, you'd think our father a strange choice to deliver a eulogy at Mum's funeral. They'd been divorced for over twenty years, after all. In the final analysis of family and friends, it was agreed that she had never cared enough about his feelings, either in the marriage or out, but had simply been fortunate that he had cared so much about hers. But Dad was nothing if not a good sport. In fact, he had come forward to offer his services today rather than waiting to be cajoled into taking part. Apparently, he had no difficulty in gathering enough evidence of his first wife's good character to fill a five-minute speech. He stood before the congregation, looking exactly what he was, the sombre and respectful survivor of a potentially fatal force of nature. A force of nature now contained in a wooden box just feet from him, beautifully crowned with lilies and gerbera. 
The coffin shone in the glow of the candelabrum like sun on glass. Did they polish the wood especially to catch the light like that, I wondered? To create some kind of effect of holy radiance? Maggie always brought people out of their shells, he told us. She had a kind of spark that set situations alight. My brother's mouth moved closer to my ear and left third degree burns. Dean! Lindy and I had agreed that he would be the loose cannon today, and sure enough, when he'd arrived at the church, he was practically giving off the smell of gunpowder. As we took our seats, I'd noticed him look up and eye that grand brass candelabrum, as if plotting to leap up in the middle of a hymn and swing from it like Tarzan. To my relief, I saw that his wife, Beth, had become aware of his subversive commentary and was quick to issue whatever silent sign it was she used to keep him in order. He shut up at once. On my other side, unaware, Russell squeezed my hand. He was following the eulogy with particular attention, as if genuinely making a stab at seeing Maggie through new eyes, recasting her after all this time as the guileless life and soul Dad portrayed. He was a good husband, Russell not the kind to have stepped back and left my difficult family relationships entirely to me. Over the years, he'd come to understand as well as I did that any hope I felt would more often than not be chased by disappointment, and that the only way to diminish the disappointment was to qualify the hope. Which had left him with what? A wife who never quite trusted in good news. I blinked back to the present as the words good news in my thoughts, chimed exactly with those spoken by my father. He was sharing a Maggie anecdote, one of the less controversial ones, obviously. So I said to her, OK, give me the bad news first. And she said, the bad news is the bedroom ceiling's fallen in. What's the good news? I asked her. And she said, the good news is you can see enough of the sky through the hole to know that that hasn't fallen in, at least. There was an appreciative titter, most audibly from my eldest son, Jamie, whose sense of humour was unpredictable. I leaned forward a little to bring into view the line of Chapman males on my left. Russell, Jamie, Noah. Men, really, for both boys had shot up this year, their mid-brown hair losing its pubescent flop and taking on the coarser springiness of their fathers. Each had the same appraising dark eyes under low slanted brows, the same slight pull of a pout about soft, unreadable mouths. From a distance, or perhaps from close by, too, you wouldn't have put my children with me. I was separated from them not only by my colouring, fair hair, blue eyes, but also by the emotional clues. I was sensitive and easy to injure whereas they could be teased non-stop for a week without taking the slightest offence. Russell once said they could contest the award for the world's thickest skin without any need whatsoever to open it up to outsiders. Sometimes it felt as if they were a team to which, through nothing but blind luck, I had found myself attached. Sometimes it felt as if they loved me like a star athlete loves his first coach, the one he knows he's outgrown but keeps in touch with for sentimental reasons. There was a kind of unspoken tragedy about it. But I was being melodramatic again. First that outburst at Mum's bedside, now this maudlin reverie. Recently it was as if my imagination had split its skin and seeped into other areas of my brain. And no wonder, I told myself, look at the situation now. The church, the grief, the dazzling coffin, the sheer perverseness of hearing Dad talking like this, as if he meant it. And he did. It was enough to send anyone mad. Behind us, feet shuffled as he finished up his address. And so, to misquote the Pilgrim's Progress, all the trumpets sound for her on the other side. There was no way Dean was going to let that pass. Yeah, he said under his breath, warning everybody. At Maggie's house, 
The ground floor hospital room had been cleared out and closed up. It was to be redecorated before the estate agent's valuation as a small second sitting room, a place to sit and muse. All doors and windows throughout the rest of the house had been thrown open to the late June weekend, bringing just enough sunlight to lift the gloom that naturally settled over any space where someone had recently died. The combination of fresh air and flowers took care of any lingering medicinal odours. Lindy had suggested I bring some family photographs to pass among the guests and get conversations going, and so I had set large framed ones on bookshelves and sideboards, as well as leaving loose piles of prints on the tables where food and drink had been laid out. Seeing them again had been a surprisingly pleasurable experience for me, and so it was proving for other people too. Little ripples of guests radiated from each picture, issuing oohs and ahs, and cries for someone to check the backs for dates and locations. There was Baby Maggie, in antique monochrome, done up in the various bonnets and sashes of the age. Here, Teen Maggie, in a wasp-waisted cocktail dress, posed on a chaise longue like some sort of Buckingham Palace Deb, even though the picture had surely been taken in her hometown of Wolverhampton. Next, Maggie reintroduced to the world in colour and as a mother. It was as if the two developments were scientifically linked. Was Dean preserved as a narrow-eyed toddler, and me an uncomprehending babe in arms? The one that was proving the favourite was a portrait from my own wedding album. Again, Lindy's idea. The one of Russell and me with our parents. Mum had eschewed the usual mother of the bride chic for something bolder, outlandish even depending on how you rated aquamarine fluted swirls. But that wasn't what I liked about the picture, or why I had chosen it. It was the way she had her arm around me, right around my waist, so you could see her pale fingertips at the other side, as if guiding me and claiming me all at once. That was what I liked about it. They'd done well that day, Mum and Dad. If you hadn't known they were both married to people standing out of shot you'd have thought they were still quite happily together. But one person was less than delighted with today's exhibition, and as he approached, his head bowed slightly as if preparing to butt someone, me. I felt an instant pang of disloyalty. Dean, which one have you got there? Let's have a look. In the photograph, he, I and two other infants circled a birthday cake like baby sharks, my birthday cake, judging by how close my hair hung to the flame. I wondered what my wish had been. For a kitten or a pony, perhaps. It would have been years before I'd begun wishing above all else for a normal mother. Rewriting history already, he asked in a dangerous tone. If ever a man's appearance matched his character, it was my brother's. His eyes and nose were sharp, his hair a black and silver carpet of pine needles. Everything about him was prickly as if he'd been designed to repel aphids. What? I laughed, hoping to brazen this out. You can't say this birthday party didn't happen. Was it my fifth? I can't make out the... You know what I'm saying, he interrupted. All these pictures. I mean, I can understand that Dad had to do it in the church. He could hardly have started slagging her off. But you, here, this perfect Disney version you and Lindy have cooked up. Maggie Lane as Snow White. Yeah, right. I stared at him in dismay. Oh, don't be ridiculous, Dean. This is a funeral, not a murder trial. It's not appropriate to draw attention to the dead person's faults, is it? Half the people here haven't seen Mum for years. They want to remember her at her best. Not listen to us dredging up old family grievances. Well, I'm glad someone had the opportunity to see her at her best. But he paused in brief concession. Just so long as we haven't forgotten what she was really like. All that unforgivable crap she put us through. Unforgivable. It was a word he used routinely to describe our mother's behaviour towards us, but one that I'd slipped from my vocabulary during the last few months, resulting in that spontaneous capitulation at her bedside. You don't need to say it, Mum. How I wish now that I had let her say it. 
if only to discover what it was that she remembered of it all. The difficulty for Dean and me was that her crimes had been mostly in her absences, not her actions, which made them harder to classify, let alone grade. One of the more damning of our adult years had been her missing of Dean's wedding, a drama still debated now and clearly on his mind in the church when he'd made that quip about her not bothering to turn up. Perhaps passing around a picture of my own happy day wasn't such a good idea after all. Anyway, forget that. You're right. It's just for show. It had to be done. He tossed the photograph to the nearest flat surface besides the floor. He still had some sense of decorum, and said what he really wanted to talk to me about was Mum's will. He planned to put in a call to her solicitor the next morning, maybe even this afternoon if he got home in time. Not that we can count on anything. I wouldn't put it past her to have cut us out just to spite us. He cast about for inspiration, spied a watercolour of some coral reef on the wall to his left and added, leave the whole lot to save the octopuses or something equally ludicrous. He directed a meaningful look over my shoulder, turning. I followed his line of vision to where Lindy stood offering a platter of sandwiches to a group of mum's neighbours and added, or to her, more like. I know they were close, but when it comes down to it, she was just a paid employee, wasn't she? It's not like she's flesh and blood. Lindy deserves a reward, I said, with as much fire as I could muster. You know she does. She's looked after mum for years, long before she got ill. Having come to Maggie originally through a cleaning agency, Lindy had spent almost ten years of devoted service as housekeeper, secretary, companion, and finally nurse. She was as good as flesh and blood, as far as I was concerned. And she's handled all of this for us, I pointed out. In fact, the funeral itself, followed by food and drinks for fifty people, was only a part of the task undertaken by Lindy since our mother's death a week ago. The day after we'd got the news, I'd looked up some legal websites and made a list of all the authorities that needed to be contacted after someone had died. It was three pages long, completely overwhelming. But when I'd phoned Lindy about it, she'd assured me she already had it under control, that I shouldn't worry about a thing. I sighed. If Dean couldn't see what I could that Lindy had fulfilled our family duties far better than we had, then he was more of a lost cause than I'd thought. When I spoke again, I hoped it was with finality. We don't need Mum's money, Dean. And anyway, we don't know for sure that she had any. He scoffed at this. Of course she did. She owned this place outright for starters. Plus Alec left her a fair bit, and I don't see how she could have spent it all since. She hardly left the house since finding out she was ill herself. It was true that Mum had reacted to her diagnosis in an unexpected way, withdrawing into herself and embracing each new symptom with an obedient grace. There had been none of the denial and anger and rush to seize what remained of life that I'd read about in the books Lindy had lent me. I frowned at Dean. Even so. Neither of us is badly off as we are. He flashed me a parting look of disbelief before turning away. Speak for yourself, sis. Recently, during the final stages of Mum's illness, I'd felt like I was losing energy, losing life at the same rate she was. Every day a drop emptier. I put it down to a strange mirroring effect like fathers-to-be who feel mysteriously nauseous in the mornings or develop backache if they don't get a seat on the train. Of course, just as likely a culprit was the hours of driving I'd been doing, back and forth, between her house near Cheltenham and ours in South London, three or four times a week in recent months. I suppose rest was what I was searching for when the reception in full swing across the hallway... I was found by Lindy sitting in the window seat in Mum's old room. Without the hospital bed and nursing equipment, the space looked curiously smaller. You need a holiday after this, she said, joining me. It's been a long slog. I smiled gratefully at her. Oh, but I haven't done anything. You've done it all. You've been amazing, Lindy. 
I don't know how we can thank you. You don't need to thank me. Maggie was my friend. She asked me to take care of things and I did, but seriously, Olivia, have you planned a break? I shook my head. Not until August, the boys' school holidays. Maybe you could try to fit something in before then. Just a weekend? A change of scene really helps. Yes. There was a picture on the wall adjacent to the spot where the bed had been. A still life of a bowl of yellow roses on a polished tabletop. How many times had I looked at that picture? My eyes drawn to it, as if to a flickering screen, and thought how incredible it was that the shine of wood could be recreated with buttery paint. Directly opposite the visitor's armchair, it had been the natural place to look as the painkillers pulled Mum under and gave her, and us, respite from her wakeful self. But I'd never seen it from this angle. From here, it looked all wrong. I turned back to Lindy. I suppose I thought that when it was over I'd feel, you know, relief or something. Like you're supposed to. But I don't. I just feel exactly the same. The same inability to relax. The same grinding pressure. The same sense of sinking. Always sinking. Give it time, Lindy said. A delayed reaction's normal. It's only been a few days. That's not what I meant, I thought. I can't remember when I didn't feel this way. She looked delicately at me. Have you thought about seeing your GP? They have people you can talk to, help you work out what it is you're feeling. Yes, I said, my voice just bright enough to stop the suggestion in its tracks. You're right, that's what I should do. Noticing through the window the approach of a late arrival, she rose. I should go back through. Can I bring you something in here, a drink or some food? No. I pulled myself to my feet, forced a smile. No, I'm not the patient. Let's go back together. But as we walked back into the main room, there was a strange, weightless moment when I didn't recognise any of the people in it, including the boys, who were standing near the refreshments with Dean and Beth's daughters, and my husband, and even the woman in the photographs. Then Russell stepped forward to take me from Lindy. It was a seamless practice manoeuvre, almost as if he were taking a physical baton from her. I wondered where you'd got to. You looked tired. Let's get you another drink pronto. What's the strongest thing on offer? Whiskey? He had started to lead me to the drinks table when I burst out unexpectedly, fiercely. I did love her, you know! Russell stopped moving. His features caught in an expression of alarm. Of course you did. No one's ever doubted that. She wasn't all bad, whatever people think. And she loved us just as much as any other parent loves their kids. She just didn't understand that she had to. I broke off in frustration, unable to define what it was that a mother needed to sacrifice of herself in order to be upgraded from the merely loving to the properly good. I felt blood flood my cheeks. Sorry, Russ. I didn't mean to cause the scene. It's okay, I know. Without another word, he stationed me by the drinks and closed my fingers around a glass of whiskey. It was tears he dreaded, I knew, and in a funny way, wished for. He had it on good authority, Beth's. She was training to be a counsellor, that until you cried, you weren't properly grieving. There was an established process, and few deviated from its path. Were he to consult Lindy, he'd probably agree that this was all part of a delayed reaction. Nothing a change of scene couldn't solve. Hang on in there, he said, gently chinking my glass with his. Not long now. And he was right. This wasn't a wedding. Already people were starting to say their goodbyes and leave. Chapter 4 On the surface, nothing much changes without a mother. You still have all your fingers and toes. True, Dad has had to shorten his working hours a bit, rope in a few friends and neighbours to help make sure Dean and I are where we need to be at about the time we're expected to be there. But otherwise, on the surface, it's the same. 
There's still a meal on the table in the evening. Homework still gets done. Chores are still fought over. Dad, even accidentally, introduces a reduced family motto. We're fine on our own. He doesn't notice how often he says it until, as sorry for him as we are for ourselves, we start repeating after him, we're fine on our own. But it is not fine. It is awful. Not only for the permanent gnawing sensation in my stomach that doesn't let up even when I sleep, but also for the way other people are behaving towards us. As the months wear on, I don't know which is worse, the ones who pity or the ones who mock. My school teachers, friends, mothers, half the adults on the street, they can't look at us now without that same mixture of sorrow and indignation. They say they want to know if there's anything they can do, but what they really want to know is, how could she have done it? How? How could she have left these kids? As for the bullies, they've never had it so easy. Being abandoned by your mother is as bright a beacon as weighing 30 stone or coming to school in foul-smelling rags. There's one girl I'm especially wary of. Blonde, bony Samantha Colour. If Samantha were in the wild, she would never grow hungry. Those quick hazel eyes are always the first to spot a change of pace, a dip in confidence. We're not in the same registration class, but we're in the same year, which means our paths cross beyond the standard danger zones of break and lunch hour. For one, we've both been selected for the fifth-year netball team, and we both want to be captain. The teacher picks me. I get picked much more this term. Maybe it's to balance out the being picked on. And when she announces it to the squad, everyone crowds around me to say congratulations. You'll get the yellow sports tie now, my best friend Melanie tells me. All the captains do. They'll do a special presentation in assembly. But Samantha just jeers. Who wants a crappy tie? I'd rather have a mum who doesn't hate me so much she's emigrated. The games teacher overhears her and gives her a detention on the spot. I'm almost as pained by this as Samantha herself. Don't teachers realise it just makes it worse? Now this cow has the perfect opportunity to tell the meanest kids in the school that Olivia Lane has been rejected by her own mother, which she most assuredly does. More comments, more looks, more... Pity. Dean is getting similar reactions in the sixth form, but he is smarter than I am and has turned the whole thing into a comedy routine. He and his friends openly refer to Mum as the deserter. It'd be better if the deserter had just died, he tells me. OK, everyone would feel sorry for us for a while, but at least they'd go away eventually and forget about it. That's a horrible thing to say, I protest. It's a horrible thing to do. Who else's mum just ups and leaves, only ours, the deserter? If this was a war, she'd be shot for cowardice. He considers. They'd have to find her first, though. It's true that we've heard of a few fathers disappearing and then reappearing on birthdays with oversized presents, but we've never heard of a mother doing it. When mothers leave, they're supposed to take their children with them. They're not supposed to miss the birthdays. You realise she's not coming back this time, Dean says, dropping the act and looking at me properly. That's when I know he hurts as much as I do. I recognise what's behind his eyes from the reflection in my bedroom mirror. Despair, basically. I think she will, I say softly, and I do. I still think this is all some terrible misunderstanding. Sometimes, on nights I can't sleep... I imagine her lying murdered in a ditch, undiscovered and unmissed. And I feel guilty for ever having thought she had gone because she didn't love us. I have other theories, too, and decide to test one on Dean. Maybe she's got amnesia. You know, no memory whatsoever of her family back home. And she's not in any of the official systems in America, so they can't work out who she is. People are asking her all these questions, but she's gone completely blank. Her mind is just empty. He just grimaces, the hard guy again. Yeah, she's empty, all right. She's morally bankrupt. Morally bankrupt? 
That's a description he uses a lot for the deserter. It's hard to remember that a few years ago they were still so close. I called him Mummy's boy. Dad gets wind of the bad-mouthing and summons us for a chat. It doesn't do any good to blame her. He says, I know it's hard to understand. I don't expect you to. But Mum sees you as practically grown up. You're 15 now, Olivia, and Dean's in the sixth form. When we were your age, we'd already got full-time jobs. Yeah, but you were still living at home with your parents. I point out, both of them. He sighs, come on, love. For the time being, we don't have any choice. And we're fine on our own. It doesn't matter what good things he makes happen, what treats and presents our grandparents arrange for us. Nothing removes the underlying knowledge that we may be fine, but we are not good enough. Every night when I go to bed, I whisper a secret prayer to God. It's ten years since Dean and his friends told me he doesn't really exist, but now I have a strong need to overrule the older kids and resurrect him. I pray that when I wake up in the morning, Mum will be back. Best of all would be if I woke up and Mum was back and I discovered this had all been a bad dream. The last few months just hadn't existed. I wouldn't even mind having to do the schoolwork twice. When she finally comes back in July of the following year, we hardly recognise her. What I've been praying for so devoutly is no longer actually there. She used to have shiny conker brown hair, curled neatly into her shoulders, but now it is cropped as short as a boy's and bleached white blonde. She used to wear a lot of sensible jumpers, but now she wears bright cotton blazers with big, exaggerated shoulders. She has a startlingly deep tan, too, and some flashy turquoise rocks around her neck that reflect blue in her strangely whiter front teeth. She also has a new husband, though not, as it turns out, Nigel, the man for whom she originally left Dad. This one is called Warren, an American who she has known for less than six months. And nor is he technically her husband, even though she calls him that, because she and my father are not yet divorced. I can't wait for you to meet him. You're going to love him, she exclaims to Dean and me, trying to clutch us to her with an excitement we're clearly supposed to share. She acts like she's been away for a short holiday, not a year. Or the way she speaks about this Warren character, just down to the high street, to collect a long-awaited pet. I picture him being delivered to our door in a hutch. Don't grab me like that, Dean protests. And I have to agree, I don't like it either. She didn't do it before. She didn't need to. Oh, come on, she says to him. Don't you love me any more? And we stare at her, off balance, because that's what we want to ask her. It's weird being in the same room as her, finding her in front of my eyes wherever I go. I marvel that I'm not more overcome with emotion, not overcome at all. I would have expected to be crying and squealing and praising the Lord to have had those nightly prayers answered. It's too late says Dean, glumly, and he's right. She is too late. It's as if she stayed away just a day beyond the point at which we might still have been won back. Or maybe it isn't the length of her absence that's been the problem, but our ages during it. Maybe she's missed the formative year. Maybe there was a single moment when we just grew up. It doesn't matter because she's still bubbling over with plans for us all. As soon as Warren gets in, we'll start looking for a house as close to here as possible, so you guys can come over whenever you like. How does that sound? If Dad doesn't mind, of course. Like that would concern her. And it's almost the school holidays. What perfect timing. Oh, I'm so happy to be back. That's when I first notice her new way of speaking. Mid-Atlantic, Dean says it's called. Get in for instance, so casual, like she's used to flying in and out of different time zones at the drop of a hat. As a family, we've flown only once, and she was the most nervous of all of us. As for the you guys, does she really think she can make us believe we are one happy, equal band of brothers? Dean is the first to respond. 
I don't think so, he says, and refuses to look her in the eye. We live here, remember? Yeah, I add sullenly. We've already got a house. We don't need another one. Mom just smiles bravely and turns her big-eyed, thickly mascarad gaze on Dad. She seems to be appealing to him for help in winning us over. Talk about nerve. But Dad just retreats wearily to the sidelines. He no longer needs to protect us. By now we know our own minds, and they're full to the brim with resentment. Of course, we don't know yet that she still has her trump card to play. Chapter 5 So, are you feeling okay, Mum? Hold up all right today? It was Russell who spoke, not Jamie or Noah, though he did so with a deliberation that was clearly meant to demonstrate to the two of them the concern they might be showing for their poor mother, but glaringly were not. I never thought we'd have to teach them to care, I'd said to Russell years ago. Isn't that supposed to be innate? And he'd shrugged, considering, maybe not for boys. I thought on this occasion he was being a bit ambitious. After all, this was a first for the boys, who had been too young to be affected by Alec's death, and hadn't known him particularly well anyway. No, the funeral had done its job in drawing a line under the experience for them, if not for me, and I knew we should be pleased that it had. Jamie briefly puckered his brow in my direction before returning to the computer printout he was reading. This had just been pressed on him by Noah, who sat opposite him at the kitchen table. Head to head, that was the typical arrangement for the boys, rarely these days side by side. The advantage Jamie had in intellect was easily balanced by Noah's confidence, his savvy. They were complementaries on the colour wheel. Both had finished eating and had pushed their plates aside to devour the printed word. They always brought schoolwork to the dinner table, or something to read. Opportunities for learning didn't stop with the requirement to refuel. It was just one of the million ways in which they differed from the national average. You've hardly said a word since yesterday, Russell continued. He had also wolfed down dinner, eating far too quickly for his taste buds to have had anything but the most glancing contact with the various food elements. Sometimes I felt like testing them, asking what it was they had just been served. It might have been warmed up papier-mâché for all they cared. Not that I wasn't used to male feeding habits by now, of course. Jamie was fourteen and Noah approaching thirteen. But that didn't stop me from yearning sometimes for a fellow female who might savour her meals or, since we were on the subject, murmur a word or two of appreciation once in a while. I think you're in shock, you know. Russell looked thoughtfully at me. He seemed a bit numb. It can't be shock if what's caused it didn't happen suddenly, Jamie said, finally prompted to contribute. His antennae for technical inaccuracies were permanently abuzz. Grandma was ill for ages. Russell frowned at him. Normally very patient with Jamie's need for preciseness. This evening he wasn't in the mood for it, I could tell. I don't see why it can't still be a shock, he said. The death of a parent is one of life's major traumas, however much warning you get. Hopefully you won't come to realise that for a very long time, eh, mate? At this, Jamie and Noah exchanged a secret look. I like to pretend that it was a recent thing, this certainty of theirs that they knew better than us. But we all understood that it was not. Any word on the will? Russell asked me. That made me think of Dean and our sour little exchange at the funeral. I think wills are totally macabre, Jamie remarked. What does macabre mean? Noah asked. His brother shrugged. It means fucked up. The phrase jolted me for reasons beyond the obvious. Boys! It wasn't me! Noah protested, but only half-heartedly, because he knew they could get away with anything at the moment. My perspective had shifted, had done ever since I'd increased the frequency of my pilgrimages to Mum's house, 
leaving the two of them, the three of them, out of focus. And Noah was not one to look a gift horse in the mouth. Macabre means gruesome, Jamie corrected himself matter-of-factly. It's from the French and refers to the dance of death. That sounds about right, Russell said smoothly, though he knew as well as Jamie did that he could never have produced so dictionary-perfect a definition. He reached for their plates and stacked them on top of his own. Now hop it, boys, if you're finished. Mum and I need a minute on our own. I had never ceased to admire his natural command of our children, a knack I still lacked even after fourteen years of practice. There had been times when I'd worried my lack of instinct might be genetic, that I might take after Maggie. But I'd learned to suppress the fear and concentrate instead on simple gratitude that at least one of us was able to get them to vaguely do what we wanted them to do. As they retreated to the PC at the far end of the room, Russell got up and began transferring the dishes to the sink. This was new. I wasn't used to being treated as helpless, even if I felt it. I looked about the kitchen, unable to stop myself noting the jobs that needed to be done. It was a long, narrow space, taking up most of the basement floor of our terraced house, and with its stripped floorboards and battered wooden units, had the feel of an old boat. Not exactly ship though, for the mess was back, I saw, despite Russell's efforts. The low tide maintained over the last week had been replaced once more with the churned-up breakers of newspapers and magazines, circulars and bills, dumped bits of uniform, the school newsletters that never stopped coming. In a way, it was a relief. My eye drifted to the calendar that hung from a nail by the corkboard. I looked at this at least twenty times a day, sometimes for a specific reason, other times in the way a dog might check its empty bowl, for comfort, out of habit. Lately I'd spent so much time staring at it, I might as well have scheduled slots for the activity in the same way I did the boys' dental appointments and after-school clubs. The calendar was of a kind designed specially for busy families, with a column for each individual as well as one for the whole family to share. This, presumably, was where one noted the clan picnics that never took place, the family theatre trips that didn't get booked. Each person was supposed to fill in their own column. But in reality, I did it for all of us, cornering the other three in turn every Sunday evening and writing down their commitments for the week ahead. The manufacturer had anticipated this, it seemed, for the rules type and array of witty little illustrations, were all in pink. Tomorrow's entries were fairly typical. Russell, meeting in Swindon, home late. Jamie, 8.30 school. After school debating club, we'll have art project, collect from Newton Building, 5.15. Remember P.E. kit for tomorrow. Noah, 8.30 school. Tennis match at A.H.S., back for dinner. Important. Also needs tennis kit Friday. My own column was empty. I kept a separate portable list of duties, too long to cram into the space provided. In any case, few items related to me, even though I was the one undertaking them. It was all about the boys in this house, their schedules, their needs, and those of their school, the famous, much sought-after Herring School. It had taken a while to notice what was unusual about Jamie. He was our first child and there was no one to compare him with, not openly. At mother and toddler gatherings, it was understood by all who attended that the smallest post, the faintest put down, would put one at risk of expulsion. A policy I endorsed to the full. Who wanted to get jealous about small children? They did that perfectly well on their own. Family offered a better opportunity for observation for Dean and Beth had had their daughter Isabel only nine months after we'd had Jamie. But the problem was that Dean got so competitive about the two cousins. I quickly learned to play down any sparks of talent Jamie might show, if my brother hadn't already done so. Well, he is that bit older, Olivia. Then his nursery school teachers began making remarks. He concentrates so well for a boy... He's very serious. He gets so frustrated. 
We think he wants to do things a lot more complicated than his hands will let him. He told us he was trying to make a high chair for his brother. Out of toothpicks and Play-Doh, imagine that. Normally they just do a hedgehog. Soon, a crop of questions followed. Have you taught him to read at home? Does he spend a lot of time with older children? Have you noticed how extensive his vocabulary is? The school assessments spelled it out more formally. He was only just four, but he might have been six or seven. He was advanced. When the offers of places were made, the headmistress of our favourite school phoned to ask when we expected to hear from Herrings. She wanted us to know that there would be no problem with our taking a few extra days, beyond her own deadline, to make our decision. I realised that she assumed we meant to accept her offer, only if this Herrings turned us down. I was too embarrassed to say I'd never heard of the place. But as soon as I'd put the phone down, I looked it up in the phone book and drove the few traffic-clogged miles west to pick up a prospectus. The pictures showed small children with unusually determined faces, and the introductory text spoke of a special provision for the gifted. Gifted? Well, I'd seen the movies and read the newspaper features. Gifted was a bad thing. It meant your child couldn't relate to ordinary people, or worse, that they couldn't relate to him. I'd seen child geniuses occasionally on TV, being gently mocked on chat shows, or gaped at as they completed some devilish puzzle. And I'd thought, what was the use of a university degree at thirteen? Who wants to be different at that age? Logically, though, a school like Herrings might be the only place where Jamie wouldn't be different. And so I rang to arrange to take him for a visit. I don't understand it, I said to the headmaster, Mr Kendall, when the tour had been completed and he'd offered us a place on the spot. Neither Russell nor I are particularly talented at anything. He nodded. It's a common misconception that gifted children must come from gifted parents. But with two geniuses for parents, the child would actually be less likely to be one himself. In that situation, he would simply revert to the mean. I see, I said, already a little lost. I had a sense that the mean might have made for an easier life, especially when I considered Noah. Since his arrival, 18 months after Jamie, he'd consistently been pronounced normal. How would he feel when he went to a different school, one for the ungifted? But I needn't have worried. Though he didn't have Jamie's natural abilities, Noah had excellent coattails from which to hang, or, as Kendall put it, the best one-to-one -one tutor you could ask for from the first day of his life. And he didn't mean me. In some ways, he was in a better position than a gifted child who lacked direction. Besides, not everyone at Herrings was super bright. Some were just bright. And when the time came, Noah was accepted alongside his brother without argument. Later, as we applied ourselves to a bottle of wine, Russell said, gently prompting, So, Maggie's will. When do you think we'll hear? I took a gulp. Any time now, I think. Dean was talking about it yesterday. Lindy's in charge. She's Mum's personal representative. That's what they call it. In fact, I'm sure she said she was meeting the solicitor today in Cheltenham. Or maybe it was tomorrow. He nodded. She'll let us know later in the week, then. Though he spoke casually enough, when you'd been married to someone for this long, the casualness merely alerted you to the more profound emotions below the surface. Despair in this case, or exhaustion. Like many men new to middle age, Russell was tired of his job, could hardly bring himself to call it a career any longer. In his early forties and already counting down to retirement, his condition had become self-fulfilling. An outsider would think it wasteful, absurd, but when it came to careers, I was in no position to judge, not having one myself. I was the one who was wasteful. Dean seems to think we'll just split the proceeds of the house down the middle, I said, plus whatever else there is. I felt no thrill at the prospect. In fact, I felt detached from it. But I knew Russell would be reassured by the information. Yes, a legacy would be a convenient rescue package, especially if it was enough to facilitate an escape route for him. Perhaps even a return to old passions. 
so old I had trouble remembering what they were, and wondered if he did too. Woodwork was one, that was right. It had been Russell who had been attracted to our hull of a kitchen. Once he dreamed of being a cabinet maker, coaxing boards of walnut and oak into gentle curves, smoothing the joins together to a quality of finish you never found in shopboard stuff. And Dean as well. Perhaps the money might do something towards easing his heartaches. I hoped so. How unrecognisable he now was from the boy I'd huddled together with at the banisters, desperately transmitting our support for our father while willing Mum to walk back through the door and end the torment. He'd been about the same age then as Jamie and Noah were now, and in many ways he'd been more appealing. There'd been more vulnerability to him, more humility. But remembering now the way a grimace had contorted his features yesterday, making him look almost demonic as he brandished that photograph, I became aware once more of the terrific heaviness in me. It was as if I was twice my age and my bones could no longer bear their own weight. Rising to fetch an aspirin from the drawer, I thought of that phrase Jamie had used earlier. The dance of death. Yes, I had no doubt that was what we all squared up to now. Chapter 6 Mum's letter came the next day. The first shock was in receiving it at all, in seeing her handwriting on the envelope. Upright and rather hesitant. Not at all what you would have imagined of someone so headstrong. And knowing that the blood in her fingers had still flowed when she'd held pen to paper. Wondering if this might have been the last thing she'd written. Whether these counted as her final words. The second shock was that it should come now with only the second rattle of the letterbox since we'd buried her. But that, at least, was easily resolved. Surely she'd only put into words what I had not allowed her to say at our last meeting. This was her apology for those uncomfortable times she had put us through. I imagined her pressing the envelope on Lindy with that frail, free hand, finding final energy where it had been all but sucked dry. The third shock was the contents for it wasn't a letter at all, and nor was it even in Mum's handwriting. She'd only addressed the envelope. But in a stranger scribble. Richie Briscoe, 2, Angels Lane, Millington, Dorset. That was it. A half sheet of lined paper with a name and address on it. No covering note, no explanation. So much for a last attempt at penitence. Unless... The nerve ends in my fingers flared slightly, causing the paper to flutter and I closed my eyes. Unless she'd understood only too well that final anguished question of mine, the one that had burst from me after decades of being held in abeyance, the one she had turned her head from as if from the devil himself. Unless this was her answer. Richie Briscoe. The first man I had loved and the only one there had been to love, hate or otherwise, before Russell came along and offered the alternative that had brought me back to life. Was I to take this missive at face value and understand that the address I held in my hands was his address? Could it be true that he was living now in England and not in the United States? Or was this something quieter, just a place that held a clue or a connection to something I didn't yet know? Whatever it was, it was clearly intended to be somewhere to start. To restart. Reading the words a second time, I allowed my thumb to trace gently over the characters that formed the name. Richie Briscoe. I wasn't sure how much time passed before I heard someone whisper the words aloud, or how many seconds later it was before I realised the voice was mine. Rooted to my seat in the living room, I allowed my gaze to sweep every wall and surface, every object, and to wander. I'd done this before, not often enough to call it a ritual, more a kind of occasional treat or torment, depending on my mood, but never had it felt so necessary as now. To look in turn at the family photographs, the pictures Russell and I had chosen for the walls, our vases and books and DVDs, 
and to wonder what would be in their place had it been Richie instead of Russell. Had he not left me, had it been me he had married and not... Well, I knew only the name that Mum had supplied me with and it was just as likely false as true. What would the faces in the photographs show then? And when I looked in the mirror, what would mine show? Sometimes I felt like a teenager again. Only instead of dreaming of the future, our future, I dreamed of the past. The past I had never been allowed to live, but which I believed in my heart was the one that I'd been meant to live. But I knew the answer to that. I'd repeated it to myself often enough as I sat on the sofa and wondered. Stop dreaming. I had made my great leap of faith to Richie Briscoe long ago, and I'd landed not in quicksand exactly, for it hadn't sucked me completely under, but on volatile ground, on a fault line. The adventure had shaken me. It had taken something from me that had never been recovered. Innocence, perhaps, or grace. Whatever it was that Mum was asking me to do, I wasn't sure I could do it. Unendurable though it was, I managed a full twenty-four hours before extracting the road atlas from the car and looking up Millington just as I had known I would, and more to the point, as she had known I would. It was a village in West Dorset, not far from Weymouth. Maybe because of the mental image I still held of Richie himself, I had automatically pictured some sort of surfer's resort right on the beach, tanned teenagers with beads in their hair and lifeguards dressed in red. But a quick search on the internet told me Millington was not like that at all. It was a small country village a mile or so inland, tucked picturesquely between ridge and sea. The area was rich in archaeological interest and attractive to tourists for its nearby swannery and botanical gardens. Zooming in on the digital map, I was able to locate Angel's Lane easily, a street on the southern edge of the village nearest the coast. I estimated that it would take about three and a half hours to reach Millington by road and probably less time still by train. Hardly knowing why, I prized from the bookshelf a second atlas, this one containing maps of the world, and my fingers found North America, the West Coast, Northern California, Santa Cruz. I remembered how Richie and I had looked together on the antique-style globe in the living room at Dad's, the one that lit up from within and doubled as a lamp. He'd shown me his hometown, as well as the town further north where he'd been born and had lived for most of his childhood. We'd traced a route across the Pacific to Hawaii and on to Australia to the Great Barrier Reef and Ayers Rock, the cities of Sydney and Perth. And we'd talked about making our fortunes and going travelling. Making our fortunes, like a line from a child's fairy tale, as though the idea of travel was completely out of reach. Perhaps we'd sensed, even then, that we would meet greater resistance from our parents than a pair of step-siblings-to-be might ordinarily expect to when proposing a trip together. Or maybe the obstruction was more practical than that. Richie was two years older than I was. Our gap years would not coincide, and it would be another five years before we were both free of college. On top of that, our educations were taking place in different continents. Travelling together was out of reach. At the sound of the phone ringing, I put the atlas away, grateful for the interruption. Olivia, is that you? It was Lindy. How are you bearing up? I'm fine, I said, adding, I think. And you? Are you OK? Oh, not too bad. It's a bit strange in the house, now the funeral's out of the way. A bit... She stopped, and I imagined her catching herself not wanting to presume that her grief might be a fraction as intense as mine. I longed to fill in the word for her, but I didn't know which one to choose. Empty, flat, anticlimactic, lonely. And in the end I left it to her to break her own silence. Olivia, the reason I'm calling is I've just spoken to Dean and I'm afraid he got quite angry. I groaned. What's wrong now? It's a bit awkward, actually. I mean, I do understand, but there's really nothing I can do about it. I met with Adrian Bellamy, your mother's solicitor, yesterday, and it seems she's left very specific requirements regarding her will. 
Really? You mean we know the details already? Instantly, an image of Russell's face filled my mind, that shoot of hope in wintry eyes. No, Lindy said, the opposite. It's going to take a little while. Why? Is there a problem? No, it's just that... Well, for one thing, she wants a formal reading. Apparently they don't normally do that, not any more. They just send out copies to everyone concerned and take it from there, but Maggie didn't want that. This time, she didn't need to finish the sentence. I knew the story. Mum would have insisted on the arrangement she knew from films and novels. Where was the drama in everyone opening their copies separately, jotting down little calculations on the back of a Sainsbury's receipt? Where were the collective gasps and the fists clenched in triumph? Knowing Mum, she had probably left a strict seating plan, a script to refer to, a personalised feud for every family member. I sighed. OK, no problem. When is it? We're looking at next week now, I suppose. Let me just grab the calendar. As I reached for a pen, I willed her to agree, as though a delay until the following week might make some sort of difference to me. Why this should be, I wasn't yet prepared to admit to myself. That's the thing, Lindy said. She doesn't want it to take place for another six weeks. Six weeks? I was taken aback. Can she stipulate something like that? I'm not sure, but she has, and Mr Bellamy felt there was no reason not to respect her wishes. It's not like these things move particularly quickly at the best of times. Getting the house on the market will take a few weeks anyway, and I have access to enough money to settle her final bills and that sort of thing. Of course. All right, then, if you're sure it doesn't complicate things for you. That's fine with me. There was the sound of pages turning. We've professionally agreed a time for the last week in August. Does that work for you? It'll mean coming to Cheltenham. OK. I flipped the pages of the calendar until I found the right one. She was talking about the week before the start of a new school year. A whole summer holiday away. As well as a family trip to the Algarve, the boys had a variety of activities lined up for the break leaving me the breathing space to resume my job hunt. At least, that was how Russell put it. Breathing space. Resumption. Such easy, positive words. I thought of it more as standing on the edge of a high cliff and waiting to be blown off. I marked in the solicitor's appointment. Lindy, while I've got you on the phone, can I ask you something? Of course. Go ahead. I just got something in the mail from Mum this morning. Yes, I posted it for her. I'm glad it's arrived safely. Her voice was matter-of-fact, unintrigued. Did you see what was inside? No. When she gave me the envelope, it was already sealed. I just wondered if you knew who might have written it. But even as I spoke, I realised the obvious answer. Richie's father, Warren Briscoe. No one else in Mum's address book would have kept up to date with Richie. Mum must have written to him to ask for it. But when? And what had made her do it? I assumed it was from Maggie herself, Lindy said, sounding puzzled. No, only the envelope is in her writing. When did she give it to you, Lindy? Was it that night? Just before she... went? We were still experimenting with euphemisms for death, but I already knew that went was definitely not going to work, and nor was gone. There had been far too many wents and gones while Maggie was alive. No, Lindy said. It was a while ago, actually, before she got too weak to hold a pen properly. You saw how she was in the last few months. She was having to dictate all her final bits of correspondence, and even that was a real struggle for her. Of course. I'd forgotten that. How could I have been so stupid? During my last few visits... Maggie had not been able even to prop herself up on the pillows. There was no way she would have had the strength to sit up and address an envelope. And that was before you considered the problem of her failing eyesight. I don't understand, I said, frowning. She gave it to you months ago, but she didn't want you to send it until now. That's right, she was very specific about that. She wanted me to post it the day after the funeral, not a moment before. Did she say why? No, but she didn't need to. 
Lindy paused tactfully. Because she wanted to be sure she wouldn't be around when I read it. I supposed I ought to be grateful that she hadn't saved it for this big meeting with Bellamy, had him announce it in front of Russell and Dean and the rest. Unless... Unless that was part of the point. I don't suppose there are any other letters, were there? For the first time I considered the possibility that Richie had received one too, a copy of my address, and the thought frightened and exhilarated me at once. No, Lindy said, that was the only one, I'm sure of it. Okay, thank you. Thank you for everything. Remembering her original reason for phoning, I sighed. And just ignore Dean, you know what he's like. He takes after his mother. We hung up. I wondered if Lindy's thoughts were working along the same lines as mine, but on reflection, it seemed unlikely. Her natural discretion, if not her ignorance of the contents of the letter, would prevent her from seeing what was clear to me. There was a link between this mysterious delay in the release of Mum's will and the mission she had set me in her letter. A direct link. For it was a mission, I was certain of it. She had known I would agonise and dither about it, and so she had created a way to give me time. Six whole weeks worth. She wanted me to go and find Richie. She wanted to give us a second chance. Chapter 7 It is the summer of 1984 when Warren Briscoe arrives in the UK to be converted by my mother to the joys of suburban London living. Though he is from the city himself, San Francisco, he has the brute energy, stocky proportions and checked shirts of a rodeo cowboy. He is younger than she is, well-mannered and generous, impossible to dislike in spite of the circumstances, and, most importantly, he does not come alone. Along for the ride is his son, Brian, after Jones or Wilson. The story varies. Richard Briscoe, known to everyone as Richie. For me, Richie changes everything. Straight away I see that everything until now, every one until now, has been second best. He is eighteen, not quite a year older than Dean, and has just graduated high school in Santa Cruz, where he lives with his mother, and will be returning in late August for the fall semester of his freshman year at college. Just hearing terms like fall semester and freshman year gets Dean and I all excited. Until now, our exposure to American culture has been limited to soap operas and music videos. Family holidays have hardly taken us further than Calais. To us... California, with its surf parties and Harley Davidsons and Pacific Coast Highway, is glamorous beyond words. Unlike his father, Richie looks the part. If I'd been asked in art class to paint a Californian beach boy, he is what I would have painted. He is blue-eyed and blonde, of course, his hair long over his ears and neck, and deeply tanned all over. Sun-kissed. I tell Melanie in an American accent, making us both collapse into girlish laughter. He wears his clothes loose over a lean, muscular body, but is equally comfortable with bare skin, often going about barefoot and sometimes bare-chested, too. I know long before touching him how he will feel, taut and hot and with a pulse you can find all over him. This is a seriously fucked-up situation he says to Dean and me that first day, just as soon as the three of us are left alone together. Richie, we quickly learn, thinks a lot of things are fucked up, and this serves only as a source of amusement to him. His voice is exactly the slow drawl I would have hoped for, the sound of someone who's just been pulled out of a long snooze in the sun. My mom is going crazy back home. Why? Dean asks. Richie sends him a conspiratorial look. Because she's a control freak, and I'm a million miles away. He says this as if it's a question for us to reply to, but then supplies the answer himself. She's lost him, and now she thinks she's losing me. How did they meet? I stammer, finding his assertion breathtakingly insightful. I mean, Maggie and Warren. 
It's the first time I use her name as he does, and it feels disloyal somehow. He tells us they met in Warren's office, a construction business in the Bay Area, with a couple of big contracts and a workforce of 40 or so. Warren has been instrumental in sorting out Mum's work permit and stuff. Richie laughs out loud when we ask if you can see the Golden Gate Bridge from the office. Are you kidding? He's an R from the city. I grew up in a great neighbourhood, but it's a real pit where Dad lives now. Mom seriously screwed him in the divorce. Our house in Santa Cruz is a million times cooler. Really? Now it is we who are disbelieving. And in my case, seriously crestfallen. Mum's desertion was a whole lot more understandable when I pictured her in Hollywood or Las Vegas. Or perhaps travelling between the two in a bubblegum pink convertible. But now all I can think is, why did she prefer working in a low-grade job in a pit on the other side of the world to being at home with us? Where she belongs. That's the phrase Dad uses in conversations with the grandparents, though not when he thinks we're in earshot. In any case, whether she's here to show Warren and Richie off to us or us to them, Mum has come back. There is no denying that. Now it is Warren who leaves his real life in the hands of a partner, albeit a business one, a man called Brad, who phones frequently to campaign for his return. Richie tells us Brad disapproves of Warren's proposal to invest his money in a property over here. Don't know why the Bradster is getting so mad about all this. Dad won't go through with it, he says. I watch his lips as he talks. They look dry and sort of salty as though he's joined us directly from the beach. There is no way this will last. Why not? I protest. Nothing lasts with our mother, Dean agrees, over the top of me. Though he matches Richie in nonchalance, I can detect the raw hurt in his voice even if Richie can't. Richie himself does not seem to be doing any hurting. This turn of events means nothing more to him than a free holiday, a mellow way to pass the summer, to use his own favourite adjective. He says he's always thought Europe would be mind-blowing, especially England. He seems to think this includes Scotland. And now he's here, it looks just as wild as he'd pictured it. It is incredible to us that he might consider anything about suburban South London mind-blowing or wild. But apparently he does. To us, it is obvious that he is the mind-blowing one. He's the wild factor. And soon there is evidence to back this up. Being male and closer in age to him than I am, Dean is his natural guide, and on one of the first nights in town, he takes him to the 18th birthday party of a mate from school. All the girls start acting weird at the mere sight of him, my brother reports the next day, even before he puts on tapes with music they've never heard and makes everyone kamikazes, some kind of vodka drink, I learn. After they've all, at his instruction, downed several of these in one, they form a human chain and jump into the pool, even though it's raining and the water isn't heated. Some of the girls take their tops off. For this last detail alone, my brother has dropped his cynical act and declared himself a convert. Already, Dean doesn't say goodbye, he says, sayonara like Richie. Or, if he's going the whole hog, sayonara, sucker. Richie got that from his friend Troy back home. Troy! No one in England is called Troy. Dean thinks it's cool. And soon, we're all saying it. My mother, of course, is just as enchanted by Richie as we are. Isn't it fun having a new brother? She asks me in her breathless new accent. He's not my brother, I argue, you and Warren aren't married. We will be, though, just as soon as the divorce is final. She rolls her eyes. Why does everything have to take so long in this country? In the States, you could sort this out in a jiffy. Why is it that here, people always want you to suffer for your mistakes? There's a lot I could say to that. Like everything that's happened is her doing, and maybe she should be suffering a little bit. Or like... If she's saying her whole marriage to Dad has been a mistake, then doesn't that imply that we are too, Dean and I? But instead, I make the point that's suddenly more important to me than any of that. Even if you do marry Warren, Richie would only be a stepbrother. 
I feel my face flush and hope she won't notice. She does, of course. What's got into you? Oh, Olivia, don't tell me you're developing a little crush on him. I'm not developing anything on anyone. But my hot cheeks say otherwise. She groans, pulls a face of exaggerated motherly concern. Well, I hope not, sweetie, because he's a lot older than you. I know it won't help, but I can't resist arguing with her. What, two years? That's not a lot older. Excuse me, it most certainly is when one of you is only fourteen, and it's a lot more than two years. I'm fifteen, I correct her, disgusted. Sixteen next month. We're two years and four months apart. Mum nods, too ashamed of her error to mock me for the preciseness of my calculation. But that doesn't change the fact that Richie is a grown man. No offence, but... I don't think it would occur to him to think of you like that. I don't want him to. Don't go on about it. I wish I could take this horrible liquid heat from my face and scold her with it. The only way I can think to get out of this conversation is to blurt out a question I've longed to ask her since she's been back, but not dead. Mom, why did you bring Warren to England? Why didn't you just stay in California where he already has a house? Her mouth gapes and I see the line inside the lower lip where her matte cherry lipstick stops, and the moist blue-pink skin begins. Because you're here, of course, Dolly. You and Dean. I missed you guys. Oh. I'm not sure whether I should enjoy the pleasure that floods my body at this declaration, not to mention her first use of my childhood nickname in years, or simply pretend it isn't happening. Either way... I think she is as relieved as I am when Warren swaggers into the room and breaks our little moment. Chapter 8 In the end, I went suddenly on impulse, or at least that was how it felt, though of course the urge must have been brewing from the moment I opened the letter. It was Saturday, mid-morning, and the boys were out. Jamie had made his own way to Mind Stretchers, a Saturday maths group run by the school, while I had driven Noah to the swimming pool for his diving lesson. Parental attendance at either activity was so far out of the question as to be a punishable offence. Even delivery duties were permitted only grudgingly. As for goodbye kisses, well, any public display of affection had been forbidden for years. I could probably find the exact day on an old calendar somewhere, the day an older boy had first sneered at the presence of a younger one's mother at the school bus pickup. I wondered sometimes if all of this was the same with daughters. No. It certainly didn't feel like the last time I would see my sons for a while. Though Noah and I had chatted quite happily on the way to the pool, it hadn't worried me that Jamie had been running too late for conversation. His only communication was to ask me if Dad and I had looked at the details for the residential course he wanted to sign up for during the summer holidays. Yes, I said, but I didn't think we could afford it. These courses were expensive. And he'd groaned, not sullenly, more in the way a scientist might if his lab experiment had not turned out as hoped. There had to be another way to get the result he needed. Did that groan of his amuse me or irritate me, cause me guilt that I couldn't always meet his needs, or even understand them, if I was honest? Either way, it was a pretty standard Saturday morning. At least, that was how it felt as I parked the car and climbed the steps to the front door. Russell? As I let myself back into the silent house, I breathed a sudden confidence through my lungs, a feeling I hadn't experienced for so many years I didn't even recognise it at first. Freedom. In that moment, I knew that if I didn't do it now, I never would. Now or not at all, that was my choice. Now. Instantly, adrenaline flooded my veins, making an easy glide of the two flights of stairs to my bedroom. Pausing only to stuff my overnight bag with a change of clothes and a handful of toiletries, I skipped back down to look for Russell. He was in the back garden, still in his dressing gown, chopping away at the ivy-choked hedges. A large heap of trimmings lay at his feet, and as he sidestepped them, tendrils began tangling around his ankles as though still growing. He did this sometimes, 
woke up in a gardening mood and went straight out to get on with it. No thought even to brush his teeth. I stood on the patio a while, just watching. Noticing me at last, he wiped his brow with a dirt-caked gardening glove and asked, Any chance of a coffee? I eyed the full mug on the wall near his feet. He never finished a drink when he was gardening. Ross, how would you feel if I went off by myself for the weekend? What? He took another swipe with the shears and stepped back to judge his work, the unnoticed shackles of ivy causing him almost to overbalance. I reached forward to move a stone duck out of range. Uh, I think that's a great idea, Liv. Exactly what you need. Some time with friends. Just let me know when, and I'll make sure it's in my diary. No, I said. Not with friends. And I mean this weekend. Now. At last he stopped his hacking and gave me his full attention. Now? Why? Still clutching the shears, he moved towards the steps. The lawn was raised from the patio by a few feet, and I had to tip my head back slightly to meet his gaze. Its innocent bafflement reminded me of Noah when I interrupted his computer game to remind him to have his bath. I don't know how to explain it. I just feel a bit odd. And though I was concealing something from him, I was also telling the truth because I did feel odd, and I didn't know how to explain it. Odd? In what way? Russell asked. I... I just feel like I need some air. As my eyes pleaded with him to get it, to nod and let me go, he dodged the rose bush and came slowly down the steps to join me. Next thing, a gloved hand had landed on my shoulder and was giving it a clumsy squeeze. A flake of dried dirt dropped to the ground. Well, that's understandable. It's a huge thing, what's happened. Why don't you spend a bit of time with your father? You didn't get much of a chance to talk at the funeral, did you? I shook my head. No, that's fine. He's about to go on holiday anyway. He won't be around much this summer. Dean, then? No! My vehemence startled both of us. All at once, the hedges, grown for privacy, felt confining and oppressive. It seemed vital that I be unfixed from this spot immediately, placed in the street, pointed away. And though Russell was as mild-mannered a man as any I'd met, it took every ounce of my energy to contain my fear that he might prevent my escape. Dean's driving me nuts, I added, keeping my voice as normal as I could. He's the last person I want to see. No, I think I need to be on my own. It's not such a big deal. I'll be back tomorrow. I fled inside. Russell followed me across the kitchen to the basement door at the front, his gardening boots clumping heavily on the boards. He noted at once the overnight bag by the window. When did you pack this? Just now. Oh. He was looking not so much ambushed, as we both knew he was entitled to, as eager to find a way to make a joint initiative out of this. That meant more questions, and I decided it was better to keep moving as they were being asked, rather than stand still and allow myself to be talked around. Did something happen when you were out? He began. I twisted the key in the lock and pulled open the door. No, not at all. The boys got off okay? The boys are fine. Don't you want to wait for them to get back and say goodbye? You explain, I said brightly. Anyway, by the time they get home, I'll virtually be back myself. A thought struck. You do know where they are, don't you? Sure. Russell's gaze settled on the fridge, and I realised he was looking for the pink calendar in its old spot between fridge and oven. I'd moved it months ago. Noah's at diving practice, I said. Then he's at his friend Harry's for the day, the number's on the board. And Jamie's at the school all morning. He'll probably come straight home after that. They've both got their mobiles if you need to speak to them, and there's plenty of food in the fridge. You shouldn't need to go to the shops at all. Thank you, Executive Housekeeper Olivia. It was a familiar joke, but his heart wasn't in it, and my own smile felt weak on my lips. Bye, then. I kissed him and made for the steps. As usual, they needed sweeping. Home all day, and I'd never been able to keep on top of it all, never. 
the list in the pocket, in the handbag, on whatever surface I'd last wiped clean. It never came to an end. Only the bit of paper changed, the colour of the ink. Executive housekeeper I was not. There was just that once when I had, I thought I had, everything up to date. Meals, beds, laundry, school uniforms, shopping, bill paying, travel arrangements, even birthday cards to the children of lapsed friends. And I'd had the almost supernatural sense of being able to reach out and touch the piece with my hands. Then the mail arrived, bringing with it a bill that had to be queried and a reminder for an optician's appointment that had to be made. By the end of the morning, a damp patch had appeared on the ceiling in Noah's bedroom. The tumble dryer had developed an ominous rattling, and the whole painting of the fourth bridge had begun again. With one foot wedging the door open, Russell stood at the bottom of the steps, a curious figure in his tarling dressing gown and mud-smeared boots. Olivia, hang on a bit. Where is it you're going, exactly? I'm not sure, I said over my shoulder. Maybe to the south coast. I feel like some sea air. Are you taking the car? No, I'm sick of driving. And nor did I want to take the risk of having Mum's face projected onto my windscreen for the next three hours. I'll get the train. I turned a final time, and we stood looking at each other as we had in the back garden. Only now our positions were reversed and I was up high and he down low. Thank you, I said. What for? When I didn't answer, he added, Well, phone when you get there, all right. I put up a hand in farewell, fingers lightly keying the air. All right. Later, when I looked back on that morning... I saw that the disconnection had begun at once, almost as I walked down Stirling Avenue to the bus stop to catch the bus to the train station. Perhaps it had begun earlier, when I'd chosen to keep my mother's letter to myself, or earlier still, at the time of her death. After all, Russell had said himself that he thought I was in shock. Perhaps, most likely of all, it had begun before any of that, long before. The letter was not the first important piece of information I had hidden from him after all. Whatever the answer, I was already aware of it as I bought my ticket and took a window seat on the Waterloo train to Weymouth. I'd imagined I would start crying right then and there, and had chosen a quiet carriage for that very purpose. Alone, anonymous, this was surely the natural moment for me to succumb to the grief that was expected of me, that I expected of myself. But to my surprise, the opposite was happening. As I looked out of the window, London falling away from me as vertiginously as if I had taken off in a plane, I felt unusually light-hearted, almost serene. There was no sun, but the city light had never been so clear and beautiful. I was reminded of the first weekend Russell and I spent away from the boys years ago, when Jamie was two and a half and Noah not quite a year. We'd left them with Russell's parents and taken the Eurostar to Paris for two nights. Two nights. Negligible on paper compared with the nine hundred or so straight that I'd devoted to the boys. When I worked it out, the only night I'd spent away from Jamie had been the one on which Noah was born. But not negligible to me. It was like the unstrapping from my back of an enormous pack. It didn't matter that I would have to buckle it back on again soon enough. Any relief from the weight, however brief, was to be cherished. I miss them already, don't you? Russ had asked before we'd even reached the tunnel. He'd looked genuinely bereft, and I couldn't help smiling. Olivia, I'm serious. Do you think we should really be doing this? Of course we should. I didn't point out that he had spent many nights away from the children on business trips, and that it was illogical for him to be especially nervous about this one. I supposed it must have been the idea of me leaving them that worried him, or perhaps the idea of the two of us being together without them, on our own, no infants sandwiched in the bed between us. Our family had doubled in size, but somehow the concept of the two of us had more than halved. They'll be fine, I added more gently, touched by his woebegone face. Nothing can go wrong. They're in safe hands. 
Your mum knows what she's doing. You're right, he agreed bravely. We need this. Exactly. And it had amazed me that he had needed to brace himself for something I considered a gift. As the train pulled out of Winchester, I bought a cup of coffee from the buffet car and returned to my seat. The carriage had filled up. I couldn't cry now, even if I wanted to. I took the lid off the coffee, but the liquid was much too hot to risk putting anywhere near human skin, so I just placed it in front of me and watched it slosh gently back and forth. Finally, it began dripping over the sides, and I replaced the lid and mopped up the spillage with a paper napkin. That was when I first heard the whisper, or at least that was when I first allowed myself to listen to the whisper. The words that told me that what I was about to do might very well make a mockery of my entire adult life, and the loved ones who had filled it, overwriting all that had fallen into the chasm between then and now, between Richie and me. And how could it not? If, when I saw him again, I felt anything like I had the first time, it would. If my attraction to him was a hundredth as powerful as it had once been, it would. One summer. That was all it had been in the end, no time at all. For him, it was no more than a brief punctuation in his long surfer years. And yet for me, it had made a punctuation of the rest. It had come to represent my whole adolescence and beyond. Time passed. My life expanded. But that single summer had never shrunk to the size it ought to have. Maybe that was why I hadn't noticed the years slipping by recently. My heart processed them differently from the calendar on the wall. I gulped at the scalding coffee in an effort to silence the whisper. I wasn't going to Richie to try to resurrect our first love. That was ridiculous. Maggie couldn't possibly have meant me to do that. No, I was going to Richie to lay a ghost to rest. A meeting with him after all this time would act as a memorial, just like the one we'd held for her last week. A chance for a proper goodbye to the past, before I got on with the real life of the present. That was what I should be reclaiming, surely. My family life with Russell. I should be making up for all the time I'd spent in Cheltenham for the feeling of falling away I had allowed to spill through the front door with me every time I came home. Reaching in my pocket to finger once more the envelope that contained his address, I thought again of what Lindy had said about it, how Mum couldn't have written anything by hand in her last few weeks, maybe even months. She'd given the letter to Lindy to hold on to a while ago, and, if I was right about her source of information... She'd made a special effort to seek it in the first place. But if Richie had been on her mind, then, later, whenever it was, then why had she been so intent on not talking to me about him? There had been any number of mother-daughter opportunities for her to tackle the subject, not least that last shameful confrontation. How could she possibly have imagined that a slip of paper given after she had died would be enough for me? And then the whisper came again, too fast for me to close my ears to it. The only explanation for her refusal to speak was that she must have known for certain what I had only ever been allowed to suspect, that she had been responsible for destroying us, she and no one else. Her silence was her admission of guilt. Chapter 9 Jamie used to say that the nature of the universe meant that, out there somewhere, there was another solar system exactly like ours, another Earth, another Stirling Avenue London, an identical suburban family sitting at just the same kitchen table as ours. They looked like us, too. The same hair and eye colour, shoe size, everything. They might even be talking about us as we were them. Then Noah who was going through a competitive phase, said that he thought it would be even better there than it was here. It was planet Earth without the bad bits. I thought about that now as I travelled by taxi through jewel-green countryside from Weymouth to Millington, the soft sunny land rolling and folding just so, guiding me smoothly to my destination. It was as if there could be no other place for the car to end up. I was a smooth glass marble, pitched with absolute precision, 
towards my own perfect pot in the ground. That feeling of sureness continued as we entered Millington itself, and proceeded gently downhill, past rows of stone cottages towards the old coaching inn, Victorian school building, and medieval church that constituted the heart of the village. The driver had said he didn't know the place at all, but still he found Angel's Lane, without once resorting to his map. It was so simple, in fact, that at the last minute I asked him to pull over by the village store on the high street, rather than turning into the lane itself. Suddenly, this was happening too fast for me. I didn't know if I was ready to discover exactly what this remote address held. In fact, I was no longer sure that it held anything at all. Might this not turn out to be nothing more than a wild goose chase? Was I forgetting too easily how much confusion there'd been in Mum's mind during her decline? Might she not have joined someone else's address with a name that had surfaced randomly from the past, slipped it absent-mindedly into an envelope meant for some other purpose? Then I reminded myself that the name and address had been written by a third party, probably Richie's father, and could not possibly be the fabrication of a jumbled mind. The house number did exist. The address was Richie's, or at least it had something to do with him. My instincts were to be trusted. The driver gave me his card and told me to phone when I needed taking back to Weymouth. He'd be free again after five. Oh, I'm not going back today, I said, my sureness restored. I'm staying overnight. He nodded dubiously towards a trio of elderly ladies exiting a tea room across the road. Don't look like there's much going on in the evenings round here. I just smiled, pocketed his card and closed the door behind me. Only after he had pulled off did I turn to look properly down Angel's Lane. It was a short, straight road, which meant I could see a part of every house from where I stood. Counting ahead, I calculated number two to be the last on the right, beyond which the road continued in a rough track in the direction of the sea. After several minutes of simply standing there in the heat, drawing energy from the sun like some sort of desert creature, I at last began walking towards the house. Even at a relaxed stroll, the task took less than a minute. And then there it was in front of me. Number two. A fact confirmed by the neat brass numeral above the letterbox. It was a small, brick-built cottage, ivy feasting on its front, and a spray of yellow roses around the front door. And there was no gate or fence of any kind only a pale gravel drive that led directly to the back of the property, separating it from open countryside. A green-painted veranda, raised a few steps from the ground and presumably wrapping the full width of the rear, had been extended around the side to finish just below a small square window. If I saw that arrangement in the city, I'd think at once of burglars, but here I just marvelled at the incredible position at its uninterrupted views to both the south and the west, complete with the glittering wedge of Atlantic. How peaceful it felt. To London senses, the space and the silence were otherworldly, almost magical, and it didn't connect with the Richie Briscoe I knew on any level but one. The ocean. And then, almost as a detail I might have overlooked, I saw him a broad, barefoot figure in jeans and a sky-blue T-shirt, who had suddenly and noiselessly appeared on the side section of the veranda. He had a paintbrush in his right hand and held it ready as he stooped to inspect the lower section of the window frame. He was no more than four or five metres away from me. I took a step back, flattening my palms against the brick of the house to steady myself. Could it possibly be this easy? After so many years, could it actually be that all that now divided us was this short stretch of gravel and the timber structure of a veranda? A dozen steps forward, and I'd be able to reach between the balustrade and touch him. But I found that for now, I could do nothing of the sort. I could only stand and stare, as though watching him on a screen. He began applying flat, deft strokes of pale pink to the wood, crouching low and bringing his face so close to the brush he'd be lucky not to paint his own nose in the process. 
Was it him? If so, then he was no longer the lean and bony boy of my memories. And he was certainly not as blonde, but one thing had not changed. He was tanned, his face and forearms several tones darker than my own. An ancient memory burst suddenly to the surface, our fingers entwined, our legs hooked around one another's, the colour of his skin so exotic next to my milky pink flush tones, like sugar and syrup melted to make toffee. Truly, a teenager's metaphor. Never had a suntan elicited so much admiration. I'd even resolved back then to ask his mother if he'd been born that colour. I'd been so convinced we would one day meet. I continued to watch as he wiped drips of colour onto a cloth and leaned back against the handrail to inspect his work. It was only then that, sensing spying eyes, he turned to look towards the street. There was a slow moment of complete stillness, and then his hands resumed their wiping, reaching behind him to prop the brush in a tray, sitting on a box or chest of some sort. Then his eyes were on me again, checking I was really there, and not some apparition he'd glimpsed in the dazzle of the sun. Cool, easy Richie. This was his version of the startle reflex. A languid double-take. Hello, Richie. I'm so glad you're in. I crunched forwards towards him, coming to a halt at the bottom of the steps. Now that I'd spoken, I felt utterly calm, unnaturally so. If I was unnerved by anything at all, then it was by my lack of nerves. Hey, Olivia. His blue-eyed gaze was steady and friendly. There was no bewilderment or incredulity, no spontaneous blaze. It was almost as if he'd been expecting me. It occurred to me that the strange calm I felt might have the power to infect others. But no, it was crazy to imagine he experienced what I did. The fact was, he had always been unflappable. He's so laid back, he's horizontal, Warren used to say of his son the first time I'd heard the expression. No, Richie would be as casual as this with any unexpected visitor. The sense of there being anything more meaningful to the occasion belonged only to me. I stood before him, smiling. You recognize me, then? He grinned. Sure. You look pretty much the same. That covetable, much-mimicked Californian drawl was muted now. You might not detect it at all if you hadn't known him before. I doubt that, I said. But thank you. He wiped his hands on the paint-spattered cloth and dropped it into the tray. Then he brought his left hand up to his face and squeezed the end of his nose, pressing the nostrils together in a reflective mannerism I hadn't thought about for over two decades, but that now seemed the most familiar thing in the world. Still I stared, absorbing all the lines and textures of him. His hair was shorter, paler, a little thinner, his skin more wind-beaten than sun-kissed. Back then he'd been lithe and elastic, quick to slide away from or towards trouble. Now he was solid and strong, responsible, a different age, a different life, but he was pretty much the same too. What are you doing in this part of the world? He leaned his elbows on the rail and looked directly down to my face. I hesitated, considered telling him about my mother's cryptic part in this, inviting him to debate her intentions then and there. But the prospect was awkward by anyone's standards. How could I explain why the sight of his name and address had caused almost immediate flight in me, when I knew he had likely not given me a thought from one year to the next? I cleared my throat. I heard you were living down here, and I thought I'd drop by. He nodded. You're on your own, are you? I didn't hear a car. No, I came on the train. I would have phoned, but I didn't have a number. Maybe I should have written to you first. He dismissed this with a quick gesture. No, no, it's no problem. It's just lucky I was in, is all. He gestured to the steps at the back. Come on up. Mind the paint, though, it's still wet. So I see. I tore my eyes from his face and took in the space beyond. A high rear window with the same gleaming new paintwork as the one at the side. A back door, ajar, 
its surface prepared for the new colour but not yet begun. A battered storage chest being used as a stand for materials. There was a row of trees in squat metallic pots and lots more ivy, roots of the stuff coiling to the ground and bringing briefly to mind Russell in his dressing gown and boots. Had that really been as recently as this morning? Already, our parting felt like a month ago. To the far left, the space was as sheltered as it was open to the right, with a line of closely set yews screening it from the neighbouring garden, and making it impossible to tell if that had a deck like this one. I suspected not. It felt too American. I felt sure Ritchie had had it built. And it was exactly what I would have wanted to do, too. A foot or two of elevation meant a centimetre or two more of ocean view. Grab a seat, Ritchie said, motioning. There were two options. A wooden bench that had been shifted away from the wall, presumably to allow access to the window behind it. And on the right, a basket chair, hanging from a chain attached to a beam overhead. I didn't think that would hold my weight, let alone his. So I took the bench, placing my bag to the side to leave room for Richie, too. Instead, he settled on the top step, lowering himself with a satisfied flop, like a dog just returned from a long walk. More lost and found body language. And to think I'd been so sure I'd logged every bit of it. It's been a while, he said, eyebrows raised. I would have thought you'd forgotten about me a long time ago. I couldn't help chuckling at the idea. Actually, I've been thinking about the past a lot recently. Maggie died, my mother, two weeks ago. I'm sorry to hear that. It's okay, we weren't... Well, you probably remember we didn't have the best relationship. He nodded. You and your brother, I remember you guys. But the comment faded on his lips, presumably as he reminded himself that two weeks was a little too soon to start being honest about the dead. Gave her hell? I finished. Yes, we did. It was complicated between us, and you were probably there at the most complicated time. Tell me about it. Yes, I thought. I will tell you. I'll tell you everything. But there was no hurry. There were a lot of old friends at the service, people I hadn't seen for years. I thought about your father. I wondered if he might have been planning to come. This was not quite true. Warren had been sent word of Mum's death and of the date for the service, as had everyone in her address book. But having not heard from him, we had had no reason to expect him on the day. No, Richie said, he doesn't leave the States much these days. And I guess they must have lost touch. Like us, I said quietly. I glanced over his shoulder at the lawn, admiring the way it tumbled towards a brook at the bottom, as if just this second freshly unrolled. The brook presumably marked the boundary between Angel's Lane and the farmland beyond, which connected in turn with the ridge of hills that backed the shore. It was a simple, beautiful view, made of compass curves of green and blue, the lollipop trees and cottonwool sheep of a child's collage. Planet Earth without the bad bits. I love your sloping lawn, I told Richie. Oh, yeah, all lawn slope in Millington. I grinned. That sounds very profound. He grinned back. I guess, if you want it to be. Well... I pretended to ponder. I think I do. Again, I marvelled at my uncharacteristic calm. All those hundreds of times over the years that I'd imagined this moment of reunion. And every single one had been something grand, elemental, like some great whooshing together of two walls of water. But now that it was happening, there was only a lovely, gentle, floating feeling, as though I'd been bobbing beside him all along, just waiting for him to put out a hand. It may not have been the feeling I was expecting, but somehow it was exactly right. So how long have you lived here? His gaze narrowed as if he were calculating the answer for the first time. Pretty much thirteen years now. In Britain, I mean, not in this house. I was over in Southampton before. I stared amazed. The thought that he might have been here all these years, perhaps even commuting to London for work and spending eight hours a day there, 
for the full stretch of my own retreat from office life. It seemed inconceivable to me. It flipped everything and demanded reassessment, like travelling to the southern hemisphere and seeing an upside-down moon. I composed myself, gestured to the can of paint. And you've just moved in? No, no. It's been almost three years, but I'm a little behind with my renovations. Almost three years? How long had Mum been in possession of this fact? I tried to banish her from my mind. Having not mentioned her role in my arrival here, it already felt too late. You know, I couldn't believe it when I found out you were in Britain at all. I'd just assumed you were in California all this time. He shrugged. I was for a few years. After college? Yep. I worked for my father for a while before I got into the whole Silicon Valley thing. Then I travelled a while. You came back to England? No, not that time. I went to Asia, Australia, then back home. And eventually circumstances brought me here. Circumstances in the form of a woman, I thought. But I didn't want to know about her, not yet. She obviously wasn't home, not unless she was doing something in complete silence indoors, for there'd been no other signs of life since I'd arrived. I was sure we were on our own. I realised now that I had not envisaged this meeting any other way. Stumbling upon him as he sat on this very seat with his arm around his wife, surveying their magnificent view together, him kissing the top of her head as she rested her cheek on his chest. No, that would not have been the same. How is Warren? I asked. He's good, retired, remarried, getting fat. My mother married again as well, I said. A man called Alec. Not long after you went back, actually. I'd just started college, so it must have been 87, something like that. It felt surreal to talk about that period so casually, after you went back, as if his departure had been just one of a crowded calendar of inconsequential comings and goings. A nice guy? Richie asked. Alec? Yes, great. He was a big traveller, a bit larger than life. He was good for her. He died about five years ago, and I don't think she ever really recovered. When she was diagnosed with cancer herself, it was as if she didn't really care. Not in the way you would have expected. Without him with her, there seemed less reason to fight, I suppose. Richie nodded. He seemed genuinely sorrowful, which touched me. And your dad? He's still going strong. He lives with his second wife up in Cambridge. My fingers felt for the wooden seat on either side of my knees as, once more, I gazed beyond the green to the sea. This is beautiful, Richie. You're so lucky to live somewhere like this. It's really peaceful. Not at all like London. He adjusted his right leg, wedging a bare foot against the gatepost. I bought it after my mom sold her place in Santa Cruz. She got ill and went to live with my aunt in Southern California. Oh, I'm sorry. Is she better now? She's just getting old, Richie shrugged. And she was on her own for quite a while, which I guess doesn't help. She wasn't so lucky as Maggie in that respect. Though his body language remained relaxed, there was a new guardedness to his voice. There was a limit to the information he was willing to give. He wasn't as sure of me as I'd thought. Well, that was understandable. Here I was, an uninvited guest, an uninvited ghost. He wasn't prepared for me. Normally, on a Saturday, I'm running round after my two sons, I said eager to keep the conversation going. That's my job. Housekeeper, cook, bagpacker, chauffeur. I laughed. Actually, less and less chauffeur. They get the bus or tube everywhere or they cycle. They claim they don't need adult supervision anymore. That's how they think of me. <laughs> A supervisor. Richie raised an eyebrow. How old are they? Fourteen and twelve. I paused. And the sad thing is they're right. They don't need me. They already seem to know more about life than I do. That can't be true. It is. They're cleverer than me, both of them. I can't even help them with their homework. I haven't been able to for years. In the past, observations like this had caused me grief, or at least guilt. 
but now I've found myself speaking about it quite acceptingly, even with amusement. Washing and ironing, that's the bit I do, that they really couldn't do themselves. I'm their char lady. Richie laughed. <laughs> char lady, that sounds so English. Doesn't it? Jamie would know the origins of the word, I thought. He never looked up a spelling in the dictionary without also checking the etymology. Not that I mean to give you the wrong idea, I said quickly, like I'm Cinderella or something. Because Russell helps with the domestic stuff. He cooks a bit. He does the garden. He's great with the boys, better than I am, in fact. I'm lucky. Russell's your husband? I nodded, finally falling silent. I could understand why people often responded with a joke to questions about their marriages. One of those for better or worse or for my sins quips. It removed the temptation to blurt out the truth, which was that you no longer dared think about what it meant to be a husband or a wife, because deep down you knew you'd failed at it somehow. I heard you got married, Richie said. I guess Dad must have told me. And how about you? It was impossible to delay the question any longer. Did you? Yes. He got in shortly, and his gaze moved from my face to the back door as though he'd been distracted by a noise from inside. Had I been wrong, then? Was she here? Was I about to meet her? Beneath the coolness of my skin, I felt the hot thread of my pulse. But it turned out he was only thinking about his host's duties. Hey, what am I doing? I should get you a cup of tea or something. A beer, maybe? A beer would be nice. I made to rise and follow him inside but he gestured for me to stay where I was. It won't take a second. Enjoy the view. I did as I was told. My eye was drawn to the left, eastward towards Weymouth, where one of the shield of hills rose higher than the others. At its brow, as stark against the sky as black ink on paper, stood a ruin of some sort, an old chapel or watchtower, perhaps, and I could see an ant trail of walkers negotiating the sheep-dotted terraces to reach it. I would walk that path myself, I decided. The views from the top must be wonderful. Here we go. Richie was back, handing me a bottle. It was wet with condensation, and my nails automatically began picking at the label, sliding it away and touching the glass beneath, a nervous habit I hadn't done for years. He remained in the doorway, leaning away from me against the frame, his glance oblique, and I could sense the tension in his body. He needed more from me, I saw, more than this impression I was giving that I'd simply drifted in with the breeze. I'm sorry to just turn up like this, I said. You must think I'm completely mad. It's just that after Mum died, I had this urge to look you up. Like I said, I've been thinking a lot about the past, about some of the crazier things Maggie did when we were young. It's weird how it comes back to you, things you thought you'd forgotten. There was as much chance of my having forgotten him as there was my need to breathe in and out. But I reminded myself that I was an adult now, a wife and a mother, and whatever torments of the imagination had taken place over the years, there was as little real residual love for Richie and me as there was in him for me. That was why I was so relaxed. But the thought had hardly been completed before I knew it to be false. This supernatural calm of mine was a defence. It was what held me upright and stopped me from spilling myself to him, my true self. In any case, my words seemed to have done the trick because he was looking at me with gentle sympathy. That was different from before. He took emotions seriously now. He didn't make a joke of them. You didn't want to bring your family with you? No. They're in London. Weekends are busy, the boys have commitments, and there's all the school stuff to get sorted for Monday. Stuff that I had not thought to brief Russell on. But that hardly seemed to matter right now. Hadn't I just been bemoaning how well the boys looked after themselves? Richie put his beer to his lips and swallowed. You know what? I looked you up once. Really? I glanced up at him, startled, but he'd shifted his position and his face was in the full glare of the sun, making it impossible to read his expression. When was that? Years ago, when I first came back. 
I tracked down your brother, and he told me all your news. I frowned. Dean? He never mentioned it. How strange. Richie shrugged. It was just a phone call. We never got as far as getting together in person. I guess it must have been 95, maybe early 96, something like that. I wound my mind back to that period. I must have recently had Noah, which meant we had moved into the house on Sterling Avenue and discovered the dry rot problem and the mice infestation. We'd only been there a few weeks when Jamie pushed some wire wool into his right ear and had to go into hospital to have it surgically removed. The anaesthetic was a traumatic experience for him. He'd had bad dreams for weeks afterwards, his wails waking Noah, who was a light sleeper at the best of times. Breaking down in tears was not uncommon for me then. There would have been all sorts of reasons why Dean hadn't remembered to pass on Rich's inquiries. Some of them possibly even involving human sympathy. So how is Dean these days? Richie asked. He's fine. He works in computers. He's got two daughters, similar ages to my boys. They don't live far from us. It's easy to get together. Though we don't do it as often as you think, I added silently. We need each other, Dean and I, but we don't make each other feel good. Richie tilted his beer bottle from side to side. He seemed to have relaxed again. Who was that girl he was going out with when I was there? Red hair, freckles, cute. I said straight away, You mean Amy Jukes? That's it. Wow, you've got a good memory. Only for that summer, I thought. I can't remember the names of colleagues or neighbours from a couple of years ago, and yet I can play that summer in my head like a recording, every single detail. All our meals together, our conversations our precious hours alone. You mean you don't remember, I said, only half joking, and my heart was suddenly painful in my chest, as if the muscle had been stretched over a frame and beaten with a stick. Richie just chuckled, amused by the question, and I waited, wondering if he might mention something else, something about us. But instead, to my dismay, he was checking his watch, draining his beer, preparing to bring the reunion to an end. Look, I have to shoot off in a minute, but if you're not in a hurry, why don't you stay and have dinner? There was nothing I wanted more. I'd love to, if you're sure. Sure, I'm sure. He eyed my bag. Are you checked into a B&B &B or something? Not yet. It was my cue to get up and do exactly that the obvious way to fill my time while he ran his errands. The coaching inn opposite the church would probably have rooms and was only a couple of minutes from here. I could have a shower, take a rest from the sun. That was if I weren't rooted to the spot. I must have looked as helpless as I felt because Richie added, or oh, hang out here if you like. I just need to pick up Wren and I'll be right back. All right, thank you. For a second I was so busy feeling pleased about not having to move, about being able to sit here a little longer and watch the fields and the sea and think about us having dinner together, that I didn't get his meaning. Rewinding, I thought I might have missed the name of a foodstuff he wanted to pick up for supper. Then, as he vanished indoors in search of his car keys, pushing the back door wider open, I finally used my eyes. Inside, just visible by the doormat was a child's Wellington boot, green and shiny and printed with ladybirds. Across the deck, the basket chair I'd worried might not hold my weight wouldn't hold my weight, because it was not designed for an adult. Richie, a man in his early forties, was painting his house pink. He re-emerged, car keys dangling from his index finger and stood in front of me. Okay, I'll see you in a... Hey, what? I smiled broadly up at him, not knowing why I was so delighted. Richie, you didn't tell me you have a child. A girl? Yes. Now the sun blazed from his eyes. What's her name? Wren. Wren like the bird. And he glanced to the sky. Exactly like the bird. Chapter 10 
Richie is a hedonist. Everybody says so. Mum has seen it firsthand, or at least its morning after effects. The crazy beach parties, the stadium rock gigs at which the kids at the front faint in the heat and have to be shunted to the sidelines along a track of lifted hands. The romances with college girls, who either don't know he's still in high school or are unusually willing to overlook the fact. His father is worried about his recklessness and about the friend called Troy. Two closely related reasons, we gather, why he's been sequestered over here for the summer. I listen to the stories with excitement and jealousy, an unfamiliar blend that reminds me a little of dread. He's a popular boy, all right, Mum sighs, looking all girlish. But then, I suppose, that kind always is. What kind? I ask. You know, the free spirit kind. She uses her fingers to put inverted commas around the term, another imported mannerism Dean and I have noticed. We are keeping a list. Then again, you probably haven't met any free spirits before, have you, Dolly? Your father and brother are always so bloody sensible. I don't know whether I'm imagining the sneer in her voice or not, but either way, I don't like it. What about you? I say, bridling. Aren't you one? She cackles with laughter at that. Oh, darling, that's very flattering. But mothers are not allowed to be free spirits. Didn't I tell you? It's against the rules. I consider this remark quite seriously. Doesn't leaving your children and travelling halfway around the world to start a brand new life count, then? Not even sending word of a new address? Not coming back for a year? From where I stand, it is fathers who are not allowed to be free spirits. Fathers who must play by the rules. But when you went to America... I begin. But she cuts right across me, her passions roused. It's not about where you go, Dolly, or even for how long. You're not free here. Clapping one fist to her heart and covering it with the other like a game of one potato, two potato, she cries, which may be how it's supposed to be and how it always will be. But it doesn't change the basic fact that women are never allowed to forget their women, never. She's so wild-eyed. I wonder if she's forgotten it's just me she's protesting to and not someone else. God, perhaps, or one of my grandparents. Whatever it is, I automatically retreat. Mum never admits she's wrong. Besides, though I hate to side with her against my father and brother, she's right about them. They are too sensible. Later, several years later, when I meet Russell, I see straight away that he is not a free spirit. But nor is he a tethered one, and that is important. He is optimistic but grounded. One of the first things he says to me is that he wants to have his children while he still has the strength to keep up with them. His own parents had him later in life, and he has been forever reminded of the problems of this the frustrating gulf between his energy levels and theirs. He wants a brace of boys who he can chuck into the swimming pool one after the other, safe in their matching rubber rings, and then he'll jump in after them and chase them about, so they all squeal with terror and delight. Afterwards, happy and exhausted, they will sit in a line, wrapped in towels and eat hot dogs or blow into cups of cocoa. He has a very specific idea of what family life involves. When he asks me to marry him, I have no hesitation in saying yes. I've forgotten about Richie by then, or at least I've told myself it's time I forgot about him, which is as far as I'm ever going to get. I've consigned him with some ceremony to the compartment in my past labelled First Love, or Teenage Dramas, or maybe Free Spirits. The plan is for Mum and Warren to rent a place near to ours while they look for a house to buy. The rental property on Acacia Street is surprisingly run down, considering how particular Warren is reported to be about kitchen and bathroom fittings. But it's big, big enough for Richie to be assigned the whole basement floor to himself. He has his own shower and toilet down there, and a sofa and TV, plus the electric guitar shaped like a bolt of lightning that he carried with him on the plane. 
His heavy-duty musical gear is back home in Troy's care. There are plans for a band on his return. He has his own private exit to the garden, but no door at the front, so he must enter the house through the main front door like everyone else. Mum suggests that I get into the habit of staying over. I don't mean you have to move out from your father's lock, stock and barrel, she says. I just mean come and use your bedroom here occasionally. Maybe at the weekends? You could think of it as your holiday home. Following his initial resistance, Dean is already crashing there after nights out with Richie, and I have to admit I want to do the same. Despite myself, it feels quite glamorous having two houses to choose from, two bedrooms of my own. In a matter of weeks, life has transformed from the weak, dismembered creature it was into something strong and whole. Now it feels like we're a family from a soap opera, in a good way. OK, we never know what will happen next, but we are old enough to handle that now. Or maybe not. For one thing, I'm not nearly worldly enough to second-guess my mother's motives. Only gradually do I suspect that there's an element of sport to what is going on. Dean spells it out. She wants to win us back. She wants to beat Dad. He says Mum is the kind of person who always thinks the grass is green or on the other side of the bridge, like the billy goat's gruff. If that's the case, then he has cast himself in the role of the troll. He might be willing to sleep in his designated second bedroom and eat food from the new oversized fridge and super-powered microwave Warren has drafted in, but he has not forgiven her. I'll never forgive her, he says. There's no excuse for what she did. She shouldn't have had kids if she didn't want to be with them. Personally, I'm not sure I mind the original abandonment nearly so much as the fact that now Mum has returned, she seems to be passing herself off as someone she is not. The younger style of dressing, the yellow streaks in her spiked-up short hair, all that is unremarkable compared to the changes in her speech and attitude. Does she really think we don't notice? Or is the whole point that she wants to make sure we do? to show us how different from us she thinks she is. There are the Americanisms, of course, of which she is studiously unselfconscious. She'd have us all believe they'd been incorporated into her speech without her having even been aware of it, not to mention the hammed-up Englishness. I never heard her say golly before she left, or goody gumdrops. Dean winces when he repeats some of the phrases. There is also the way she calls the Briscoes my boys, and yet she calls Dean his father's son through and through. The sensible dig, again. And then, ever since that conversation she and I had about Richie, there is the new, personal edge to any comment that comes my way, too. That dress is going to look terrific when you've filled out a bit more. Fifteen! You know what, Dolly? The Californian girls your age are something else and to Warren, right in front of Richie. Why is it that the less makeup they need, the more they insist on wearing? It's a crime! Oh, and she wants us to start calling her Maggie instead of Mum. That's the one suggestion that Dean actually welcomes. Now there's no verbal clue that she's his mother at all. Me? I'm not so sure. Chapter 11 Ah, got here safely. Thank you for understanding. Love to the boys. Oh, kiss. To my frustration, my phone bleated pathetically in my hand before displaying the alert. Message failed to send. There was obviously no signal here. I slipped it into my jeans pocket just in time to hear the approach of a vehicle in the lane at the front and the sound of car doors crunching shut. Then a small child's voice cried out, Have you really done it, Daddy? I have, came Richie's voice from the drive. I thought it would be nice to surprise you. Am I going to be really surprised? Well, let's see. Come on, have a look. Footsteps scampered lightly across the gravel, followed by Richie's heavier tread. In the few minutes I'd had to picture Wren, 
I'd already overlooked the information that she was being collected from a party, and so had not prepared myself for the full princess costume, which included faux sable shrug, bejeweled tiara, and a pair of plastic-heeled slippers. Miraculously, infant ankles had survived the gravel untwisted. She must have had practice. In one of her hands, she gripped a party bag, and a pink balloon trailed behind on a long red ribbon. There was chocolate all over the front of the ball dress, and more around the mouth, that opened now into a delighted O. Oh, Daddy! It's gorgeous! Even through the party regalia, I could see that she was a very slight child. I might have taken her for as young as three had not her speech already told me she was of school age. Her hair was soft golden blonde, and her skin very pale but for an apple of high colour on each cheek. Other than the very resolute set of her eyes, as she appraised the new paint colour, she didn't look like her father at all. Richie, coming up behind her, tried to redirect his daughter's attention. Run, sweetie, this is the lady I told you about just now in the car. She's called Olivia. Oh! Her confidence deserted her, and she turned to cling to the nearest of Richie's legs, hiding her face from me. He prized her free. Come on, don't be shy, she's totally friendly. I stepped forward, smiling. Hello, Wren. Have you just been to a party? No response. Well, it was a stupid question. Richie continued to peel her from his leg, but no sooner had he succeeded than she had nestled back into place. I squatted to the floor at the top of the steps. How old is your friend? The one whose party it was? Four? Five? There's no number on the balloon. Five! Now she emerged. The urge to correct was not confined to my own children then. Her eyes were bright, the colour of clear honey. But Daisy's a younger five than me, she added. I see. And when were you five? April the sixty thousandth. She giggled, showing the tiniest teeth. It was ages since I'd seen milk teeth close up. Rand, don't be silly, Richie said. Answer the question properly. She sighed. April the 16th, that's in the spring, not summer, when lambs are born. Who are you? My name's Olivia. I'm an old friend of your daddy's. Why are you at our house? Richie laughed. You can see I've raised a real society hostess here. Come on, chickie, let's take our guest inside. No, I want to see the pink windows some more. But the colour will change as it dries. We won't know the real colour until tomorrow, after I've done the second coat. Wren frowned. My paints don't change. It'll still be pink, I said. I think it's a beautiful colour for windows. Is pink your favourite? Yes, and purple and green. She eyed me with interest before admitting. And blue and yellow and silver. Richie grinned, cupped the back of her head with his right palm and eased her forward. That's it. Keep your options open. Now let's get you inside. It's almost time for your bath. But now she'd spotted the open door and stopped in her tracks, gasping. Oh no! The door is open! Has a yoga been? No, Olivia's been minding it. There have been no yogas, I said. I've guarded it very closely. She nodded solemnly and finally led the way in. The door opened straight into the living room a square, light-filled room with beams overhead and polished boards underfoot. Two small sofas faced one another by the fireplace, both covered with patterned throws and mismatching cushions, the most prominent of which featured an embroidered mother duck and her ducklings. Drawings, presumably by Wren, were tacked higgledy-piggledy to the walls, alongside framed seaside prints of various sizes. It was cluttered and cosy, instantly sheltering. Wren plopped herself down on the nearest of the sofas and immediately emptied the contents of her party bag onto the coffee table. Expertly sifting the haul of toys and pencils, she quickly found the only edible item, a chocolate lolly. Daddy, can I eat this now? You can have the birthday cake. Is it a deal? Richie unhooked the fur wrap from around her throat. You already gave me the cake, remember? I had it in the car. 
Oh, yes, I was very kind to Cher, wasn't I? Uncertain now of her bargaining position, she nibbled at the foil wrapper while keeping her eyes on her father for signs of censure. I settled on the sofa opposite. To my delight, from here you could still see the sea, a faint slim ribbon just above the windowsill. Now that Wren was here, there was no chance of conversation between Richie and me, a dynamic I'd forgotten from the boys' infanthoods. It made me remember something I hadn't thought about for years. How Russell and I used to take the two of them to Saturday morning swimming lessons. A forty-minute window in which we could converse without interruption. Afterwards, without fail, we'd be chastised by one or both of them for not having watched their progress properly. Did you see what I did with my flippers? Noah would demand. Did you see? They were talking, Jamie would tell him. They never watch. And invariably, his accusing eye would settle on me. Richie brought me a mug of tea before taking Wren upstairs for her bath. Clearly, she was of an age when every instruction existed to be challenged. Can I miss bath time? Can I stay up, please? It is a special occasion. The party's finished. It's just a normal Saturday now. Come on, you're a tired teddy. I'm not a teddy, I'm a human, and it is a special occasion. She's here, Lily. Not Lily, Olivia. That's what I said. And so on. But in all of this, there was no mention of a mother expected home or staying away overnight or being anywhere at all. While the two of them were upstairs, I studied the various family photographs on display around the room. Most were of Wren, either alone or with children of the same age. One showed her on Richie's shoulders when she was about two, gripping his chin so that his head was forced up towards her, mouth wide with laughter. In another, she was flanked by a man I recognised as Warren, silver-haired and portly, and by an elegant, blonde, bobbed woman in her sixties. That must be the new wife, the woman who might have been Maggie. Then I found what I was looking for, a baby picture. Wren, for presumably it was she, was being cradled by a young woman with shoulder-length mid-brown hair and a soft-featured face. The exhausted set of her shoulders and the array of hospital equipment in the background suggested this was the day of birth itself, or near enough. The woman's eyes were cast towards the baby, rather than to the camera. But I knew that if they had been, they'd be that same rare golden colour as her daughter's. A nearby stack of mail caught my eye. The top one was addressed to Mr. R. Briscoe, innocuous, but for the stamp above it that read Beechwood C of E Primary. Wren's school, presumably. But why would the school office address only the child's father? The answer was it wouldn't, not if there were a mother's details on file as well. I looked again at the hospital photo and felt a chill on the backs of my hands. Something had happened to this woman. She was no longer in the picture. Though still light outside, shadows were lengthening indoors, so I turned on all the lamps and pulled shut the blind to the street. Not that I imagined there'd be too many passers-by out here at the edge of the village. I took my empty mug to the kitchen, a tiny space at the side of the house, and rinsed it in the sink, then came back into the living room and gathered Wren's party goodies back into the silver bag. I was just putting the discarded princess slippers next to the ladybird wellies at the door when Richie reappeared, crumpled and smiling. Hey, thanks, you didn't have to clean up. No problem. Is she in bed? Technically, but a bit too wired to sleep. This always happens after a party. She's had way too much fun. We may not have seen the last of her. Let's put it that way. She likes to reenact musical statues with all her toys. I thought of Jamie and Noah, their intensive, overwhelmingly academic schedules and could think of nothing comparable to contribute. You have such a lovely house, I told him instead. Thank you. It's small, but it has a nice vibe, doesn't it? Any place would have a nice vibe with these two in it, I thought. Did you choose all the pictures and things? Ran helped. She's my interior designer. He poured at his right hip pocket, an old mannerism from his smoking days, perhaps. He'd given up now, of course. 
When, I wondered. What were his bad habits now? It was one of a million details I longed to know. Right, Richie said. Adult time. Beer or wine? Whatever you're having. I followed him into the kitchen. It's so nice of you to let me stay for dinner. You're welcome. He reached for two glasses in a cupboard overhead and began opening a bottle of red wine. You don't have to cook there, really. He looked sideways at me. I'd forgotten how you always used to say that. Say what? Really? At the end of every sentence. Like you think people might think you don't mean it otherwise. You know, it looks great. Really? You make me sound very insincere. Really? We smiled, looking easily at one another for a second or two. I'd forgotten how you noticed things like that, I said, though I hadn't. It was one of the things I'd cherished about him, the way he picked up on the little things, as though the quirks were what counted the most to him. It had taken me a while to understand that that was what he saw, quirks rather than faults, and it had been at the time doubly welcome for being the exact opposite of how Maggie saw them. Or I could help you with dinner, I went on, frustrated by how hard it was to dismiss my mother from my mind for any longer than five minutes. I know what it's like with little ones. You get to the end of the day and you just want to collapse. Yep, that pretty much covers it. He handed me a glass of wine and set about transferring a dish of food from the freezer to the oven. It was cottage pie, I saw, obviously homemade. I see you've embraced English cooking. Huh? Oh, yes, actually, we've got Wren's childminder to thank for this. But I do cook. I make sure Wren knows her American classics. Like grilled cheese sandwich with coleslaw. The words, along with the memory, were quite spontaneous. Oil from the sweating cheese on a plate, abandoned by his unmade bed. An empty Coke can. A packet of camel cigarettes. A treasured Zippo. I'd never seen anyone fry a grilled sandwich before. He grinned. You really do have a good memory. I dread to think what else you're going to come up with this evening. That made two of us. All I knew was that it was not going to be anything that questioned the rightness of my being here. I felt absolutely certain that this was where I should be. I couldn't think when I'd last felt this contented. As Richie sliced tomatoes into a salad, I stood at the kitchen window that overlooked a small paved area I hadn't noticed from the deck. It evidently doubled as a storeroom for bikes, scooters, sandpits, the detached plastic limbs of a couple of dolls, and I imagined Wren making a den down there. Who were her friends? What other games did she like playing besides musical statues? Where was her mother? Are you okay inside? Richie asked, finishing up. Or would you like to sit out again? Oh, outside would be lovely. You know, I was trying to remember the last time I spent a night by the sea. I think it must have been last August, almost a year ago. That's way too long. I don't think I've ever spent longer than a week or two away from the ocean. And Ran, I think she's seen it every day of her life so far. How wonderful. I settled on the bench again, once more leaving space for him. But this time, he dragged a chair from indoors for himself, tossing me a cushion from the sofa. The sorrowful sound of a sheep carried across the fields from the hills, and the birdsong was clear and sure. I couldn't quite hear the sea, but I thought I could smell it. Richie, I said, I hope you don't mind me asking, but where is Wren's mum? Are you divorced or something? Or something. He spoke softly, and to my surprise he went quite still as though frozen by indecision. Then, just as I was warning myself to drop the subject, he gave an answer of sorts. Let's just say she's not around, but we're doing okay. Do you mind if we talk about it another time? Of course. I I'm sorry. Though buoyed by the promise of another time, I was saddened by the inference that he'd suffered somehow. They'd suffered. There was also an unexpected echo to his words that took a moment or two to come to me. My father speaking. Dean and me repeating together after him. We're fine on our own. We're fine on our own. She must have left them then, just as Maggie did us. She didn't live here anymore. 
I wondered if they knew where she lived, or if she had chosen to withhold that from them. That for us had always been the cruelest part. I remembered how I used to will Mum to hear us wherever she was, how I'd imagined her finding a shell in the bottom of her handbag, one I'd given her years ago when I was little, and putting it to her ear to listen for our voices. I'd never asked her if she did. I hadn't dared hear the answer. You're doing more than okay, I said lightly. Wren is great, a real little character. She certainly is, Richie said. Then, after a pause, tell me, how long have you and... What was his name again? Russell? How long have you been married? Oh, a long time now. But the idea of counting up the years was suddenly an exhausting prospect, and it was my turn to want to hold back. Richie preempted me. Or maybe you'd rather talk about that another time as well. Yes, please. There's so much to catch up on. But it's quite nice to just forget it all for a bit, isn't it? In response, he sent me a quick, curious look. And then we settled back in our seats, looking out in the direction of the sea, which had blurred by now into the dusk horizon. A new memory dripped into my mind, a safer, more distant one. Hey, do you remember that family trip to Limington? It's not too far from here, is it? Richie considered. An hour or so? Over the border in Hampshire. That's right. It had not been the most memorable event of the first and last Briscoe Lane holiday, not by a long chalk, but it had certainly had its drama. My mother had got lost, an incident in pre-mobile phone times that had led to the rest of us spending most of the afternoon searching for her. Warren had directed the manhunt, moving us through the cobbled streets in an evenly spread fan formation. It was one of the first times we'd seen him grow exasperated with her, and Dean had muttered to me, Can you believe it's taken him this long to see what she's like? We didn't say it out loud, but we both thought it. She's gone. She's taken off again. We were wrong as it happened. She really was plain lost. But we glared at her anyway when she was finally discovered. Treated her like the boy who called Wolf. It occurred to me now that it must have been hard for her to have her children undermining her at every step and drawing Richie into our hostilities, or at least doing our damnedest to. Richie must have been remembering the same episode, because he said, Poor Maggie, she didn't mean to spoil the day. Hmm, I wasn't so sure about that. What had Dad said in his eulogy? She was the spark that set situations alight. But what about all the situations that hadn't called for any spark? The ones that would have been better left unlit? How did the funeral go? Richie asked. Not too rough on you, I hope. It was fine, I said. The church was lovely. We went back to Mum's house afterwards, and I think people had quite a good time. It was a celebration rather than a miserable occasion. At least, that's what Lindy and Russell had told me after the event. For me, the day had passed with blurred edges, and I'd yet to bring any of its images back into focus. She knew she was dying, and so she was able to plan a lot of it herself. She had this friend, Lindy. She was a bit of a saviour from my point of view. Did all the stuff I probably should have. I laughed. Mum liked to call her her amanuensis. Amanu what? It means secretary. A kind of scribe. Towards the end, when she didn't have the strength to write letters herself, she'd dictate to Lindy. That made me think of the envelope tucked inside my bag just a few feet away, and the thought gave me an odd little twinge in the pit of my body, right at the bottom of the sternum. I didn't know if the feeling was guilt for not mentioning it to Richie, or something more complicated, more grudging, a reluctance to give Maggie credit for what was proving so pleasurable a reunion. An interesting idea, he said, though it's hard to imagine writing anything by hand these days. Even Bran sends emails. Oh, Mum was very proud of not having used a computer. Anyway, you know what she was like. She didn't exactly suffer from an inferiority complex. She liked to make everything seem grander than it really was. He chuckled. I remember when she first showed up. 
Dad thought she was some kind of English lady, you know, like a duchess or something. Really? That's funny. She was just an ordinary woman. But that didn't sound at all right. Mum had been anything but ordinary. I tried again. She was just a wife and mother, I suppose. A current passed between us. It was as though the words I'd chosen were the most charged in the English language and yet neither of us understood why that was the case for the other. I thought of the framed image of the woman in the maternity hospital, just metres away from us on the dresser inside the door. But for me, for now, she was quite hidden. I didn't even know her name. So, will you keep in touch with this, Lindy? Richie asked eventually. Yes, I'd like to. But the idea of Lindy of all of those connected with my real life, except perhaps Mum herself, was already fading into two dimensions. And they were losing their colour, too. They no longer had their own flesh tones. It was as if I'd left one realm and entered another. An enchanted one. Like Jamie's parallel planet. I was Odette. I wouldn't have been surprised if I looked in the mirror and found I'd taken on another form entirely and I wasn't at all frightened by the idea. Being here, being with Richie, I felt only a strong, unequivocal sense of belonging, a feeling I had always remembered, but had never dared believe was real. I felt... returned. Chapter 12 That first night in Millington, I never did get around to finding a hotel. Once we'd eaten, drunk some more wine, listened to the sounds of the village dying around us, and still I sat motionless on his veranda with just a cushion on my lap for warmth. Richie had no choice but to offer me a bed for the night. It's way too late to check in anywhere, and you'll never find your way. There are no street lights in Millington. There aren't. Why not? Something to do with how the roads were built. Some of them have been here before the Civil War. It's a very old village. I shall have to explore tomorrow. The lack of street lighting explained the night sky, which had begun to glitter gently an hour or two ago, and now appeared to contain more silver than black, an effect I'd never seen outside of Noah's sci-fi films. Even Richie said it wasn't usually so star-filled. Finally, indoors... He began hunting for spare pillows and blankets. You take my room upstairs. I'll sleep down here on the sofa. No, don't do that, I said. What about Wren? What if she wants you in the night and gets a fright when she sees me? She sleeps like a log, usually. Speaking non-stop for twelve hours without pausing for breath is pretty exhausting, you know. I smiled. Just in case, though, I'll take the sofa. So in the end he kept his room, and I snuggled under a patchwork quilt, sleeping a sweet, dreamy sleep, more restful than any I'd had in months, and waking to blissful silence. Opening a window, I saw that last night's extraordinary star cloths had been replaced by translucent blue, and the fresh morning air in my lungs seemed to lift me slightly from my feet. Richie, his hair ruffled from sleep and face unshaven, made us coffee and asked me what I was going to do today. I want to take a walk, look around, see all your Civil War nooks and crannies. After that, I don't know. You're not due back home, then. I felt myself shake my head. I think I want to stay here another night. Not here in your house, I mean, I added, realising how presumptuous that sounded. But I'll find somewhere in the village. Okay. It gets pretty booked up in the village during the tourist season, but I guess it's still a week or two till the school holidays. He paused. When do your kids break up? I had to think about this, which was odd because term dates were normally engraved onto my eyeballs, accessible whatever my state of mind. On the 18th, I think. Wren who had not yet dressed but was already at work on a picture of a mermaid as she ate her toast, looked up, interested. Do you have darlings, Livia? That's what she calls children, Richie said to me. 
his eyes soft and indulgent. Because we always told her, you're our darling. I'm Daddy's darling, she agreed, and Grandma Jane's. Both grandmas, Richie said. Don't forget the one in California. I've only met her three times, Wren said precisely. But I've seen Grandma Jane zillions of times. That was an interesting exchange. So there was a mother's branch of the family based somewhere close enough to be regularly involved. I have two darlings, I said to Wren, kneeling next to her. She smelled of toothpaste. They're both boys. She pulled a face. I don't like boys, except my best friend Chaz, of course. Of course. You have to like your best friend, don't you? Well, my boys would seem like grown-ups to you. The biggest is as tall as I am. Does he have his own baby, then? Are you a grandma? Richie's mouth was in his coffee cup a fraction too long, and I saw that he was hiding a snort of laughter. I giggled, and Wren copied me. All at once I felt a spasm of pure pleasure in being here with the two of them, just standing in the space between them, sharing the morning with them. I didn't want to leave. Not yet, I said to her. He's only fourteen. As she translated this into school years, using her fingers to count the grades, Richie added, Olivia's kids are in big school. No, I'm in big school. OK, even bigger school. You're in elementary school. Primary school, she corrected him. I'm in reception, which is much older than kindergarten. Oh, gosh, yes. Hearing him use so English an idiom stirred a memory somewhere of Mum and Warren discussing faucets and muffins, always making such a big deal of their differences, as if they were the first transatlantic couple in history. And Dean and I making such a big deal of them. Once Wren was dressed, Richie told her to put on her fleece and trainers because he was taking her to the beach for a run around. I found myself hoping he might invite me to join them, but instead he glanced at my overnight bag, still sitting unzipped by the sofa, and said, I'll show you the way to the B&Bs when we go. They're mostly off the other end of the high street, and there's a couple more on Rope Street. I recommend Valerie's if you can get in. They've got a bar there, and they do food all day. Thank you, that sounds great. I'll try there first. We left just as soon as I'd gathered my few things together, Richie striding ahead and Wren trailing behind. Torn from our unfinished picture, she was in a contrary mood, twice insisting we return to the house for items she couldn't live without, and then protesting that her shoes hurt and she wanted to go barefoot. Once on our way, however, it was only a matter of minutes before we reached my turn. Richie gestured uphill. Valerie's is a right turn into Rope Street just past the butchers. There's a sign. You can't miss it. We lingered on the curb as I thanked him for the previous night's dinner and the last-minute bed. Wren was already off in the opposite direction, pale hair streaming in the breeze, spotty skirt swishing against bare legs. I noticed a sign a little way down for the swannery and had an instant picture of her dancing among the sleek white birds, a stray feather caught in her hair. Why then, Richie said, half distracted by his daughter's receding figure and, it seemed to me, half preoccupied somewhere else entirely. Already, I missed his undivided attention of last night. Bye, I said brightly. Have fun at the beach. Not sure how much fun today will be, he said in a murmur, more to himself than to me. And before I could answer, he was gone. I didn't have his phone number, and nor had we made any arrangement to meet again before I left. But it hardly mattered. If I checked into the place he suggested, I'd virtually be within whistling distance. Millington was surprisingly bustling. Surprising to me since I'd yet to take a wider view of life here, but presumably normal for the time of year. It was, after all, a picture postcard Dorset village by the sea, the weather the best you could hope for of a British summer. Families may not yet have arrived in force, but other groups had. Older couples in sturdy walking boots, 
who brandished fold-out maps of the coastal paths, tourists with overseas accents stopping to exclaim over the produce left for sale outside people's houses, eggs and herbs and hand-picked poses, and at the notices explaining that payment should simply be posted through the letterbox. It seemed just as quaintly trusting to me, too. Valerie's was on the eastern edge of the village, a lovely old stone house with wooden casement windows and a grand front lawn that led down to a mill pond, beyond which was nothing but that beautiful cobalt green hillside decorated with ponies and fat grey sheep. There were potted flowers near the entrance and a hand-painted sign for legendary cream teas. Ringing the bell, I had no difficulty in picturing Valerie herself. If she conformed to the Millington Idyll, she'd be a rosy-cheeked farmer's wife. But as it happened, it was a teenager with winged black eye makeup and a pierced lip who hurried through to answer. I suppressed a smile. I'd enjoyed getting carried away with the fantasy. Morning! She introduced herself as Val's daughter, Martha, and consulted the register with a practised eye. We've only got a single left, I'm afraid. That's fine. I'm on my own. Just the one night. I'm not sure, I said truthfully. The way I was feeling, I could have answered twenty, and I wouldn't have surprised myself, or felt the need to retract it. My mouth felt completely at the mercy of my mind's impulses. Maybe that had something to do with why, when Martha asked, I gave my maiden name, Lane, rather than my married one. The room's free for the rest of the week, she told me. Oh, I'll be gone by then. Well, just let us know the night before you decide to leave. All right. The room was tiny, with a window to the front set deep and low in the stone wall. There was as much furniture as space would allow. A single brass bedstead, the mattress raised high off the ground and tucked tightly with a floral eider down. A small oak wardrobe, the door of which opened only partially before making contact with a velvet-covered armchair and a matching footstool, on which rested a tray of tea things. There were painted plates mounted on the green fleur-de-lis walls and a pink and white striped rug, hardly bigger than a bath mat. The tiled shower room, an equally tight squeeze, was clean and well lit, all I could ask for. I unpacked my few bits and pieces and spent the morning resting, only half aware of the sounds and smells of Sunday lunch rising from the terrace below. I felt safe here, cocooned by the patterns and textures of the room. I was no longer so eager to climb hills and explore churches. There was plenty of time for that, I decided. Later, I whiled away an hour or two in the sun, having a cup of tea among the tourists. One group had just visited the nearby botanical gardens, a terrific success, judging by the cries of delight, as cameras were passed back and forth, before the arrival of a cream tea brought fresh excitement. It was a while before the exclamations died down, and I quite missed the jolly group once it had departed. Still, I felt detached from myself, from my mind. Thoughts drifted in and out of my head, but I couldn't hold one steady. It was like chasing dreams. By the time I'd recalled it, it no longer made any sense. I wondered if Russell had remembered to make the boys something to eat. They were used to a proper lunch on Sunday, and there was a chicken in the fridge from my last supermarket shop. I should phone them, I knew, to tell them I had arrived safely, and that I was extending my stay, but there was no hurry. No one's life was at risk. I deserved my break from roasting chickens. I thought of my friend Jill, who lived on the other side of the park from us, and who'd phoned me a few times since Mum died. We'd said we might meet for a stroll in the park today. She'd urged me to surround myself as much as possible with nature, with living things. Well, she'd approve of this glorious bowl of green, surely. I'd never seen so much nature in my life. Checking my mobile phone, unusable at Angel's Lane, I saw that it didn't get a signal here, either. Well, if anyone phoned the house for me, Russ would explain. I checked the clock, four o'clock, 
and without even making the conscious decision, I got to my feet and set off once more for Richie's cottage. He and Wren were out on the deck again, he painting the back door, and she busy with a tray of felt tips. Her picture was of a vase of flowers, and I could make out the words Mummy in wobbly purple letters in the bottom corner. She'd changed from her beach clothes into a full-skirted sundress tied behind the neck, an old-fashioned cotton print of scattered red cherries, and the style made me think of my own childhood, the notion of Sunday best that was all but lost to my son's generation. I noticed her pen lid scattered all about. Jamie and Noah had always been so precise with theirs, counting them up, keeping them separate from one another's, devising ways to preserve the last of the ink. Not once had there been a blue lid on an orange pen. At the sound of my tread on the veranda step, they both looked up from their work. I wanted to invite you to Valerie's for afternoon tea, I said without preamble. Scones and jam and cream. It's supposed to be good. I don't like jam, Wren said with suspicion. That's okay, I smiled at her. There was something about Wren that drew the corners of your mouth towards your ears without you even thinking about it. You could just have the cream, or maybe they'll have honey or lemon curd. Do you like either of those? Her eyes widened. I haven't tried churd, but I like honey. Did you know I've seen a real beehive? I wasn't scared at all. Richie, who had resumed painting during this exchange, now interrupted his work a second time to reach down and ruffle his daughter's hair. Ran, we have to do your handwriting homework once I finish this, and the reading book we forgot on Friday. She scowled. That's boring! I caught the look of irritation on his face. Is everything all right? I asked. I could help Ren with her homework if you're busy with that. Everything's fine. We just have a million chores to do, that's all. His voice was flat, and when our eyes met, I saw a wariness in his that had not been there that morning. Evidently, the beach walk and the rest of the day's activities had stirred in him more of the natural questions one might consider asking a figure blasted from a past of almost a quarter of a century ago. Why is she here? Must be the top of the list. Followed closely by, and why again so soon? Once was a pleasant surprise, but twice... What was that? Harassment? I felt hurt by the idea, as hurt as if he'd opened his mouth and accused me of it directly. Aren't you taking in the sights this afternoon anyway? He asked at last. Make the most of the great weather. Yes, you're right. I should do that. I took a step backwards. I'm sorry, I know how busy weekends are. Forgive me. I shouldn't be bothering you like this. I just... I trailed off, not knowing how to explain, and he looked at me with greater uncertainty. I'll go. Wren frowned up at her father. Oh, Daddy, I want scones! Another time, sweetie. You heard what I said about the homework. She pushed her pens away. It's not fair! I don't like today! Richie just sighed, dipped his brush into his can of pale pink and gently blotted the drips onto the rim. Well, I'm sorry, Ran, but that's just the way it is. As he spoke, his voice sank with an unfamiliar sadness, and I found myself holding my breath, unable to move. Then, murmuring my goodbyes, I hurried away, hating to think I'd caused a disagreement between the two of them. At first, as I walked back to Rope Street, my stride was restless and my mind fretful. But even before I'd reached Valerie's, both had returned to an even keel. Those mysterious new powers of relaxation were back again, just in time to protect me from the fear that I had had my moment with Richie, that our reunion had already been and gone. Chapter 13 Dad says Warren Briscoe is a perfectly nice guy, that he has nothing personal against him. He talks as if Mum were his daughter and has brought home a suitor to meet him. 
Since she is smitten and there's nothing he can do to change her mind, he might just as well be civilised about it. But Warren is not going to be Dad's son-in-law. He's going to be his wife's second husband. It seems odd to me that Dad can't see the difference. Sometimes I wonder about Warren. I wonder if he's reinvented himself like Mum has, exaggerating his Americanness the way she has her Englishness. All that swaggering from room to room at the Acacia Street house. The exclamations over the smallness of food items. Packets of cheese and cartons of orange juice seem to be a particular source of obsession. The grumbles about the rain. Geez, not again. Maybe we should go build ourselves an ark. Even though it's an unusually fine summer for us. The whole cowboy act. Like Mum. He has embraced his new partner's foreign vocabulary with gusto. The difference, Dean points out, is that he doesn't pretend he isn't doing it deliberately. He knows full well the words don't belong to him. Instead, he puts on a comic British accent. Shall we all have a cuppa? Maybe a tea cake? Filthy weather, isn't it? But there's something stifled in his chortle that I would not have thought of a cowboy. I would have expected a proper shout of laughter, like the way Richie laughs. Warren's laugh is small and cautious, as if he knows that what is going on is not funny. Not really. Would you say your dad is the same? I ask Richie, dropping into his basement one evening before dinner. He looks up from the black pages of his music magazine. All the magazines Richie reads have black pages. The same as what? The same as himself. Is he acting the same here as he does back home? Richie pulls a face. He has such beautiful bone structure that even pulling a face looks pretty on him. If you mean, has he made a fool of himself before this, then yeah, he sure has. They all do it. My mom as well. She's worse, actually. You don't want to know some of the sleazebags she's been dating. Why do they do it? I demand. It's really embarrassing. He snickers. That's why, I guess. It's the only way they can keep our attention. We are talking about different things, different people. But it doesn't matter. I like the way he finds everyone's behaviour so entertaining. For me, this is a brand new way of looking at your family. And he makes me feel confident. Like I can ask him anything at all, and he'll give me a straight answer. He won't dismiss me. Did my mum ever talk about us? About Dean and me? What, you mean back home? He closes the magazine and frisbees it to the floor. Sure, all the time. Really? Didn't you... I falter, and he waits a while before prompting me. Didn't I what? I feel suddenly overcome with sadness, and am terrified I might cry. Didn't your dad ever ask her why she left her own children for so long? He must realise this is shaky ground. He must know how much rests on his answer. But neither his eyes nor his voice waver. Not when I was there, no. I guess they must talk about all that stuff when they're on their own. Hey, don't forget, he's divorced as well. He's gone months without seeing me. Like my mom is right now. He probably thinks it's normal. Do you think it's normal? I mean, a whole year? He shrugs, rubs at the end of his nose with his knuckles. Of course not. I think it's fucking weird. Not unless there's some actual reason, you know, like there's a restraining order or whatever. No restraining order. Only her own free will. And did you know she never sent us her address? So we couldn't write to her? Dad said she was moving about too much, but I think she just didn't want to hear our news. His eyes widen. I didn't know that, no. Wow. Why do you think she did it all then? I ask. He rubs his nose again. She must have been having some kind of breakdown, yeah. Like my mom. Yours had a breakdown? When? A few years ago, when she and Dad broke up. She was depressed. They gave her all these pills. But it was okay once we moved away and she started over. Sometimes that's the only thing that works. 
That's what she says anyways. Maybe that's what your mum was doing, only... Only without us, I finish flatly. Right. There is a silence. This is the most confidential we've been with each other. And I'm teetering on the edge of something deeper, something new. But I lose my nerve and pull back. I don't want to offend him. I don't want to embarrass myself. And I still have too many questions to ask about my own mother. So, what did she say when she talked about us? He considers me for a long time with his so blue eyes. But I don't see the blue then, only the kindness. Just how much she missed you, that kind of thing. Pretty cheesy. She said she wanted to call you, but your dad wouldn't let her speak to you. Really? I'm indignant on Dad's behalf. Dad would never do that. She didn't ring us once. She said Dean would be out. He was always partying. Dean's her favourite, I confirm, though I'm not so sure about the present tense. Neither of us are her favourites now. Rather, Warren and Richie are her favourites. She's her own favourite. Oh, and she had photos in her purse, Richie tells me. Your brother looks exactly the same. I recognised him right away, but you... I wait, hardly daring to breathe. You looked a lot younger in the photo, and the way she described you, I was expecting something totally different. I frown. How do you mean, totally different? I don't know. I guess she must have changed a lot in the last year. The way he studies my face, his gaze bold and knowing, makes me hopeful that he means changed in a good way, a special way. But again, to my disappointment, I am the first to crack. I can manage only a second or two before looking away. Chapter 14 Ah, uh, not back tonight. We'll phone tomorrow. Oh, kiss. P.S. Trouble with signal. I didn't eat tea. I hadn't eaten anything since a slice of toast at breakfast. But my brain didn't seem to register my stomach's neglect. It wasn't anything new. When I thought about it, I hadn't had much of an appetite for weeks now. Often I'd drop my fork at the same time as Russell and the boys did theirs. But their plates were scraped clean while mine was hardly a third cleared. Reminding myself at least to stay hydrated in the sun, I took a bottle of water with me into the garden and settled with my book in the shade of an apple tree. Late afternoon slipped into evening, and presently the hotel bar opened for business. It didn't take long for the tables to fill, high-spirited voices collecting in sudden rushes of volume before falling into murmurs again as the food arrived and everyone ate. Every so often, Martha came out to clear tables and tuck in chairs ready for the next group. It was she who had told me of the much-prized lone square foot of Rope Street, where a mobile phone signal could be had, right at the top of the car park behind the craft centre. And having visited the spot, and successfully sent a text to Russell, I now had no other responsibility to honour between now and bedtime. It was a long, long time since that had been the case. I laid back my head on the grass and closed my eyes, thinking how completely different the air was here from in London. Smoother, newer somehow. I felt it on the hairs on my arms and neck, and if I turned my head suddenly it was like brushing my face against a length of silk, or sinking into a giant pillow of this stuff. Olivia? There you are. I sat up, blinking to life. It was Richie, standing a little lower down the lawn and tilting his face up towards me at a querying, childlike angle. Focusing, I found that my vision was just as intensified as my sense of touch. The colours in front of me, unusually rich and saturated. The line of his blue jeans against the green of the grass was almost fluorescent. The tan of his arms against the yellowing dusk sky, as defined as in a cartoon. He looked, in this perfect light, as eye-catchingly beautiful as I remembered from years ago. The boy we'd all wanted for ourselves, and who I had won, at least I thought I had, for a little while. 
I brushed a leaf from my arm and smiled at him. Hello again. Hello again. A sensation ran through me like déjà vu. But I knew it wasn't that, because this was something that had happened before. The way he stood before me awaiting my attention. The way we echoed each other's greetings, because neither was sure of what was coming next. Of what there was between us. Where's the little one? I asked. Still drawing her pictures? He gestured in the rough direction of Angel's Lane. In bed. A neighbour is minding her for me. Do you have time for a beer? I owe you one. Sure. Thanks. When I returned from the bar, I found he had claimed my spot under the tree. So I cleared a second area of fallen apples and arranged myself at a polite distance from him. He responded by stretching out his legs between us in an obvious barrier. He seemed to be having trouble getting comfortable, a far cry from the spontaneous flop to the floor of old, and of yesterday. Clearly, he had something on his mind. Olivia, can I ask you a question? Of course you can. I sipped my drink and waited. Please, don't get me wrong, but, well... Another minor adjustment of the legs. What are you doing here, exactly? What do you mean? I didn't allow myself to glance at the envelope tucked into my paperback for a bookmark. For a moment I feared its proximity to me. To us. Richie gestured to a group of hikers who'd just settled on the other side of the lawn in a chaotic heap of backpacks, maps and water bottles. You're obviously not like the rest of the tourists here. The ramblers and the history buffs. I looked at him, torn between blurting out the truth, and more besides, and guarding it with my life. The thing is, I'm not really sure what I'm doing here. But now I am here, well, I like it. I don't know why, but I feel very safe here. Safe? He pounced on the word as something significant. So do you not feel safe at home, then? I didn't know what to say to that. No, yes, of course I do. He tipped back his beer and drank, his eyes still fixed on me. Look, I know this is none of my business, but have you left your husband or something? Has there been some sort of incident with him? No, not at all. I couldn't imagine how he had come to this conclusion. Russell and I are fine. You're fine, he repeated. Okay, my mistake, I'm sorry. Though he smiled, I noticed that only one side of his mouth curved upwards, making it less apologetic than doubtful. But I guess that's kind of why I'm a bit confused by this sudden visit. You and your husband are fine. Your kids are still in school, so how do you come to be on holiday on your own? He didn't know any other mothers who did that. That was what he was saying. Any other wives. And nor did I. I sighed. It's not a holiday. It's hard to explain what it is, really. It's to do with Maggie passing away, is it? I took a deep breath. Yes, I think it must be. All of this year I've been rushing backwards and forwards to her place, trying to see her as much as I could and still do everything I needed to at home. It's been exhausting, like working and working for something huge, but when you get to it, it's actually just a huge empty nothingness. How horrible and selfish that sounded. As if her illness and death had had no meaning in the world, except for their impact on me. I was glad Lindy wasn't here to hear it. Gentle, selfless Lindy. Richie just stared, not betraying any reaction. I guessed his silence was to give me a second chance to explain. I tried again. I suppose what I mean is that, since her death, I've been wanting to take stock a bit. I like that much better. Take stock. It sounded like something anyone might do. It had purpose. I needed some time on my own, you know, a breather. To be somewhere that feels like a kind of retreat from the chaos. I didn't add that in the last few years I'd come to make an elaborate daydream of this idea of a retreat, of being whisked away from my life and installed somewhere else, and not in a spa or by a pool, but something closer to a hospital or a religious sanctuary, a place of peace and order, a 
place where someone looked after me. More selfishness. But at least I hadn't confessed this portion of it aloud. Taking stock. Okay. Richie scratched at the curve of his upper lip. I guess I was wondering why Millington in the first place. You didn't come down here especially to look me up. I hesitated, resisting another glance towards the bookmark at my side. If I'd come to any conclusions during my day alone, it was that I should not mention my mother's part in this. An envelope, empty but for a single address, his address. It would sound absurd, and I would look absurd for having acted on it. The word macabre sprang to mind, Jamie's voice, deliberately camp. It's totally macabre, Mum. Well, maybe it was. Maybe that was why its presence made me so wary. I looked brightly at Richie. I came to this village to look you up. Yes, that's true. Hearing about you being here gave me an idea for where I could go. Hearing about it? Again, he regarded me unblinkingly over the top of his drink. Yes, I said. Someone must have mentioned it at the funeral. To my relief, he accepted this without question. But I think I was going to go somewhere anyway. I had to get away before I lost my mind once and for all. I laughed, showing I meant this purely as a figure of speech, but for the first time in this conversation, Richie was nodding in recognition, as though this was exactly what he'd expected me to say. So what about your family, then? Oh, they're quite capable of looking after themselves for a few days. I'm not the first woman to need a break from her family. I'm sure you're not, he agreed. You've spoken to them, then. They know you're down here. I've sent a text. I think it got through, but it's obviously a bit hit and miss around here. You could use a landline. Val must have one here. Or you're welcome to come back and borrow mine. I shrugged. The truth was that this problem with the phone signals suited me just fine. I didn't want a long conversation with Russell or with anyone in London. If I did, I need only have stayed there to have it. But I sensed such an answer would only fuel whatever suspicions Richie had developed about the state of my marriage. I'll talk to Russell tomorrow, I said. Honestly, it's no big deal. It was a subconscious imitation of Richie, or my Richie of old. His attitude, his phrase, his shrug. No wonder he could do nothing but concede the point. He swallowed another mouthful of beer. It was obvious he hadn't yet finished what he had come here to say. Perhaps he had not yet begun it. And a part of me was thrilled that he evidently cared enough to say it at all. What? You're worried about something. There's honestly no need. The thing is, Olivia... His fingers began to pluck at the grass, scattering the blades over his trouser legs. He had definitely not fidgeted like this yesterday. I might be completely out of line here, but you seem like you're not really coping that well. Your mom's death has obviously hit you hard. You seem totally traumatized, like you've just walked away from a plane wreck or something. Oh. My eyes widened in surprise. Don't get me wrong. I realize you're probably different from how I remember you from however many years ago. Hey, I know I am. It's just, well, I guess I just know the signs. His voice dipped then, and he had to consciously retrieve it before he could make himself heard again. I was a complete zombie after Lisa died. I mean, you function, okay? You do what you have to. But you know you're not reacting right. Some things feel way too intense and other things don't feel like anything at all. It's like you can't even remember what your normal self is anymore. Not that I can say what yours is, of course, like I say, it's been a long time, but whatever it is, do you think maybe you're not it right now? I stared at him, riveted. Despite his tangled delivery, he was describing how I felt better than I could myself, except perhaps for the most mysterious bit of all. That feeling of lightness in my blood. That unshakable sense of rightness I'd had from the moment I began walking down Stirling Avenue yesterday morning. 
that sensation I'd had in the taxi of being propelled forward by some force far greater than any car's engine could give me. There had been no plane crash, no, but there was still wreckage to free myself from, and my body seemed to know instinctively that home was not the place for me to do it. None of which I said aloud, but finally, breaking the silence, asked only, Who's Lisa? He didn't flicker. Ran's mother. When did she die? Four years ago. So, having finally been presented with the information, my mind was slow to work it out. Ren must have been tiny. Just a baby. He nodded. She wasn't much more than one, almost fifteen months. It's hard for her to remember, which in some ways is a good thing. He inhaled sharply before continuing. Today was the anniversary. We'd just got back from the cemetery when you came over earlier. It's a bit of a way away, a long drive, and Ren was tired. I was trying to get the day back to normal before school tomorrow. Oh, God. I thought of Wren in her special grown-up dress, her favourite, probably, her picture of the flowers, the little wobbly mummy in the corner. I don't like today, she'd said. And into their private grief I had blundered, offering scones and cream. Not only that, but I had sat here just now complaining to him about my terrible sense of nothingness. My eyes brimmed with tears. I'm so sorry, Richie. I should never have bothered you, today or yesterday. I had no idea this was such an important weekend. I gaped at him, hardly bearing to picture the little girl I'd met so much tinier and newly motherless. I had no idea, I repeated. He shrugged. How could you? But if I'd known you were down here, when it happened, it's only a few hours away, I would have got in touch, tried to help. He dismissed this with a quick smile. I had family and friends to help. We've been okay. We're doing okay. We're fine on our own. How did it happen? I couldn't stop myself from asking, knowing it was intrusive. But to my surprise, he replied quite readily. He was almost matter-of-fact about it. She drowned in a swimming pool. She'd had quite bad asthma as a child, but there'd been nothing for years. No reason to take special precautions. Then she went swimming when there was no one else around. She had an attack and couldn't get help in time. It was a freak accident, nobody's fault. I wondered how long it had taken him to perfect this tone, to make the horrific sound so every day. Where were you and Ren? Ren was at home with her grandma. We'd gone away without her just for a couple of days. I was in our hotel room sleeping. I was probably no more than 50 meters from the pool, close enough to have got there in time if I'd known. Oh, Richie. Though he was still perfectly composed, looking candidly at me, I could sense the pull between his hands and his face, that ancient instinct to bury grief. Hey! He said at last, we've both had our tragedies. I'm not the only one. I shook my head. I knew about Mum, though. We had months to prepare, and she was cared for at home right until the end. They told me her quality of life couldn't have been better, that it was exactly what most sufferers wish for for the end of their lives. But your situation, out of nowhere, and with Wren so young, I can't even imagine it. Don't imagine it, he said quickly. I really don't recommend it. Pretend we never had this conversation. Despite the words and the blankness of his tone, his eyes were bright and spirited. And in that second I knew that he had never pretended. He'd never shied away from anything in his life. He was as bold and honest as he'd been when I first knew him. Only now he was applying those qualities to surviving loss. To protecting his little girl. I can never be like this, I thought. I can leave my home and cross the country and surrender to whatever it is that has stopped me from going back when I said I would.
but I can never find strength like his. That was what had attracted me to him over twenty years ago. His courage. The bit that was missing in me. Richie was motioning to the gardens around us, the pond and hills and horizon line of sea. That was the reason we came here, Ran and me, for a fresh start, a much simpler... He sought for the word framework, all that stuff. I looked around the area, drove around day after day, looking for the safest, quietest place I could find. And it had to be pretty, like something from one of her storybooks. You know, flowers everywhere, ponies in the fields, the full works. I nodded. And you know what? It's worked. She's happy. We're happy. Every day something good happens. Millington is... It's a good place. That's what made me wonder when you said you felt safe here. It is safe. No matter what might have happened to you in other places. His voice had become more emphatic and a tremor had started in his face, just above the right brow. As the silence between us grew, I wanted to break it by kissing him just once, gently, in comfort or, failing that, to just reach towards him and touch his face. In all my thousands of imaginings over the years, I'd never predicted this for him, a widower with a young daughter, hidden away in the English countryside, doing okay. I think I'm going to stay here a few more days, I said at last. Do you want me to keep out of your way? I would understand if you did. No hard feelings. I know it must seem weird, my being here. The half-smile was back. You wouldn't be able to avoid me if you tried. This is a very small place, as you may have noticed. He pressed his knuckles to the grass and pushed himself up. Thanks for the beer. I'd better get back. I'll see you. There was a suggestion of a question to his farewell. I was sure of it, but he was already out of earshot by the time I came to reply. See you, Richie, I echoed into the silky night air. Part Two Swans are very attentive parents, so the sight of a young lone signet may mean that something is amiss. Royal Society for the Protection of Birds Chapter 15 Oh, how are you getting on? Any idea when you might be back? Ah, kiss. Russell stood motionless by the kitchen window, feeling only unease at the evidence of another clear sunny morning. It was Thursday, the fifth day without Olivia, and the fourth of four that he would be late for work. Why was that exactly? The obvious excuse was Jamie and Noah. Their discarded cereal bowls sat on the dining table behind him, complete with the milk spills of much younger children. But he could hardly blame them for his own failure to adapt. The truth was, they had reacted to their mother's unplanned leave with surprising self-sufficiency. Getting their own breakfasts and leaving together for the school bus at quarter to eight. They seemed to be seeing to their own uniform supplies as well, which was just as well, as Russell was having enough trouble getting himself dressed in the mornings. Shirts were his biggest problem. Having expected Olivia back on Sunday, and since then having addressed the issue of her absence purely on a one-day-at-a-time basis, he had been ironing his shirts singly. He had not, however, washed any, and now that there were none left to iron, the inevitable Amperse had been reached. He knew this for sure, because he had been the one to devise the family's laundry system, washed clothes on the rail above the washing machine, pressed ones on the rail above the ironing board. There were shirts on neither. Just now, he had resorted to plucking yesterday's from the laundry basket, before biting the bullet and stuffing a bundle of others into the machine. As he wrenched open a new box of powder, spraying himself in the process, the frontage of the overpriced dry cleaners next to the station had come temptingly to mind. Childishly, he blamed the weather. It was this hot spell that was encouraging her to stay away, to prolong this sudden need for time alone. Not that he begrudged her it for a moment, of course. Her mother had just died, for God's sake. She was in mourning. 
He'd have to be a complete brute to object. And he'd feel the same himself, no doubt, if she were here and he were there. Not that he'd quite got a grip on where there was. Where are you? he'd asked when she'd phoned him on Monday morning at the office. He'd tried hard to keep the haplessness from his voice, and not only for the benefit of any eavesdropping colleagues. I'm in Dorset, she said, by the sea. It's doing me good, Russ. I already feel better. Good, good. That's great news. So you... She spoke over him. I think I'm going to stay for a few more days, if you're all right on your own. Of course, yes. He remembered that weird, ghostly look she'd had about her when she'd left on Saturday, and the way she'd thanked him, as if being granted leave by the most traditional roost-ruling of husbands. This wasn't the 19th century. She didn't need his permission to leave her own house. Take as long as you need, he added bravely. We can cope. You got my text message yesterday? Yep. He didn't mention that, thanks to gremlins in the phone system, it had not been delivered to him until close to midnight. He'd known not to worry, of course, even when his own calls went unanswered. But still, he had been relieved when the message had finally come. Texts had followed in the morning for the boys, pinging into their inboxes at the breakfast table within seconds of one another, and glanced at only casually. So unconcerned were they by their mother's absence that Jamie probably wouldn't have thought to mention the message at all had not Noah passed over his phone at the first request. Hi, boys. Have a good week at school. I miss you. Love, Mum. Kiss, kiss. Two kisses for two boys. That was sweet. But it had seemed to Russell that the wording of it, have a good week, implied that she didn't think she'd be seeing them again until nearer the weekend, next weekend, which was quite different from the not back tonight content of his own message. Still, he'd only had a few hours to wait before she'd got in touch. I did try you earlier, she said dutifully, but it's hard to get through from here. Before he could inquire once more where here was, she was asking after the boys. Did they get off to school all right? Russell focused. Yep, they seemed to have everything they needed, and I should be able to slope off a bit early to get dinner together. He'd wanted to add that they were missing her already, but she must have lost reception then, because when her voice came back it was only to repeat, as though he suffered with a hearing impairment, that she'd phone again later! when she had a better signal. On reflection, it was probably just as well he hadn't said it. He didn't want to make her feel guilty for taking this break, however impromptu, however inconveniently timed. As the day wore on, and Tuesday and Wednesday too, and no second call came, he knew not to let himself slip into fear or doubt for the simple reason that she had left him no instructions for the week's domestic arrangements. There were no extra litres of milk, no portions for three of lasagna in the freezer, no post-its about trainers or swimming shorts designed to be spotted at crucial moments of male forgetfulness. Once, when she'd gone to stay for two nights with an old girlfriend, there had been a three-page guide to decoding the boys' labyrinthine commitments though he seemed to remember he had left them to their own devices then as well. No, Olivia was an organised woman. This extension to her weekend was spontaneous and necessary. She'd be back any minute. The kitchen clock said 8.45am. So why was he still not moving? He had a shirt on his back, for God's sake, even if it did smell of sweaty boxer shorts. The mug of Nescafe in his hand was drained to the last drop. And then, above his head, he heard a key turn in the front door. At last, here she was. Talk about the longest four days in history. He was ready to rush upstairs and gush endearments he hadn't made for years. So what if he got into work late again? He'd blame the Victoria line everybody else did. His legs on the stair were as light as air. Olivia, you Oh. Hello. The tones that bounced back down the hallway were the gruff, slightly masculine ones of their cleaner, Aniela. She looked up at him from where she was stooped by the stairs, 
exchanging her outdoor shoes for a pair of loafers. She had hung her jacket over the end of the radiator, rather than using the hooks by the door. A detail that struck Russell as tragic, though he wasn't sure why. An image of servants sleeping in doorways flashed in his brain and vanished again. That was right. Aniela came on Thursdays. Well, at least the place would be a bit more presentable for Olivia's return. And with Aniela on the case, at least he'd get a clean shirt for tomorrow. Where is Olivia? She queried at once. Though she had pretty features, her skin was subterranean pale, and her eyelashes clotted with startling black mascara. She didn't look terribly healthy. Russell swallowed. She's not here. She's taking a short holiday, but she'll be back for next time. I'm just on my way out, but... Aniela, when the load in the washing machine finishes, could you iron one of my shirts? Any one will do. She looked blankly at him, obviously not following what he was saying. He considered miming it all out, but before he could begin, she was leading him downstairs herself, not to the laundry room, but to the corkboard and a torn half-sheet of notepaper containing a poorly spelled list of cleaning items. Aren't they in the usual place? She swept past him to the sink, opened the cupboard doors beneath, and resurfaced at once with an expression of exaggerated query. The items on the list had obviously not yet been replenished. Russell grinned, embarrassed. Next week, he said, too loudly. And can we pay you then as well? I don't think I've got any cash on me. He mined this by putting his hand in his trouser pocket and showing her an empty palm, which made him feel like an extra from Oliver. OK, she said, turning away from him to get on. He got the feeling his hopelessness was nothing less than she would have expected of him. Twenty minutes later, as he clung to the overhead strap on the tube, Russell listened to a conversation between two women about dinner plans with their boyfriends and felt the belt of his chest muscles tighten a notch. No, he mustn't allow himself to feel neglected after so laughably short a time. Olivia needed time to herself. It was perfectly reasonable, if unprecedented, and she would be back in the next day or two, by Friday at the latest. They'd go for pizza with the boys and catch up on everything, and soon they'd all be on holiday together, and before they knew it, August would have passed, and they'd have Maggie's windfall. He hadn't liked to press his wife on the nitty-gritty of it, but he'd got the impression from Dean that they were talking at least half a million pounds between the two of them, possibly more, depending on the valuation of the house in Gloucestershire. She'd been an odd fish, Maggie, and not the greatest mother in the world, but when it came to property, she and her second husband, Alec, had displayed pretty good judgment. £250,000 minimum. That would pay off their mortgage give them some breathing space. Russell turned his face away from the huge guy squeezing past him to exit the carriage. He couldn't have been in a more awkward position if he'd tried, a newsprint from the man's paper smeared across the sleeve of his already grubby white shirt. Breathing space. Yes, he could understand just why Olivia needed some. He could do with a bit of it himself. Russell had the kind of job that failed point-blank to inspire interest or enthusiasm in any third party. His was the career that no one could quite put their finger on, and he was often asked at social events, even ones with close family. So, what exactly is your job title? This, he knew, was a creative way of saying, What is it you do again? I've completely forgotten. Well, if they were interested, his job title was Business Development Manager brackets, bolt-on services, for a medium-sized software firm. Dull though it was, certain other individuals in the team had managed to flourish well enough. His friend Duncan, for instance, with whom he had entered the company as a junior exec all those centuries ago. Duncan was positively flamboyant in his success, gaining a promotion at most annual reviews and by now established as Russell's senior director not to mention the possessor of significant stock options. For this reason, and despite their friendship, Duncan had come to cut a depressing figure for Russell. No sooner had he arrived at his desk in the morning, 
than his old friend would be passing by in a better-cut suit and a sharper haircut. Even his dentistry was demonstrably superior. As Russell's teeth yellowed over the years, drifting somewhat inwards, Duncan's seemed only to have pearlized and straightened with time. And it wasn't one-upmanship on Dunk's part, not in the slightest, for things had gone far beyond that stage. Now the difference between them was so settled as to be unremarkable. It was just the way it was. Duncan had made it, Russell had not. And the most galling part of it was that Duncan needed it less, because his wife was a city solicitor and bringing in a healthy whack of her own. All set for our eleven o'clock, Duncan asked him. The Falconer team have just got into Paddington. They're in a taxi on their way over. Sure, yeah, great. It would take a good twenty minutes for the client to get here, so Russell took the opportunity to sign into his online bank account and scan the latest statement of his and Olivia's expenditure. No activity on her part since a withdrawal of cash at Waterloo Station last Saturday. Two hundred pounds. That wasn't going to last long. These days, two hundred pounds left your hands so quickly, the notes were still warm from the dispenser, which meant she must be running up a hotel bill. That was a worry, though one he knew he would need to suppress. She was bereaved, in desperate need of a break. What was a bit of room service and a sea view when you'd been sitting at the bedside of your dying mother for the last six months? Not to mention clocking up more miles on the motorway than a professional trucker. And Olivia hated driving. The balance was as close to zero as it usually was at this time of the month. As a rule, there was only one month in the year when the account showed a healthy surplus, and that was April, bonus time. But that was always earmarked for whatever new bit of hardware the boys needed, or the family's first new sofa in a decade. That, and a ten-day summer holiday, and the excess would be consumed without a trace. He browsed the last few months' debits, the most startling being the large cheque written at Easter for the boys' summer term school fees. Now, that was definitely an arrangement that had outlived the original plan. When Olivia had marshalled him and a three-year-old Jamie around the various school open days ten years ago, her proposal had been simple and sensible. The local infant schools were a disaster. So, what about three years at fee-paying pre-prep to get a head start, and then directly into the state system at age seven? Meanwhile, she would look actively into the possibility of their moving house into the catchment area of a decent junior school. There was no question that this would involve any more than a year or two of both boys at an independent school at the same time. School fees for one child was a misfortune, but two was carelessness. That was the joke she'd made at the time. He remembered her exact words. They'd been in total agreement. Then came the whole business of Jamie's giftedness and the arrival in their lives of the famous Herring School. Sometimes, secretly, Russell liked to call it the Red Herring School. Was he the only one who suspected an emperor's new clothes situation here? Not that he wasn't proud of his son, it was just that, well... If Jamie's brain was in the top two percentile of his age group, as the IQ tests proved, then wouldn't he fare well at any school? Not so, said Olivia and her experts. By putting him among lesser brains, they ran the risk of his concealing his abilities in a bid to fit in. He might struggle socially and become introverted, all the while dying of intellectual frustration. They couldn't let that happen, could they? And so... Off Jamie went to be educated by the only people in the land up to the job. Then, a blink of an eye later, Noah was being fitted for the uniform too, chomping at the bit to join his brother in his after-school clubs and his holiday courses and all the other genius essentials that cost Russell extra. I was thinking we might qualify for a scholarship, Olivia said, but in the vague way that meant it wasn't going to make the top of her famous to-do list. To be fair, she had passed him the information about applying. But it quickly became clear to him that there was no way on earth their family would qualify. They had to be having palpable difficulties with paying, which as far as he could work out meant going about in rags and eating meals from other people's bins. Today, 
Almost half of their disposable income went on school fees. They had conversations about downsizing to a smaller house, about as often as most families discuss Friday night takeaway options. Always, Olivia would theoretically convert the stamp duty required to move into another year's school fees. Always, this was what they went on to do. She murmured occasionally about grandparents helping out, but since both sets had other grandchildren, none of whom attended schools like Herring's, this was never actually proposed. He could only imagine Dean's reaction to such favouritism. As for working herself, it was a well-known fact that very few jobs suited the hours available to the mothers of young children, and those that did were as hotly contested as internships in the Oval Office. Together, they'd worked out that a full-time secretarial job, once before and after school care, and or an au pair or childminder were factored in, would earn the family about as much as a paper round. There had been one good spell not so long ago when Olivia had covered the maternity leave of an acquaintance in the office of a local primary school, her hours dovetailing perfectly with those of the boys. But the woman had come back at the earliest opportunity, which figured, since she would have known as well as the rest of them what gold dust she held in her hands. And Olivia was back to square one. No. It was down to Russell and Russell alone to keep the carousel turning. And never more so than now. Ready? Duncan asked, back already. His face was tanned. He must have been sunning himself in the evenings in the landscaped garden of his house in North London. A neighbourhood described by the papers as shishi and said to be thronged with celebrities. His next-door neighbour was an actor in a hit BBC spy drama, and the two sometimes had impromptu barbecues together and cracked open the cigars. It was only a theory, but Duncan thought they got on as well as they did because he had no intention of behaving any differently with a famous face than he would with any Tom, Dick or Harry. Or Russell. Closing the on-screen window that framed his paltry financial picture, Russell manoeuvred himself backwards as though confined to a wheelchair. For a moment he wasn't sure if his legs would lift him, but they came through for him at the last moment just as they always did. Yep, he answered Duncan's question, onwards and upwards. But he spoke with a sarcasm that was heavy even for him. Chapter 16 Those first few days in Millington, I explored. I explored to the point of exhaustion. I would set off after breakfast with nothing but a bottle of water and a borrowed map, and I'd strike out into the hills, climbing until my chest burned and I had to stagger into the nearest scrap of shade to rest. Other times, I'd meander down to the beach through lanes so narrow and overgrown I could hardly see above the high screens of nettles and wild grasses to get my bearings. It was still sunny, but sultrier than at the weekend and mostly breezeless. Falling into conversation with Valerie and other staff at the guesthouse, I was told that this was typical of the microclimate here, that the hills protected the village from the winds and rains of the Atlantic. Spared all but nature's best, the inhabitants felt lucky to live in the little sheltering cup of their village. I began to feel lucky too. That phrase of Richie's came back to me often on my walks. Millington is a good place. What I thought he meant was that it was restorative. It had helped to heal him. Did that mean it would heal me too? Was that the reason I had not returned to London on Sunday evening when I knew I had been expected? Nor Monday, nor Tuesday, nor Wednesday? Had I known from the moment the taxi set me down here that I was not going to leave? Perhaps Richie had sensed it when he'd talked about the hotels getting full in high season. He'd had a presentiment of what I hadn't yet understood myself. I didn't see him those first weekdays. Not a glimpse in the distance. Not a wave from the road. He drove a battered old estate. I'd seen it parked in Angel's Lane, but not once on the move. I presumed he had decided my sudden reappearance was too unsettling for him that my new bereavement stirred up too much old grief of his own. I guessed he would simply lie low until such a time that my crisis had passed and I'd come to my senses and gone home to my family. Until such a time. 
And then, on Thursday afternoon, I ran into Wren. Delight flared inside me the instant I saw her. She was on the high street, on the raised pavement outside the grocer's, skipping about with another child as though on stage. It was four in the afternoon, and both children were dressed in navy shorts and lavender T-shirts printed with the slogan, Beechwood C of E, Learning for Life. They had finished school for the day, obviously. I watched as they began to argue about a game, each as insistent as the other. I won! No, I won! I did! And then one indignant voice broke off to exclaim, Oh, look! That's my daddy's friend over there! Hello, sweetie, I said, approaching. How are you? Fine. She beamed at me, eyes shy. Under her sun hat, her hair had been braided at either ear but was unravelling fast. There were freckles on her nose. Who's your friend? Chaz. Hello, Chaz. He was a sweet thing, plump and almost as short as Wren, with surprised wide-set blue eyes and a tiny pink mouth. That's a nice name. Are you really Charles? No, Wren answered for him. He's really Chaz. I see. She gave a sudden chuckle. Did you know he's still not five? My birthday's in August, Chaz confirmed woefully. He's the youngest boy in reception, Matthews, Wren crowed, as though this were a matter of public ridicule. But not as young as Maddie, Chaz protested. She's the youngest. And the smallest, Wren agreed. Are you with your dad? I asked, squinting beyond her into the nearest shop, a grocer's, bakery and tea room combined. No, Chaz's mummy. She's buying potatoes. As I hovered, a woman emerged from the shop, concentrating at first on the task of wedging bulging paper bags into the large hessian shopper over her shoulder, before settling her gaze on our little group. She was in her early thirties, I judged, her close-hanging dark hair and chunky clothes a little heavy for the weather, and her face was flushed with the heat. When she spoke, her voice was a little breathless. Hello? What's going on here? Hello, I said, stepping forwards. I'm Olivia. I was just being introduced to your son. I'm Sarah. They haven't been bothering you, have they? Not at all. I know Wren already. I'm an old friend of Richie's. I'm spending a few days in the village. It's a treat to bump into her. Wren's eyes flickered with pride, just as Sarah's registered curiosity. You're staying at the house, are you? No, no, in a B&B, &B, Valerie's. I was going to say I didn't see you this morning when I picked Wren up. Hey, stop that, you two! She broke off to pull back the children, who had begun to poke at the punnets of blackberries on display outside the shop. They're friends, then? I asked. Yes. Well, they argue quite a bit. They're like an old married couple sometimes. I suppose because they spend so much time together. They do? She gave me a more openly inquisitive look. Yes, I mind Wren while Richie's working. A couple of hours after school and in the holidays as well. Oh, I didn't realise. I didn't like to add that I didn't even know what Richie's work was. What had we talked about on Saturday night? We'd spent hours together. Had I asked any questions? Listened to any answers? I had an image of myself just staring at him across the deck in the fading light not quite believing that after all this time he was back in front of my eyes, back within touching distance. He's got something big on, has he? Yes, a renovation down in Bridport, a huge six-bedroom place. It just came up the other night. Another chap cancelled at the last minute. Good money as well. My daddy's a painter, Wren said to Chaz. My daddy's a manager, Chaz returned, in London. This seemed to trump Wren's claim, and she stood for a moment looking subdued before brightening again. Well, my daddy's taller! Nick commutes every day, Sarah told me, the flatter note in her voice dictating my response. That must be hard. It's quite a journey. Yeah. It makes it a long day, that's for sure. And the season ticket costs an arm and a leg. I didn't know what to say then. It felt unnatural to trade stories of my own husband's commuter hell. And in any case, 
I'd always imagined Russell travelling to and from work quite contentedly, reading his paper in a corner seat of the tube, time to himself, everything under control. I was just going to get something to read, I said at last. Is there a bookshop in the village? Sarah shook her head. No, but they've got a few paperbacks at the newsagents. You could try there. Thank you. Well, I'm sure I'll be seeing you again, she said politely. We're off to see the baby swans now, aren't we, kids? Once we've dropped our shopping at the house. What are they called again? Signets! the children chorused. Have you been down to the swannery yet, Olivia? she asked. No, no, I haven't. But I've seen where it is from the hilltop. You should go down there. It's the right time of year. You could come too, Wren said, which started Chaz off on a verse of going to the zoo. Thank you, I said, remembering Rich's reaction to my offer of tea on Sunday. I won't today, but maybe another time. When? She demanded over Chaz's singing, and she looked at me with that gaze of Rich's, the gaze that seemed to demand the truth of whoever it fell on. She doesn't know exactly when, Sarah answered for me, rolling amused eyes. The next time you ask, I said firmly, if it's all right with your daddy and Sarah. Wren looked as if she suspected she might have been tricked, but Sarah ushered her away before she could object. Come on, gang, we need to get going. As they made their way towards a nearby parked car, I could hear the song start up again. Going to the zoo, 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 how about you, you, you? Until the door closed, abruptly sealing their little voices inside the car. In the newsagents, I chose a thriller about a serial killer, the sort of story I had never been able to read in the past without getting horrible nightmares and asking Russell to double-check the bolts. I read it from cover to cover and slept like a lamb. The following afternoon, to my surprise, Richie brought Wren to Valerie's. We thought we'd take you up on your offer of tea, he said. It'll save me cooking. His manner was warm and easy. It was as if that anguished conversation under the apple tree had never taken place, and we had rewound to the unflustered companionship of the first night. Evidently he'd been working. There were traces of white paint all over his hands and forearms, and there was a sore-looking red mark on one of his thumbs. How was school? I asked Wren. She wore no sun hat, and I had to resist the temptation to release her soft, sandy hair from its pigtails. Fine. Daddy picked me up, she said. Did you know it was Mrs. Matthews's birthday? We sang Happy Birthday, and I got the bit of the cake with the most icing. So many birthdays in this village, I exclaimed. Do you all get more than one or something? No, of course not. I think you do, I joked. No, she said firmly. We don't. I straightened my face. Unlike my boys at this age, she didn't like teasing. For her, questions were clearly meant for factual answers, not for poking fun. I hear you work as a painter and decorator, I said to Richie. I thought your job on the windows was a bit too professional for a bit of weekend DIY. He grinned. I've been doing it a few years now. You get good quite quickly. The main thing is I'm paid for the work, not the hours, which gives me a bit of extra time with Ran. I try to pick her up from school a couple of times a week. Is there much work about? Not so much in Millington, but there are plenty of Londoners doing up holiday homes further along the coast. He looked at me, as if to identify me with this group. Lucky them, I said. I wish I had a place to come to. It's beautiful down here. I imagined myself in a cottage right on the water, just reeds of tall grass separating my home from the sand dunes, a striped deck chair on a small wooden veranda, like Richie's. I could almost feel the weight of my body against the stretched canvas, wind chimes overhead, sand rubbing smooth the soles of my feet. I'd lived in the city all my life. This had never been my dream. But here it was, in my head, fully formed. It was as if someone else had taken possession of my mind. Tea arrived. It involved so many bits of china there was hardly room for it all on the table. 
Wren loaded her plate with sandwiches and cakes, counting the various items and telling us how many of each we were entitled to. Again, my own appetite failed. I could hardly distinguish one flavour from the next, even though the reactions of Richie and Wren told me that it was all as mouth-watering as the signs promised. After Wren had declared she was full and got down from the table to explore the garden, Richie and I returned to the subject of work. You haven't told me what you do, he asked, for a job up in London. That, at least, was a question I could answer easily enough. I'd been asked it a thousand times, and my response rarely varied. I haven't worked for a while, actually, and not much at all since the boys came along. I suppose by the time they were both in school, I'd forgotten what it was I could do. Since then, well, I don't know what's happened to the time. I trailed off, sure that this succession of clichés would not wash with him. But he accepted them quite happily. He was treating me as fragile then. He hadn't forgotten the plane crash conversation at all. What did you do? No, hang on. You wanted to be a fashion designer, didn't you? I smiled. I think I probably just said that to impress you. No, that's not true. I remember you had all those sketchbooks and your hands were always smeared with charcoal. I was touched by his remembering such a detail. I didn't even apply to art college in the end. My A-level grades weren't great, and I did some other courses instead. A business studies thing, then a secretarial program. I couldn't make my mind up. I couldn't get my head together. I corrected myself silently, thinking about you, thinking about everything I'd lost. Actually, it was quite promising in the beginning. I got a job in the marketing office of a cable TV channel. I really enjoyed it there. But then I was made redundant and started temping. Wasn't that the same kind of work as Maggie? Similar. She was more of a career secretary. Before she left for the States, she'd worked for the same guy for years. He really relied on her. She always said she was the wind beneath his wings. It came back to me then. Something else my mother had said. Later but I couldn't remember if it was before she'd left for America or after she'd returned. I'm sick of being the wind. I want to be the wings. And Dean had said it was giving him wind, hearing her go on about it. That dated it, then. It must have been after. And then you had the kids, Richie prompted. I nodded. And when I did work again, just temporary stuff, I'd sort of lost my nerve. This was putting it mildly. I still recalled clearly the panic attacks I'd suffered in my last position in a local primary school office. Every time the phone rang, I would be crippled with anxiety, certain that the caller would be about to complain about me, about a mistake I'd made, some error that had had disastrous effects for his or her child. And though I'd somehow pulled it off, concealing my terror day after day, the deputy head had even praised me for my work. I'd been grateful beyond belief when the contract had come to an end. I think Mum was disappointed I didn't end up doing something more ambitious, I told Richie, remembering the to and fro of accusations concerning my decision to stay at home with the boys. You should go back to work, she'd said, not just once, but every time. The kids will be fine. I disagreed. Wasn't I proof that without their mother, kids were not fine? They lost their confidence, their faith in their own ambitions. But I knew that the cause of my own career failure was more complicated than that. It had not been Mum's absence that had contributed to it, or at least to the miserable college years that preceded it, but her presence. Well, I guess you just have to make your choice and stick to it, Richie said still keen to appease me. I nodded. She kept asking me why I wanted to follow in my grandmother's footsteps, like I was personally pushing the women's movement back fifty years. I could never convince her it was a kind of progress just to have the choice in the first place. She just laughed at that. Sounds as if Maggie's been a big influence on you, he said delicately. Bigger than I would have liked, I said. 
We looked at each other. Could I ever tell him the full story, I wondered. Wasn't this easiness between us dependent on my concealing it? It's hard finding something with the right hours, I said, finally. There didn't seem any point hiring someone to look after the kids, when I could hardly earn enough to pay them. But again, I knew it was a poor excuse. These last years, at least, Jamie and Noah had been old enough to let themselves into the house and look after themselves for the hour or so between the end of their day and that of normal office hours. I could have taken any job I wanted, if there was anyone out there still willing to offer me one. Richie tore at the edges of the last tea cake before discarding it on his plate. Hey, I know all about that, he said. I used to work for an insurance firm in Southampton. But after Lisa died, well, it didn't fit around Ren. I didn't even attempt it. I probably don't make half as much money now, but it's worth it. And you have Sarah to help you out? Yep. If money's tight, I pay her in decorating or some other job, so it all works out one way or another. I liked the idea of that, a simple exchange of trades. In London, I couldn't remember a time when lack of money wasn't top of the Stirling Avenue agenda, when whatever services we needed that week were priced just out of reach. She seems nice, I said. We met in the street yesterday. So she told me. He raised his eyebrows. You have to remember there's not much going on here, so you're a nice bit of gossip. I told her you were an old flame, but... I'm afraid she'd already got the idea that you must be a new one. I could feel my face getting warmer at this first direct reference to our personal history, and my pulse quickened. But now that the longed-for window stood open in front of me, I found I had not the nerve to step through it. Not yet. What's an old flame? Wren was at her father's elbow, panting. She laid the heads of several flowers on the table in front of him, like a cat bringing its owner a dead bird. It means an old friend. I told you, didn't I, that Olivia and I knew each other back when we were teenagers. I want to be a teenager. She sighed, as if this were beyond all hope, and then eased herself up onto her father's lap. What was your number one best age, Daddy? He knitted his fingers together across her tummy and lowered his chin to rest on her shoulder. Well, the age I was when you were born, kitten. He paused. But I did like being a teenager as well, I have to admit. I lived in California then. Do you know what we did after school then? Not cream teas, that's for sure. Surfing, she supplied, playing on the beach. That's right. Every day after school, we went to the beach. But he was in London one summer, I added. There was no surfing there. Only Big Ben and buses. Red, double-decker buses. As Wren frowned, Richie smiled at me in exactly the way he used to. Lips curling wickedly. Teeth white against his tan. Yes, I was. We had a good time back then, didn't we? I smiled back. I was glad Wren was here, to close conversations before they could be opened. Yes, I said. Sometimes I think it was my number one best age as well. Chapter 17 Moving in with Mum and Warren for the summer is not my first selfish decision. I'm a month away from turning 16, after all. But it's the first to involve a boy. I tell myself I would have accepted Mum's invitation even if Richie weren't here for the summer. But the guilt I feel at having chosen her over my father is no different from how it would be if she'd moved out and married someone local. If there'd been no year-long separation involved in the process. Or if Dad had been the one to cause the breakup and to ask us to choose between them. Guilt is unavoidable in these situations. In these situations. I hear that phrase a lot now, because no one really spells out what's happening in our family. No one defines it. The saving grace is a change in Dad's own private life. 
he's seeing a woman, someone from his office called Rowena. She's younger than him, divorced, and has no children of her own. No baggage, Richie says. Dean thinks Rowena is just a pawn and that Dad, madman that he is, is still hoping Mum will change her mind about Warren and come back. How else do we explain his friendliness towards the Briscoes? Mum, of course, declares herself relieved by the news. Well, that might help with the you-know-what, she says to Warren, winking. Winking? She never used to wink. Dean has overheard her. You mean the divorce settlement? No need to be coy, Mother. We all know you're out for what you can get. Mum just laughs it off. That's how she deals with the dark new Dean. She just pretends his criticisms are hilarious jokes. As if in her absence, he's grown the gift of stand-up comedy. Besides, she has other things to worry about right now. Mainly, she's about to start a new secretarial job. Transferring American funds is proving more complicated than Warren had hoped. And they have what they call a cash flow situation. Another situation. For me, though, the job is good news. Now I know she'll be out during office hours. I don't have to brace myself constantly for those backhanded compliments she sends my way. The little comments that by now everyone has noticed. The latest have been to do with my ambitions to become a fashion designer. During the summer break, I've been spending time on my sketching, putting together ideas for clothes and thinking I might try for art college later. You'll have to design yourself a thick skin for that, Dolly, she says in front of everybody. You're much too sensitive. The fashion business is a very cruel world. One minute you're flavour of the month, the next you dropped like a ton of bricks. She said that totally without irony. Did you notice? Dean asks me afterwards. She's got no idea. Like she was never the deserter herself. If I can... I avoid, Mum. It's just easier. I visit Richie in his basement, or Dean in his room at the top, or I drink Cokes with them in the kitchen when she isn't there. Richie uses the place in a way I would never consider, let alone dare. Helping himself to alcohol, taking risks about smoking joints. No sooner have the oldsters, as he calls them, closed the door behind them than he's lighting up one of his camel cigarettes. He has a stash of duty-free cartons, of which he says his father knows nothing, and pumping out his Californian rock. Every day, his hair grows longer, wilder, blonder. Did you know Richie's done it? Dean asks me one time when we're on our own up in his room at the window, watching the fox cubs in the garden next door. Done what? You know. Oh! I can feel myself blush. But for once, Dean doesn't pounce. Just cranes to get a better view of two cubs in the flower beds. Maybe he's a little embarrassed by this conversation himself. Who with? I ask. Oh, loads of girls. He's already in double digits. You mean here? How I wish I didn't sound so shocked. And so jealous. Could Dean hear that, too? He raises his eyebrows. No, moron, back home. Give him a chance, he's only been here a couple of weeks. I'm flushing deeper now. I need to deflect this somehow before my reaction becomes remarkable enough to be reported back to Richie himself. I move from the window seat and flop to the floor at Dean's feet. Have you? You know. He shakes his head. Nah, but I reckon I'm on my way. He's been seeing quite a bit of Amy Dukes, a girl in the upper sixth who is about to go off to university. She came over last week to party. Richie is the first person I've met to use party as a verb, and it's catching. Maybe I'm not so different from Mum and her affectations after all. Hey, a double date, she said, when she saw Richie and me on the bar stools in the kitchen, and I allowed myself a moment to bask in the idea. If only. I got the impression... Amy was more concerned with impressing Richie than Dean, though there was no mistaking who she snogged on the stairs for the later part of the evening. That was my brother, all right. I'd made Richie laugh about it the next day with my pretend gagging motions. 
What with Mum and Warren, Dad and his new baggage-free companion, Dean and Amy. It seems like there's an inevitability to Richie and me. A kind of camouflage to the growing attraction. I fantasise about him kissing me all the time. But it goes without saying that I don't have the nerve to act on it. How can I when, according to the fantasy, it is he who must kiss me? And since he can hardly be said to lack confidence himself, it's reasonable to assume that he doesn't have the same urges towards me. Those quick, wicked smiles, the looks that seem to see straight through my clothes to the skin beneath, they're just part of who he is, how he is with all girls. I tell myself that this is okay. The last thing I want is to jeopardise our friendship. That's a line I got from TV. But I am getting to know myself well enough by now to suspect that it's the fantasy itself that I most fear losing. The fantasy is what I wake up to every morning, and it's proving as impossible to shift as the previous one. That today will be the day that Mum comes back. Well, that came true, didn't it? Then, one dinner time in late July, Warren makes an announcement. We're all going on holiday together. A week at the seaside, maybe even a fortnight. Very good. Mum praises him for his use of native idiom, clapping her hands in front of his face like she's training a seal. I almost expect her to toss him a fish. I'll be celebrating my birthday while we're away. I'll be sixteen. And I know before we set off that this is going to be when my life will change. Chapter 18 I could still remember very clearly the moment when I knew I was redundant in our family. Perhaps redundant was too strong a word, because that certainly wasn't the case in my roles around the house. More demoted. In a way, it shouldn't have come as the shock that it did, because I'd been used to Jamie preferring his father to me right from the get-go. From the moment he could move his own body, he would propel himself away from me and strain for Russell. It was out of the question that he would agree to go to sleep before Russell had come home from work. He was like a trained animal, responding to the trigger sounds of his master's arrival. The faint percussion of house keys being chased around a trouser pocket. The brush of footsteps on the doormat. The drop of briefcase to stone. Instantly, he would fret to get to the front door before it opened, tipping himself out of my arms and straight into his father's, even before Russell had managed to get himself fully into the hallway. Hello, little limpet. How are you this evening? He'd coo. His reward, a radiant beam of happiness. Jamie would hardly look my way again for the rest of the night. Noah was different. He did need me, at least at first, at least until he was sufficiently mobile to follow his brother about the place. And even then, he would still come to me for comfort when he'd hurt himself or felt unwell. I treasured our closeness, could at last share a little of what Dean's wife Beth enjoyed with Isabel. I can't even go to the loo without her sitting on my lap. And I'd feel a twist deep inside me, like a flesh memory at the idea that this was all simply a matter of gender, of fate. The shift occurred when Noah was about three. There was an episode in the garden, a Saturday in summer, when we'd filled the paddling pool and set all the toys out on our little square of lawn. The boys had been occupied for a while, and then Jamie had had enough and come for a drink at the table, where I was setting out cutlery and plates for lunch. Noah stayed on the grass, moving from the water to the mini cricket stumps. He picked up the bat and smacked it against the wall. He liked the cracking sound it made and repeated the action, laughing to himself. Then he misjudged and the bat came down on his foot. The yelling that followed must have been audible from orbit, his face dominated by that open mouth anguish pouring from him as if through a wind tunnel. I opened my arms to shovel him up, but he pushed roughly past me to climb into his brother's lap. I rushed to check the foot, but he kicked it into my face, startling me so with his strength. 
that I cried out in anger. Noah, stop it! Russell emerged from indoors, composed and unknowing. What's going on here? He too bent to inspect the damaged foot. And this time Noah permitted the handling. Hey, no broken bones, I think. I fetched the first aid box from inside and brought out a bandage. Jamie, do it! Jamie, do it! Noah insisted. So Russell held the foot still while Jamie wound the fabric, Russell intervening now and then with gentle adjustments. Noah stopped wailing and Russell wiped away the last of his tears with his thumbs. Jamie secured the safety pin and Russell passed Noah a drink. I just stood a distance away, watching. Three male heads, all the same, bowed together in common purpose. It was a picture that needed no completing. Hi, guys. I'm staying a little longer. Hope okay. I love you. Mum. Kiss, kiss, kiss. It stood to reason that if you could get a signal to send a text message from the magical spot in the Croft Centre car park, then you could also get a signal to make a phone call. But nonetheless, it was another text I chose to send to Russell, Jamie and Noah, as my first week in Millington drew to a close. I didn't feel worried about what was happening at home. For one thing, Russell had assured me he was coping well without me. For another, time had lost its normal insistence. And I, without my lists and calendars and the heartbeat of the kitchen clock, my usual means of measuring it. It felt far too early to be missing the boys, and I could say quite without self-pity that such feelings, when they did come, would reach me before they did them. If they missed my presence at all, then it would be in relation to some errant item of sports kit, a school form that needed returning, a mug of tea Russell failed to deliver to their bedroom desks as they consumed their homework. Here, decision-making was simple. In the morning... Valerie or Martha would ask me, Will you be staying with us again tonight? And I'd nod, yes. I thought I would be, if the room was still free. It was, and that was the decision made for another day. There was another factor as well, something equally unrecognisable to the Olivia of old. A mechanism was taking place inside my head that my thought processes could neither identify nor override. The moment I thought about Russell and the boys with even a hint of anxiety, the impulse was replaced with the warm, true certainty that they were well, better than well, better than ever. They simply continued with life exactly as they would if I were there, which only proved that I was not needed to facilitate it in the first place. I remembered Beth describing to me once how it felt to take a new kind of antidepressant medication she had discussed in her training. It just removes the worrying, the negative thinking, the edges of everything. I couldn't remember whether or not she'd approved of such an effect, but I thought I had an idea now of how it might feel. She'd told me I had a habit of catastrophizing, seeing disaster ahead where there was none. But here, I saw only what there really was in front of me. Green grass, a sunny sky, Richie and Wren. I began to see them every day. Sometimes they dropped by in the morning before school when I was having breakfast, and Martha and the other girls would direct them automatically to my table, as if everyone knew they belonged with me. I liked how that felt. Over the course of my stay, several sets of guests had already been and gone, and I was getting used to the new ones eyeing me differently acknowledging me as someone with a native connection, a longer-term position. I liked how that felt, too. Perhaps that was why I reacted the way I did when I saw an advertisement in the newsagent's window for a summer lodger. It had been placed by a local couple whose daughter was off travelling for the summer before starting college in the autumn, and the weekly rent they wanted was the same as a single night at Valerie's. I told myself that even if I stayed in Millington just another couple of days, it would be a saving. The house was at the top of the village, north of Rope Street, near the road towards Weymouth, but still an easy stroll from the High Street and Angel's Lane. On the way, 
I passed a front lawn full of children's bikes and cars and climbing frames, and realised it might very well be Sarah's. This was where Wren played with Chaz after school, while waiting for Richie to come home from work. As if that weren't confirmation enough of how small this place was, I recognised the landlady, Tessa, as soon as she opened the door. She worked in one of the gift shops near the church. I saw your card about the spare room, I began. Oh, come on in! She had the soft-eyed, forgiving face of contented late middle age. Her hair tinted a majestic metallic gold, and her daddy long legs eyelashes reaching almost to her eyebrows when she smiled. This she did now, ushering me into the kitchen and insisting on giving me tea, regardless of whether I took the room or not. We sat at the kitchen table, a polished pine oval with flowers at its centre, that I knew at once had been cut fresh from the garden. This could be seen in all its splendour through closed French doors, a stone path leading past a pair of lovely willows to a rear section set with table and chairs. I imagined sinking into the shade there, as hidden from the world as it was possible to be. I've seen you about the place, haven't I? Tessa asked, stirring sugar into her tea with a comforting sense of ceremony. Yes, I've been staying at Valerie's until now, but I decided I wanted something more homely. In fact, I hadn't decided anything of the sort, but had simply seen the advertisement, packed my bag, checked out of Valerie's, and turned up on Tessa's doorstep with little thought to the consequences. Were the room to turn out already to have been taken, I had no idea what my next move would be. Return to Valerie's? Return to London? It felt as if it were nothing to do with me, but left for the gods to choose. Finally, I thought to ask, The room is still available, isn't it? Yes, yes it is. It's been a relief in a way that no one's wanted it. She didn't explain this remark and I didn't ask her to. Instead, I took the shortbread biscuit she offered, of a kind I hadn't seen since my childhood, a favourite of Dad's, and I bit into it exploring the sensation of the gritty sugar on my tongue, rather than enjoying its sweetness. How long are you looking to stay? she asked. I'm not exactly sure. Would it be possible to take it one week at a time? She nodded. All right, but if someone comes along who wants the whole of August, then I hope you'll understand that I'll have to reconsider. Of course, no problem. You can throw me out whenever you need to. Right then. She looked at me curiously. Perhaps it had been an odd thing to say. Well-spoken, educated-sounding women like me usually outlined their own expectations rather than waiting to be evicted at someone else's whim. They probably checked the room itself, too, rather than sitting ready to claim it, no matter what its size and condition. Why don't we go and see if you like the room first? She took me upstairs pausing to point out the family bathroom on the first floor that I would share with her, as well as her husband Peter at weekends. He stayed weeknights in London, she said. Then she indicated the short, steep final flight to the top and followed me up. After the single at Valerie's, it was a vast space to have to myself, the entirety of a converted loft, and the arrangement of narrow pieces of furniture around its edges only increased the sense of spaciousness. There was a single bed, a wardrobe, crammed full of a young woman's winter clothes, but that hardly mattered when I had so little of my own to hang up. A dressing table, a beanbag, a bookcase. And in the middle, a collection of small patterned rugs in a higgledy-piggledy patchwork. Instinctively, I looked about for clues of its permanent occupant. On the wall by the wardrobe hung a framed montage of photographs, all featuring a teenager with long fair hair and Tessa's spidery eyelashes, and most involving the same group of friends grinning up at the camera in an inseparable cluster. They looked young and joyful, all of life ahead of them. My daughter Amanda, Tessa supplied, her voice a little wistful. You'll notice said she's off travelling. Yes, she left a couple of weeks ago. There was a pause. Now I guessed the reason for her earlier comment. While she was proud of her daughter's independence, 
she was struggling with the reality of an empty nest. Renting Amanda's room felt like the beginning of the end. Do you have children, Olivia? I nodded. Yes, two, two boys. How old are they? I felt myself hesitate. It would be so much easier to bend the truth, just as I had with staff at Valerie's when they'd casually asked about family. Keeping my eyes on the photograph to avoid meeting her gaze, I replied, a little older than Amanda. They've left home now. Goodness, you don't look old enough, she exclaimed. I pretended to be flattered. Well, thank you, that's kind of you. I shall have to pick your brains about coping with all of this, she gestured to the empty room. It's harder than I thought. All I can think of is the disasters that might happen. I keep reading things in the paper, you know. All these terrible tragedies. At this, I quite forgot my own frenzies of the past. My visions of fatal falls or abductions whenever the boys went off on field trips. Instead, the peculiar new mechanism in my brain got to work. And I imagined Amanda and her friends in sarongs and sandals, arms linked as they headed to the beach. I'm sure she's fine, I said. Don't think about it. When it became clear that I had no further wisdom to offer, we returned to the business of the room and agreed I would take it until either of us had reason to give the other notice. I handed over the last of my remaining cash. Where's the rest of your luggage? she asked, noting my small hold all on the landing outside. Is it still at Val's? No, this is it. I knew what she was thinking. I had so little I couldn't possibly intend staying for more than a night or two. I don't need much, I said, especially in this weather. Clearly the type to give the benefit of the doubt, she nodded. Then I leave you to settle in. There's a key for you downstairs, and when you're ready, I can show you how everything works in the kitchen and living room. Lovely. Thank you. After her footsteps had faded, I sat on the bed and cast an eye around my new quarters. Don't think about it, I repeated to myself. Tessa's house was on the most elevated street in the village, my room at the top of the house its highest point. And so it shouldn't have come as the surprise that it did when my mobile phone, silent throughout its tenancy at Valerie's, began buzzing urgently in my bag. I checked for a dialing tone. For the first time it was strong and clear. It continued to vibrate in my hand, delivering text message after text message, until I began to lose count. I picked up the voicemail first. There were several messages from my brother and one or two from my friend Jill, his seeking me urgently, obviously still fretting about Mum's will, she inquiring about our missed walk, content to assume I'd been unexpectedly busy and would return her call when I got the chance. Neither mentioned my sudden departure. They clearly knew, or thought, nothing much of it. Two further messages from Lindy resolved themselves, the first asking me to call to clear up a discrepancy to do with Mum's house deeds, and the second reporting that she'd got the information from Dean and didn't need me to phone back after all. The rest of the messages were from Russell. Though his voice sounded perfectly reasonable, I was taken aback by the number of calls, as well by the way he ended each message, quoting the exact time and date, as if passing on vital coordinates to a traveller lost at sea. I took a deep breath, swept my eye once more around the protective angles of my new home. Then I dialed the number of my old one. Chapter 19 Oh, are you getting my messages? When are you back? Ah, kiss. P.S. Call your brother. Russell was working from home today. Duncan had not been overjoyed by the request, nor, strictly speaking, had he granted it, since Russell would be missing a big HR announcement, as well as causing his day's appointments to be rescheduled. But Noah was off school with a temperature. Nothing so serious as to keep him from his PlayStation, it transpired 
and Russell had had no choice. Jamie had announced the news at breakfast. His temperature's 39.5. I've checked on the thermometer. That means it's technically a fever, and he was coughing all night. I heard him. Russell struggled to hide his exasperation. Why didn't you come and get me? You were asleep. I heard you snoring. And then you were in the shower. Yes, but if he's ill... Sometimes with Jamie, it felt like you were dealing with a traffic warden. It was all by the book and lacking the milk of human kindness. Do I need to take him to the doctor to get a note or phone the school or anything? You need to ring the office, that's all. You don't need a note for just one day. Fine. Are you okay getting in on your own? Uh, yeah, Dad, Jamie mocked. I've only been doing it every day for... He broke off, brow creased apparently prepared to calculate the precise number of school days in the last however many years. One boy in his class at Herrings could do this sort of thing instantly. He was a human adding machine. Of course you have, Russell said, moving away. I'm being stupid. You get off. Noah will be right as rain after a day in bed. I'll make him a hot drink. No sooner had Jamie left than Aniello was on the premises. Thursday again? already, clattering about, cracking the hoover against the skirting boards upstairs. There was a loud, Oh! as she discovered Noah in his bedroom, followed by the unceremonious shove of his door closing. Then she popped her head down the basement stairs and called, There is problem, okay? You can say that again, Russell thought. I'm at home when I should be at work. What is it? he asked. And Yella angled a language dictionary under his nose and pointed to the word butterfly. There's a butterfly in the house. I don't understand. Just open a window and let it out. No, not on window, on ground. He had no choice but to follow her up to Jamie's bedroom, where she had discovered a bald patch on the carpet under the bed. Oh, moths, yes. We know. Olivia had some dastardly potion to get rid of them. Or not, as the case may be, but Russell couldn't remember what it was called or where it was kept. Now he came to think of it, nor had he shopped for those cleaning products Aniella had requested, though she'd at least not mentioned them this time. Presumably she had gathered for herself that things had fallen seriously apart round here in the last week. Leave it with me, he said, and left her frowning over the consumed wool as he stumbled back downstairs. Moths. They were the least of his worries. On his way, he called out, All right, Noah, getting only a grunt in reply. But that was okay. Grunts were just about all he could cope with today. He reminded himself that Noah would need some refreshments at some point during the morning. What did ill children eat? What did Olivia give ill children to eat? Back at the computer, he rattled the mouse and felt a surge of forbidden self-pity. It was impossible to concentrate, not with the calendar right there on the wall in front of him. End of term, written in Olivia's no-nonsense capitals across Friday, 24 hours from now, for God's sake. Written diagonally across the whole of the following week was school holidays, and, as if that wasn't clear enough, boys off. The days were ominously light on entries, the activities booked enough to fill only a fraction of the hours. Would it be all right to leave them on their own when he was in the office? Because there was no way he could take a second day off so soon after this one, let alone the whole of next week. He couldn't allow himself to imagine how many more weeks might come after that. Somewhere in his mind, he remembered someone saying the holidays lasted eight weeks. But could that really be true? He returned to the original question. Was it acceptable to leave the kids alone while he went to work? Was it legal? Jamie was fourteen, that had to be okay. And Russell was sure he himself had been left alone by his parents at twelve, Noah's age. But things were different now. The social services swooped if you so much as nipped out for a pint of milk, without arranging for a state-registered nanny to guard the premises from paedophiles. He imagined himself in the local paper. Single father leaves child geniuses home alone. Brain boxes taken into care. Abandoning work, 
he brought up Google and found a child welfare site. The law does not set a minimum age at which children can be left alone. However, it is an offence to leave a child alone when doing so puts him or her at risk. Great, he thought. Yet another thing in life that you only knew you'd done wrong after you'd done it. There are many important things to consider when deciding if you can safely leave a child alone, including the age of the child, the child's level of maturity and understanding. Well, that sounded okay. No child or adult, for that matter, could be as mature as Jamie. He could probably quote these guidelines himself. The place where the child will be left. How long the child will be left alone. And how often. Whether or not there are any other children alone with the child. Again, all straightforward enough. The two of them would be together at home or out on their bikes, perhaps. They were of the age where they came and went as they pleased. What difference would it make if there was someone at home in their absence, sitting about, just in case? Just in case. That was rather the point, wasn't it? He would be out of the house from 8am to 7pm, at least, which was 11 hours. What would they eat? Far from being gifted in the kitchen, they'd never, to his knowledge, prepared anything but toast. And even then, Olivia complained about finding sticky trails of marmite everywhere. And as for Jamie looking after Noah, he was mature, yes, preternaturally so. But it wasn't as if he was first aid trained. Would he be so keen to play doctor if he had his head in one of those impenetrable tomes of his? Russell thought about his sister-in-law, Beth, just a twenty-minute walk away. Her psychotherapy training was not a full-time commitment, and she prided herself on being there for her daughters. Perhaps she'd be free next week and could be there for her nephews, too. He'd hoped to avoid involving his in-laws in the issue of Olivia's unplanned leave, but there had to be a limit to how long he could remain secretly abandoned. Where were the guidelines for that, eh? How do you decide if you can safely leave a husband alone? Behind him on the kitchen table, the landline began to ring, and he turned with balletic precision to pick it up. Seeing Olivia's name on the caller ID, finally, he hit the connect key and had his lips to the mouthpiece in an instant. Olivia, thank God I was beginning to get worried. Her voice replied quietly in his ear. Russell, I'm sorry. It's been impossible to get a signal. No worries. What's the story? Are you on the train? No. No, I'm not. Why? His mouth was suddenly dry. Why? Uh, I was kind of hoping you might be coming back to London soon. The boys are about to break up for the school holidays. They keep asking when you're coming back. In fact, Noah had asked only twice, and had presumably relayed the answers to Jamie, which explained why he had not asked. Oh, what have you told them? Her voice was oddly toneless. I just told them you need some time to yourself after Grandma's death which is completely understandable, of course, but it's been almost two weeks, and I think you need to get back. Two weeks? Seriously? She sounded so sincerely amazed that Russell was momentarily silenced. He didn't know whether to be infuriated or alarmed by her reaction. After all, it was hardly as if she'd been abducted by aliens. She surely knew how long she'd been away. Well, OK, twelve days, but still... What's going on? Are you all right? Has something happened? No, of course not. I'm fine. Then why haven't you phoned? I know about the signal, you said that. But there must have been a landline you could use somewhere. Yes, she murmured. You're right. But to be honest, it's been nice not jumping up for the phone every two minutes. I'd forgotten what peace feels like. That made Russell wonder why she'd called him here and not at his office or on his mobile. She couldn't possibly have known he'd be working from home. She must have wanted to leave him a message without having to get into a conversation about it, to check in and out as quickly as possible. He began to feel a creeping sensation on his skin, and it took him the length of an awkward pause to recognise it as the insect legs of fear. 
You sound a bit weird, Olivia. Are you sure you haven't hurt yourself or something? No. No, of course not. The thing is, I need to be by myself at the moment, Russ. To take it one day at a time. Please understand. I need you to understand. Russell swallowed. One day at a time. How many one days at a time? She made it sound like she was recovering from some kind of drug dependency. I do understand, he lied. But isn't twelve days enough? I don't think it is, no. I need longer. Please understand, she repeated. There was a silence. Russell sucked in a mouthful of air. But what do you mean, longer? How much longer? Look, I know you've had a tough time these last few months. Everything that's happened with Maggie, it hasn't been easy. And now she's playing silly buggers over the will. I don't care about the will, Olivia interjected, with more fire in her voice. Forget the will, then. But you have to realise that you told us you were going away for one night. If you'd said in the first place it was going to be longer, we could have made arrangements. We're in chaos here. I thought you said you were coping. For the first time, she actually sounded concerned, and Russell was tempted to exaggerate for simple expediency. If she thought the boys were suffering, then surely she'd get herself straight onto the next train. But no, that would be wrong. He didn't want to do the wrong thing. I am. We are. Maybe chaos isn't the right word. But it's not ideal, Olivia. Apart from the boys, your brother's on the phone every five minutes. Can't you at least call him back? I prefer not to talk to Dean at the moment. Russell sighed in exasperation. OK, well, why don't I just let him know you're incommunicado at the moment? He was being sarcastic, but she answered him quite seriously. Thank you. That would be great. And anyone else who phones for me as well. Anyone else? What about us? I really am sorry, she added. I honestly didn't realise how much time I was going to need. I still don't. Russell's glance fell on the computer screen, the web page he'd been consulting, and the problem of the school holidays reared its head once more. The thing is, I'm not sure you have the luxury of taking too much longer. We need you here. I know. At last, Russell sensed capitulation, was already anticipating the guilt he would feel for his having applied pressure like this. But Olivia's next words surprised him greatly. But don't you see? For once, I have to think about what I need, not other people. He was completely speechless. But you're right, she said, sounding surer. I haven't been thinking. I'll call the boys next. Now I've got a signal, I'll phone them and explain what's going on. They must be getting worried. They're not worried, Russell said slowly still digesting those last remarks. As you say, there's nothing to be worried about. He thought of Noah upstairs, imagined calling him down to speak to his mother, and her repeating the kind of proclamations he would never have heard from her in his life. What I need, not other people. No, he needed to keep a lid on this, this whatever it was. They're at school, he added smoothly, They'll have their phones switched off. Maybe it's best if I just pass on your love. Let them know when you're coming back and leave it at that. OK, if you think so. So can I do that? He urged, unable to give up. Can I tell them when you're coming? When she failed to give an answer, frustration flared once more. I see. Well, it's not very fair, is it? He sounded like a kid himself now. This was the strangest conversation he had ever had with his wife, with anyone. He wasn't sure he was completely convinced it was Olivia on the phone at all. Already he wished he'd censored himself better. They'd parted that last Saturday morning perfectly reasonably. He seemed to remember a kiss on the front steps. But now it felt as if he were on the back foot, making up for conflict. Was he making something out of nothing? What was twelve days, two weeks, even three weeks, in the grand scheme of a marriage? There were wives who went off for months with friends, weren't there? Yes, Duncan's wife, for instance. 
She had cycled the Great Wall of China for charity. She'd been away for weeks for that. But Russell knew from the fuss Duncan had made about it that there'd been websites and blogs and pre-planned daily calls from the office. Communications between China and the UK had been better during those weeks than at any time during the past hundred years. This was definitely not the same. Listen, I'll phone again soon, Olivia said. Please don't worry about me. Soon. OK. And even before disconnecting, he was already surrendering to the realisation that for now, for the foreseeable future, he was on his own. Upstairs, the hoover had roared back to life, and he waited for the noise to end, as though he couldn't think straight with it grinding above his head. On the desk, his mobile phone beeped, alerting him to a call he had missed while speaking to Olivia. It was Dean, reminding him that the four of them were due to meet for dinner that evening. Russell recalled agreeing to put it in his diary sometime last week, not imagining for a moment that Olivia would not have returned by then. Don't call me back, the message finished, with Dean's customary curtness. I'm in meetings for most of the day. We'll just see you there at eight. Anyone would think he was Chancellor of the bloody exchequer the way he went on. Russell dialed the lane's home number, but immediately Beth's voice encouraged him to leave his message after the tone. He huffed in frustrated defeat before hanging up. There was no way he could summarise this situation in the required few upbeat seconds. He was going to have to meet them tonight after all. He sat back down at the computer. After a while, he tore a sheet of paper from his notepad and wrote out a message, careful to keep the letters separate and clear. When Aniela next came into view, he held it out for her. Can you cook? Yes, she said, reading it. I cook. Russell took the pad again and wrote out a new line. Can you come every day next week? Keep an eye on the boys and make them lunch. Same money. Her eyes narrowed as she deciphered its meaning, then widened again as she studied his face. Clearly, he looked as desperate as he felt, because she came quickly to her conclusion. OK, I cancel. At what time? Russell didn't allow himself to think about the other families whose houses would go uncleaned over the course of the following week. This was survival of the most wretched. Nine o'clock on Monday morning, he said hopefully. OK. OK, that's fantastic. Thank you. He wrote it on the pad and held it up. Thank you. OK. Russell had to force himself to stop repeating OK after her. He thought she might keep the chain going until they both went mad. The thing about Dean and Beth Lane was that they were always so very pleased with themselves. Not so much as individuals, to be fair, but as a pair. They admired each other, they respected each other, and worst of all, they agreed with each other. We speak as one, Dean said once, grinning. But he was the only person present who imagined he was joking. Russell had never seen them bicker, not even after they'd had children, a stage at which most other couples had broken down, each burdened with the knowledge that they would never recover what once they'd had. Or maybe he was just feeling a bit down on happy couples this evening. Either way, there was no denying it. Dean and Beth got his competitive juices flowing. And he was not, generally, as Duncan had pointed out to him more than once, nearly competitive enough. Just the sight of them approaching, so strong and team-like, almost three-legged in the matching rhythms of their stride, like something from a wartime propaganda poster. It automatically got him searching his mind for news of any latest triumphs passed on to him by Olivia. To do with the boys, of course. For neither he nor she contributed any glory to the family tally these days. This was not something he would have dreamed of doing with anyone else. Today, though, attracted by Beth's waving from the corner table in the pub and seeing the seating configuration that meant he must face the two of them as though an interview panel, he felt no prospect of one-upmanship, only instant defeat. 
For a family so satisfied with its own completeness, the lanes were oddly attuned to others' vulnerabilities. He wouldn't go so far as to say that one fed the other. They'd feel sorry for him for his temporary wifelessness, and worse, they'd feel sorry for the boys. All right, Russ, Dean said. No, Olivia, Beth said a beat later. She was a petite woman with bluntly cut dark hair, kittenish features and a pretty smile. Olivia and he had once debated whether the sweet exterior might house a sour soul, but no definitive conclusion had been reached. The truth was, they had made her more interesting than she actually was. Uh, no, he said, just me. She's with the boys, Beth said. It wasn't a question, though the next was. You couldn't get a babysitter? She knew it was odd, though. Dean was Olivia's brother, not his. And if anyone should stay at home for a cancelled babysitter, it was Russell. No, I left them on their own, actually. There was a pause as Beth sipped her wine and considered. We haven't left the girls by themselves yet, but I suppose Jamie is older. Exactly. He's more than capable, and Noah's in bed with a cold anyway. If there's a fire, they'll have more idea what to do about it than I would. She looked doubtful. The main thing is, they know to get straight out. No hanging around looking for favourite possessions or putting coats on. One of her habits was to seize on joking asides and address them with terrific earnestness. The implication, when it involved the safety of your children, and if you were in the mood to take offence, was that she took your parenting responsibilities more seriously than you did. You've got smoke alarms, right? Russell had not, at least not any that were operative. But his sister-in-law's expression was sufficiently cautionary for him to nod the lie. Yep, they're all sorted. Don't worry. Where is Olivia, then? Dean demanded. I've left her a hundred messages about this collusion between Lindy and Adrian Bellamy. Adrian Bellamy? Maggie's solicitor. He shot Russell an impatient look. Clearly this Bellamy was a household name, Shea Lane, and would undoubtedly have been Shea Chapman, had Madame not vanished and made every name but hers impossible to care about. Anyway, she still hasn't got back to me. I mean, we should have everything on the table by now, don't you think? But there's no point campaigning to bring the date forward if I'm the only one who wants it. Oh, she wants it, Russell said quickly. Don't worry about that. I spoke to her earlier and told her you've been trying to get hold of her. Saved by the arrival of the waitress, he ordered a pint, even though Dean and Beth were sharing a bottle of wine and already had a glass ready for him. Plus one for Olivia. He felt petulant, reading their thoughtfulness as a bid to control him. Looking away, he saw a couple of blokes light up cigarettes on the street outside, breaking apart to laugh at something they'd spotted on the other side of the road. How he yearned to sweep all his responsibilities to the floor and dash out to join them. What do you mean you spoke to her? Beth asked, sliding a sideways look at her husband. Is she away somewhere then? Yes. She's spending a bit of time on her own. Where? Dean asked at the same time as Beth said. How long for? And they acknowledged the clash with an exchange of small smiles. It seemed to Russell that Beth had posed the more crucial question, which was probably why it was Dean's he chose to answer first. She's down on the south coast. Dorset. Dorset. Dean spoke as though he'd said Jupiter. She doesn't know anyone down there, does she? Like I said, she's having some time to herself. Russell's drink arrived, and he took a series of thirsty swallows. She's taken Maggie's death far worse than I expected. I said that! Dean turned triumphantly to his wife. Didn't I? She was so weird at the funeral. Well... I suppose you could say it's weird not to be weird at your mother's funeral, Russell said defensively. He worried he might have gone too far, but saw at once he needn't have. Dean was, and always had been, unequivocal in his attitude to Maggie. She was a bad mother, that was his verdict, and even death could not redeem her. 
Sometimes it seemed to Russell that, without her brother, Olivia might have stood a much better chance at burying the hatchet. So when did she take off? Beth asked. Russell braced himself. The weekend after the funeral. She just meant to be away a night or two, but she feels she needs longer, you know, to recuperate, recharge. It's been a hell of a year. You mean... Beth's eyebrows drew together in disbelief as she did the maths. Ten, no, twelve days ago. That's a long time to be away from the kids, isn't it? She's never spent that long away from them before. I know. But it's not like they're toddlers anymore. It's no big deal. Well, when's she coming back? I don't know, Beth. If I did, I'd tell you. There was a silence. Fuck. Dean exhaled. You don't mean she's left you? Russell sighed. He knew this would happen. He knew they would make the very drama out of this that he was trying so hard to suppress in himself. Thank God the boys weren't here to listen to this scaremongering. She'd never leave the children, Beth said at once to Dean. She hasn't left anyone, Russell said firmly. She texts me every day and we had a long talk this morning. She will be back imminently. It was humiliating even to have to spell this out. The Dorset Coast, Beth said, getting the message. It's supposed to be nice. Why don't you go and join her? Take the boys for the weekend. I would do that, yes, but I haven't got the faintest idea where she is. The point is, she wants to be on her own, he snapped. So us joining her would just defeat the object. At the sight of Beth's hurt face, he checked himself. They were a pain in the backside, Dean and Beth, but they were family, and if it were to come to it, God forbid, then they would want to help him. He was sure of it. Sorry, he said. You've caught me at a bad time. I'm a bit up to my eyes domestically, you know. He was saved from further apology by the return of the waitress. Notepad poised, she spoke in an absurdly carefree voice. Have you decided what you're eating over here? Are we eating? Dean asked Beth. I ate with the boys, Russell said vaguely. There was no way he was spending fifteen quid on bangers and mash. Not when he was about to get hit with a two-week hotel bill. Beth scanned the board. I had something earlier with the girls, but I'll have a starter. Pate, maybe. This had been discussed, he knew. There was no way they wouldn't have agreed the logistics of feeding in advance. And since they ate here every other week, they knew the menu by heart. They were buying time, which meant his news of Olivia's absence must genuinely have unsettled them. When had he last managed that? But there was no pleasure in the achievement, only the awareness of a nodule of fear in his throat, which stayed there no matter how much lager he washed over it. He caught the waitress's eye and motioned to his glass. Can I get another one of these, please? and prepared to broach the subject that was the most pressing, the one Dean and Beth might actually be able to help him with. The thing is, Jamie and Noah break up from school tomorrow, and I've no idea what I'm going to do if Olivia isn't back for Monday. I can't take time off work, especially since I've already booked two weeks off in August for the Portugal holiday. Would she be back for that? Surely she'd be back for that. What about getting your mother down to help? Beth suggested. She's away herself. Russell prayed that this might all be resolved before his own parents got wind of it. Olivia was not the only one with a less than perfect mother. His was a panicker of the first order, the kind who created a bay of pigs out of a blown light bulb. Dad's away as well, Dean noted. He took the girls' last summer holidays when we were stuck. Russell couldn't recall what kind of stuck this had been, but he had a feeling that there was a dig in there somewhere. Had he and Olivia not helped out appropriately? I'd step in myself, Beth said on cue, but I'm on a course all next week. The girls don't break up until the Friday after yours. At this, Dean stirred once more. If he so much as looked as if he was going to mention the shorter Herring's terms, Russell decided he would tip his drink over his head. Ever since Jamie had begun at the school, Dean had waged his own campaign for a proper ordinary childhood, complete with warts and all local schools, 
like the one he sent his daughters to. He even went so far as to refer to Jamie and Noah, affectionately, of course, as freaks. Damn this ridiculous competitiveness between them, Russell thought. He felt like crying out, Look, you win, you're a happier family. Just cut me a bit of slack, will you? And then we're straight off to Spain, Beth finished. How long are you away for? Two weeks. I guess it's just that time of year, Russ. Everyone's away. Her words seemed to sit in the air between them. You'll need to get someone in, Dean told him. Pay a housekeeper or something. Yes, I'm on the case. Russell thought of Aniela and her butterflies. He wondered what sort of meals she would produce next week. That was if she didn't change her mind and cancel on him. Well, if she did, he would just have to find a way to cope. Olivia was not the only stay-at-home mum in the area. He could ask the boys' friends' mothers for advice. They'd surely heard there'd been a death in the family. Perhaps someone might offer to help out. The next moment, a huge platter of beef and dumplings was being placed in front of Dean, causing him to smack his lips, while a daintier portion of pâté arrived for Beth. That was quick, they agreed, but better than waiting half the night for something you could have made yourself in five minutes. Russell applied himself to his second pint. I'll sort something out. It'll only be for another few days anyway. Of course it will, Beth agreed, her soothing tone reinforced by the rhythm of her knife as it spread pink pâté on the griddled bread. Olivia's a wonderful mother. She won't want to be without her boys for much longer. Besides, she knows the school holidays are the whole point of her not working. Russell wasn't sure if Beth meant anything more by this last remark than she would appear to be saying. She, like many others, struggled with Olivia's decision not to work full-time or even part-time. Lord knew he struggled with that himself. But raising the toast to her lips, Beth added that if Russell was really stuck, he should phone her and she would see what she could juggle to help him out. Thanks, Beth, he said gratefully. Returning to the house, and finding the boys virtually unaware of his absence, much less smoked out by catastrophic fires, he decided that it had been the right thing to do, to meet Dean and Beth and get their take on the situation. Okay, they hadn't come up with any magic solutions, but at least it was out there now. It had been beginning to feel like his secret. He was sure Beth would agree that sharing was the first step. The first step of what, he wasn't entirely clear. Chapter 20 Ah, uh, yes. Still alive. Will phone soon. Love to J and N. O. Oh, kiss. Richie's job in Bridport was taking up more of his time than he'd expected. Not an hour went by, he said, without some new complication being revealed that put further strain on his relationship with the builders. It didn't help that the client had arrived to live on site for the week, which meant an extra whip to crack. Often, he wouldn't get back to Millington until late, hardly in time for Wren's bedtime, and Sarah would give Wren tea with Chaz, then bath her and have her waiting in her pyjamas for Richie to collect her. Sometimes, I took her from one house to the other myself. She'd ask for a piggyback ride, even though it was only a short walk, and she felt light featherweight, the backs of her thighs slight in my hands. Taking advantage of the raised position, she'd talk directly into my ear, asking me about London, where she'd been taken once for a visit to the Natural History Museum. This she called the Actual History Museum, which made me smile. Other times, I'd arrive at Angel's Lane after she'd gone to bed, so as not to encroach on their time together, often bringing with me groceries for dinner. This was not an arrangement we planned in advance. I simply turned up, in the hope that it was all right. And when I did, Richie gave the impression that it was. The magical weather held, and we would sit on the deck with a glass of wine, just as we had that first night. What's it like here in winter? I asked. It was hard to imagine drab greys and browns, in place of the crystalline greens and blues of July. Kind of special, actually, Richie said. We don't get much snow or frost, but we get mists on the hills. 
Bren likes that. She thinks it hides us from the outside world. Makes us a secret kingdom, like in a Disney movie. Maybe it does, I thought. She has a lovely imagination, I told him. I guess it's hard for me to know, with it just being her. I assume they're all like this. His eyes seemed to turn liquid when he spoke about his daughter. I smiled. She's different. She's got a special something. In a way, Wren had become our common interest, our talking point. There'd been an unspoken agreement between us since that conversation on the first Sunday. The one I'd come to think of as the plane crash conversation. That we would not discuss the increasing length of my stay. Even in light of my move from Valerie's to Tessa's. And if the future was out of bounds, then we talked little of the past, either. Just safe reminiscences about Maggie and Warren and Dean. Never anything of our own early intimate relationship. What it had meant and how it had ended. The longer we left the subject, the less likely it seemed it would ever be broached. Are you all set for the holidays? I asked. Wren was about to break up from school, and so there were arrangements to be made with Sarah, as well as a holiday for her with her grandmother, Lisa's mother Jane. This was an annual treat, Richie said. Lisa's brother and his family lived in France and every summer Jane took Wren there for two weeks or so to spend time with her three cousins. While she was away, Richie would take on extra work and stockpile funds for leaner times. He and Wren might sometimes go away together in the winter, but not always. When you lived somewhere like Millington, you didn't need to escape. You already had what everyone else was driving for hours to find. Just about. It's the usual countdown craziness. He hesitated. What about you? I shrugged. According to the unspoken rules, he could not ask me directly if I had decided to return home for my own family holiday to Portugal. I had booked the trip myself, months ago. Spent hours searching online, looking at hotel rooms far beyond our pocket, imagining a life without budgets. I could hardly connect myself to that person now. She was my reflection in a distorted mirror. Her face pulled long, her voice dispirited. She was never happy. But I couldn't tell Richie that. Nor did I tell him about an odd episode that had occurred the morning after my phone conversation with Russell, my first as Tessa's lodger. As I joined my new landlady in the kitchen for a cup of coffee, she'd patted my hand and asked, "'Is everything all right, Olivia?' Please feel you can get it off your chest if you need to. I'm fine, I said, taken aback by such fellow feeling at the breakfast table. It's just that in the night you sounded a bit upset. I don't think so, I said. I slept really well. Her gaze lingered awkwardly on my face. Of course. Sorry, it's none of my business. Probably just a bit of hay fever, eh? You drink your coffee. Hay fever. I dismissed it as a misunderstanding. But on my way out, passing the hallway mirror, I saw what she meant. My eyes were quite red, the skin around them swollen, exactly as if I'd been crying hard. I frowned into the glass at myself. I had no recollection whatsoever of tears. My next phone conversation with Russell was longer than the last and trickier. He didn't seem himself. He sounded as if he'd prepared a script. Maybe I could drive down and pick you up. It's the weekend tomorrow, he added with great cheer. And where are you, anyway? You still haven't told me. I opened my mouth. I'm in a room, in a village. But the words got smothered in my throat. I tried again. It's near Weymouth. Where near Weymouth? What's the village called? But again, I couldn't say it. I'm sorry. Olivia, just tell me where you are. I can't come and get you if I don't know where I'm going. I don't want you to come and get me, I said. But either he didn't hear this or he chose to ignore it, continuing with his rehearsed lines. I could come just as soon as I've taken the boys to their camp. So we could have some time on our own, maybe. It's out in Hampshire, this place they're going, pretty much on the way to Dorset. 
my brain took a moment to sort this new information. The boys are going to camp? Yep, Camp Abel, it's called. The camp for the exceptionally able. And their younger brothers, of course. He laughed. Jamie said they asked you about it a while ago. Oh, I don't remember. Well, I've signed them up for ten days, at vast expense, I might add. It was the only thing I could think of. I can't leave them on their own all day long without proper meals and everything, and I can't just suddenly stop working, can I? His tone had lurched abruptly from breezy to plaintive. Not his intention, I sensed, but it threw me nonetheless. Of course not, I said hastily. Well done. It sounds like the perfect solution. I'm sure they'll love it. There was a pause. Another unsignalled change of gear. You need to be back, he said curtly, seriously. I know you feel happier there at the moment, but you need to be back by the time the boys come home from camp. I didn't know how to respond to this sudden order. You've told them that? No, but I'm telling you. Whatever it is that's going on, you can have ten more days. After that, I can't fob them off any more, and nor can you. His words shocked me. I don't want to fob them off, I protested. You know that. I thought you said you understood. I do. I do. But you have to start seeing things from my point of view, Olivia. We've never been apart this long. I'm imagining all kinds of things that might have happened to you. An image crossed my mind of Tessa with her photos of Amanda. Try as I might, I simply could not identify either with her disaster scenarios or Russell's. But I've told you there's nothing to worry about, I said calmly. I'm all right. But how can you be all right? he demanded. If you were all right, you wouldn't still be there, would you? You have a family. We need you. The rest of the sentence was swallowed before I could catch it. And when he spoke again, his voice was fractured with tenderness. We really want you to come back. I know, I whispered. But it was as though his sudden show of vulnerability had the reverse effect to what it should have. It was the final trigger to my sense of disembodiment. I'm sorry, Russell. I really am. But I can't promise I'll be back by then. I have to do this in my own time. Do what, though? That's what I don't really get. There was another silence. It felt darker than the other ones and made me hold my breath low in my lungs. Just tell me, are you alone? He asked finally. What? I felt my heartbeat accelerate. Had Lindy said something about the letter? Had Maggie sent something else in my absence that Russell had opened? Some new riddle for me in case I had ignored the first? Russell might recognise Richie's name from ancient confessions. Remember our history. It would be impossible for him to understand. You know what I mean, he said. Wherever it is you are, are you with someone else? No, of course I'm not, I said firmly. I'm on my own. He sighed, as wretchedly as if I'd given the opposite answer. I think we need to talk properly, not on the phone. Please, just let me come and see you. Not yet, Russell. Please. And it was with this trading of marital pleas that the conversation came to an end. Actually, Richie said, it looks like I've got a bit of an issue with the first week of the school holidays. Oh, what? We were in his kitchen, preparing kebabs for the barbecue, while Wren lay snuggled on her beanbag watching a cartoon. Sarah's just told me they're going on holiday. A last-minute thing. Nick surprised her, apparently. A week in Lanzarote. Kids club for Chaz, the full works. It's all booked. Sounds great, I said. I'm glad Nick's done that. When I picked Wren up yesterday, I got the feeling Sarah was a bit cross with him. She says he's hardly ever home. Though I kept my eyes on the vegetables I was skewering, I felt the quick glance that came my way and I knew without looking up what it signified. Couldn't I see the irony in a remark like the one I just made? Hardly ever home. Richie had been so good at not bullying me into confronting my reasons for not going home. But this time, 
I could sense his reluctance in ignoring the opening. Anyway, I guess I'm gonna have to take a week off, he said finally, which is gonna cause big trouble at work. It's either that or take Ran with me. You don't have to do that, I said. I could look after her for you. I wouldn't ask you to do that. I broke open a bag of mushrooms, leaned across to rinse them under the tap. You're not asking. I'm offering. I'd love to, Richie, really. It would give me the chance to do the rest of the things people keep telling me to. Like go to see the swans. We could start a scrapbook together. She could take it to France with her. I don't know if that's such a good idea, do you? His hands were still. Why not? Finally turning to look, I saw that his lips were pressed into a single worried line. I put the colander down. Look, I know you think I'm in the throes of some sort of post-traumatic stress. Don't you think that? he asked. I don't know, I said truthfully. Maybe I am. All I can say is that I feel all right day to day. I really do. Whatever's happening to me, you can trust me with Wren. I can look after her, Richie. In a funny kind of way, it might even be good for me. How? Because she makes me feel normal. She makes me feel the feelings I'm supposed to feel. Richie stared, lips still tense. Don't you think you'd feel them with your own children? No, I said simply. The boys are much older. They don't need me in the same way. Another week won't make a difference to them. And anyway, Russell sent them off to a summer camp. I can tell you hand on heart that they will never have been happier. They love those camps, and we can't always afford to let them go. They'll see it as a treat. This sounded as much like good sense as anything I'd said in the last few weeks, and I could see that Richie was wavering. Maybe, he said, I don't know. Well, I do. Nothing would go wrong if I took care of Wren. I don't mind if you believe me or not, but there it is. And it was really all that I could say. When it came to Richie and Wren, I knew that nothing could go wrong. From the moment I'd first set foot in this house, I'd known that the right solution had presented itself, and that more would present themselves when they were ready. However confusing my conversations with Russell, however blocked my emotions about him and the boys, I still believed that. We continued with our tasks in silence. When the kebabs were finished, I began transferring them to a tray to take outside to the grill. Think about it, I said over my shoulder. I'd be very happy to help. Chapter 21 I don't think Richie intended to accept my offer. It made perfect sense that he should not trust with his child, a woman who was so singularly failing to care for her own. Then his client began talking of calling in other contractors to help, which meant taking the money from Richie's fee to pay them. He couldn't afford to let that happen, especially as he had no work lined up for afterwards. About Ryan, if you really think you'd like to, he said a day or two later. I nodded. Of course, if she's happy with the idea. She is. I asked her last night. Good. Then just let me know what time you need me to start. I was given a list of emergency phone numbers, including one for Grandma Jane, who lived near Southampton. So close? I asked, surprised. Yes, that's how I came to be on the south coast in the first place. Lisa was living at home when I first came over. Jane's normally over here every weekend, but she's been in Scotland for the last month looking after her brother. She doesn't get back until just before the trip to France. He didn't need to point out the obvious benefit of this, that he, or perhaps I, had been spared the sort of interrogations mother-in-laws were prone to making in such situations. A strange woman with unspecified family of her own turning up for dinner every night and stepping in when the childminder was away. She'd have every right to question it. And it only added to my conviction that my time here was charmed to have Richie and Wren to myself these last weeks, when at any other time it might not have been possible. It felt intended. 
Richie handed me a set of keys to the cottage. OK, one condition. What? If at any time over the next week you decide it's time for you to go back, then just phone me and I'll come straight away. Fine. You should go as soon as you do, he reiterated. I can sort something out for Ren with another parent. Don't put it off because of any obligation to me. I won't, he nodded. One more thing. You mean there are two conditions? I teased. But for once his attitude was one of proper rebuke and my smile faded. When Sarah's back, when I'm a bit less frantic, I'll drive you back. I stared, suddenly fearful. What do you mean? I'll drive you back to London. I think if you saw your house, where you live, if you saw your kids, you'd snap back. Snap back? Yeah, you know, recover. Like when people have amnesia in the movies, I think you need some kind of trigger. I imagined the boys, then, coming out of the house together, transferring their body weight to their heels in that way they did, as if to make a slide of the steps, bantering back and forth, trading insults and I imagine myself watching from the curb, feeling nothing but that same automatic certainty that they were fine on their own. This isn't a movie, I said. I don't have amnesia. But do you agree? You'll let me take you back. Yes. All right. That satisfied him. He was utterly confident I was going to reach this spell-breaking moment. He thought it was just a matter of time. And I did, too. I must have done, mustn't I? Otherwise, how was it that I could allow this distance to grow between me and the two boys I'd brought into the world? Three weeks, longer even, and still I had no intention of returning to them. My own children. How could I sit in some other family's house, at some other family's table, being briefed on the needs of someone else's child? I'd have to be some sort of monster. I had use of Sarah's car while she was away, and on the very first day, I took Wren to the swannery, or rather, she took me. She made straight for the rearing pens to inspect the signets, each of which she insisted she had previously identified and named, though they all looked exactly the same to me. She liked best the sight of a sleeping parent and baby, the baby with its neck curled into its own back, its beak buried snugly in its feathers. She called them Daddy and Baby, even though the adult was clearly female. She told me with impressive technical detail how the mating and egg-laying worked. They don't say family, she said gravely. They say clutch. That's nicer, I agreed. A clutch is like a cuddle. That's what I thought. It was interesting that she reminded me so little of the boys at her age. Yes, she chatted constantly, as Jamie had. But whereas he had argued, face puckered and intent as he delved ever deeper into new knowledge, she was more conversational. Her turns of phrase a mixture of Richie's and Sarah's, her eyes constantly scanning the space around her for a new curiosity to remark upon. Did you know that Daddy's allowed to sit on the eggs sometimes, but only to keep them warm while the mummy has a drink of water? Only the mummy can incubate. That's a big word. Because it's a very important word. Did you know they incubate for 35 years? 35 days, I corrected gently. Look at this, Wren. It says here they won't be able to fly until they're four and a half months old. She nodded knowingly. That's because they need to wait for all their feathers to grow first. They're not ready to leave their daddies. The signs said that some of the signets were slow to imprint, to recognise their parents. I wondered if the same were ever true of humans. After a happy hour's wandering, we took a break for a drink at one of the picnic tables. Sunlight trickled through the tall trees and threaded gold through Wren's long hair. Gradually, I was getting to know every last bit of her, from the newest freckle on the curve of her left nostril to the stubborn piece of sleep in the corner of her right eye. I thought she was the most beautiful girl I'd ever seen. Look at you, I said, with your gorgeous freckles, 
you're like a little speckled egg. You've got a speckle of freckles. She giggled, pleased with the rhyme, and sucked at her juice. Overhead, a sudden breeze caused quivers in the foliage, and the sun fully broke through, spotlighting her face and making golden stars of those long-lashed yellow eyes. It was as if they'd been touched with a wand. I sighed. You're lucky to be so pretty, sweetheart. You have no idea. I'd seen a documentary on TV once about child development. I'd watched them constantly when Jamie was first diagnosed. Diagnosed? As if he had some sort of illness. In which the presenter had asked the expert what people could do to make their children more popular at school. And the answer was, make them pretty. Take time over their appearance and presentation. Because, like it or not, the prettiest children were the most popular. How sad, I thought. Thank God I have boys and not girls. Maybe it had worked out for the best after all. Livia, did you know my mummy really loved birds? Wren said quite suddenly. That's why I'm called Wren. This was the first time she'd mentioned Lisa to me. I thought that might be the reason, I said. It's a beautiful name. Daddy says it's perfect for me because I'm so little and also I really like singing. Well, he's right, I paused. Do you remember your mummy much? No, I was too young when she was here. This was said matter-of-factly, just like Richie, and followed up with another noisy suck of apple juice. But it doesn't matter because she remembers me. Did you know... She sends down love from heaven every hour. Every hour? Wow. Yes, I know how to tell the time. I'm the only one in Reception Matthews who can. Every time the big hand is on twelve, my mummy sends love down to me. Her eyes were wide with pure trust. It was all I could do not to grip her to me and not let go. I think she's probably sending it more than once an hour, I said. All the time, I bet. You mean even when she's sleeping? I should think so. But extra when the big hand is on the twelve. She was thoughtful for a moment. Do you send love down to your darlings? Her question caught me off guard. Uh, yes, I do. Do they know to look at the clock? I smiled. I'm not sure they do, actually. But they're a lot older than you, so it probably feels a bit different to them. You could almost read the workings of her mind in the patterns of her irises. Why don't you live at home with them? I breathed in. Well, I do, usually. I know it seems strange, but they are busy doing exciting things of their own this summer, and I'm here having a rest. Looking after me, she corrected. That's not resting. Well, it is in a way, because it's not what I'm normally doing. So it feels like a rest. But it is what you're normally doing now, she said. There was hardly time to consider this when she thrust out her hand and proposed we compare clenched fists. Did you know your heart is the same size as your fist? That's how you tell. Her eyes clouded. But how do you tell how big a bird's heart is? They don't know how to do a fist. You ask such clever questions, I said. That's what Daddy says. I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that one. Or any of them. Not really. Daddy will know, she said confidently. Try as I might, I couldn't remember the boys invoking me like this. Mummy will know. It had no familiar ring to it. Daddy knows more than Mummy, they would say, if there were ever a difference of opinion. Jamie had parroted Russell. And Noah, Jamie and Russell. But before long it was a moot point, for they were both quoting their class teachers at Herrings above any other authority. Before we left, we checked the information board that announced the various interlopers spotted recently on site. The geese and black swans and occasional pink flamingo. I read the text aloud while Wren nodded sternly. Geese are naughty, very naughty, but I don't think the swans would mind if a flamingo came to play. I wouldn't mind. Walking to the car park, she slipped her hand into mine. 
Her grasp was trusting and confident. Her little fingers smooth against my palm. The back of her hand soft. Softer than anything I'd touched before. Chapter 22 The first time Richie and I kiss, we are on the beach, after all. After all, because this has always been the backdrop in my fantasy. The sun-drenched Californian beach of the movies. How I imagine Richie's hometown of Santa Cruz to be, with sand and ocean swept up in a giant swirl of gold and blue. Our sand is not golden, however, but clay grey, and the ocean looks like stewed tea rather than liquid sapphire. It's a cold day as well, the sky all angry and swollen, and it's probably true to say that all but those busy falling in love might wonder what on earth they are doing here. In the old Coast Guard's cottage that Warren has rented for the five of us, cabin fever has set in, causing Mum and him to bicker, the first strife I've seen between them. Dean, meanwhile, has disappeared into the nearest town to call Amy from a phone box. He's not expected back any time soon. Richie and I go for a walk in the rain. I have the hood of my cagoule up to cover my hair and most of my face, but he just lets the rain flatten his hair to his skull and batter his skin until the tan is backlit with pink. He looks like a movie star, like someone's created the rain just for this scene. We kick soggy sand, throw stones into the water, and then, when we're finally beaten by the wet, hostile wind, we look for somewhere to shelter. At last, we find an old concrete bunker from the war. They used to call these pillboxes, I tell him, because of the shape. He leans away from me to take a better look. No way. It's so tiny. You see that hole? They'd look out through that for the Germans coming. I'm used to him being the one with the information, with the experience, so it feels good to be in possession of an unknown fact. Great for blowing smoke out as well, he observes, reaching for his cigarettes. And he taps one on the side of the pack, in a ritual that has become familiar and wonderful to me. After several attempts, he finally lights it, and we settle just inside the doorway with our backs against the rough concrete. I would never have done this alone in case of mice. We're side by side, virtually shoulder to shoulder, like we're confined together in a lift. So close, I can see the individual hairs on the lean calves that stretch from his cutoffs. Do you think igloos are this small? I ask him. He considers. I think igloos are probably any size you like. They probably have, like, stadium igloos. Yeah, for ice rockers. He laughs, and I feel my face glow with pleasure. I love making him laugh. I've noticed it's how he rates people, whether or not they click with his humour. I ache with feelings for him. Feelings I can only assume are love. I recognise them from descriptions in novels and from the faces of actresses on TV. A kind of joy, jagged with terror. Day-to-day -day functions like eating and drinking have become mechanical to me, and that's how it will be until the moment I know for sure that he doesn't feel the same. That's how it is for me. I'm expecting a no. I could never allow myself to expect a yes. It can't just be the cold that's making us sit so close together. There must be some other pull. Whatever it is, there can never be a better time for me to make my move. We are completely alone. There's not another living soul for at least a mile. There's no risk of being disturbed. If, when, it goes wrong, as it will. Whatever I've said or done can be denied later. Definitely by me. Preferably by both of us. But... Tethered by fear as I am, I do nothing but sit back and wait. We talk about Dean and Amy, agree that they will lose touch when Amy goes to college in the autumn. He's been lucky, though, Richie says, to attract the interest of a hot, older girl. Back home, there'd be a lot of kudos in that. That last comment doesn't inspire me with confidence, since I'm two years younger than he is but I've hardly had time to begin to wallow in it when Richie is asking, So, 
Is there anyone you're into? Not really, I shrug. Well, not in school, anyway. I hear the second part of my answer, as if it's been said by someone else, a mischievous girlfriend or even an enemy, and I almost gasp at the treachery of her, landing me in it like this. I open my mouth to suck back the words or, failing that, laugh it off. But it's too late. To my right, Richie has turned his face towards me, giving me that stomach-melting half-smile of his. What does that mean? He says, voice low and dry, breath warm on my cheek. My hands are on the ground at my sides, and he reaches for the one between us and begins rubbing away the dust with the pads of his thumbs. Then, as I look to see if this is really happening, he moves his face closer to mine and says, You're very cool, you know. Cooler than your friends. Kids like Melanie. I don't think so. Well, I think so. Dolly. He's picked up on my mother's girlhood nickname, the nickname I've come to realise she's been using to make a child of me again, to stop anyone, Richie, seeing me as a woman. Don't call me that. It's embarrassing, like I'm five years old or something. I think it's kind of obvious you're older than that. His glance moves briefly downwards to my chest beneath the cagoule, and the flush in my face surfaces at exactly the moment his mouth makes contact with mine. There's a delay before the nerve endings in my lips send the details of the sensation to my brain, and then they explode and settle like moon dust. It's salty and sweet at the same time. It's hotter than I'd imagined, but it makes me shiver, too. It starts with my lips, but it radiates towards every last molecule of my body. He presses closer, blanketing me with his heat. It's a one-way process. He can warm me, but I cannot cool him. I like it inside the hat box, he murmurs into my neck. The damp causes a drag between his skin and mine. I really like it. I giggle. Pillbox. Okay, pillbox, whatever. Then he says, Can I come to your room tonight, when the others are asleep? I don't hesitate. Of course. We sleep together for the first time on the night of my 16th birthday. Earlier, Mum has prepared a special dinner, and seems pleased by my obvious happiness even if she isn't quite as clear as she thinks she is about its source. Look how popular you are, she cries, as a large heap of presents and cards is revealed, some from my friends, transported from home by Dean. Everyone surrounds me as I work through the pile, nudging his or her own to the top. It reminds me of younger years, when everyone in the family would climb onto the bed of the birthday boy or girl, parent or child, and presents would be opened while he or she was still tucked under the duvet. If it weren't for the fact that Dad is missing, this would be a perfect celebration. But that's how it's going to be now. My parents are permanently apart. I have to be grown up about it, especially now I'm grown up myself. Sixteen. As Richie has guessed, this is the first time I have had sex with anyone. It's hard not to tense, like I'm about to be inoculated, to use my hips to defend rather than invite. But in the end, the pain is mostly lost in the breathlessness of his weight on me, the distraction of his lips, which hardly leave mine during the whole event, as if he guesses that I can only get through this if I share the breath from his lungs. Our bodies are joined at almost every possible point, and I'm drunk with the closeness of it with how safe his body feels, how sheltering. Silently, stretching up from the bed, he eases open the window and lights a cigarette. I watch the rise and fall of his smooth brown chest as he recovers his breath. I speak first. I don't think we should tell anyone about this. For the first time I take the cigarette when it's passed to me. Oh, I think they already know I smoke, he jokes. You know what I mean. Let's keep it between us. He raises an eyebrow, grins broadly at me. Already I feel more adult, wiser to his teasing, as if the club I've just joined is not the one for the sexually active, or even the cigarette smokers. 
but the one for people who've learned how to banter. Seriously, Richie, I drawl, smiling back at him. Sure, goes without saying. His eyes narrow as he peers into the night. I wonder what he's trying to make out. I guess it could look a bit incestuous, but it's not, obviously. No, but I still don't think they'd approve. Do you? He asks, staring directly into my eyes. Do you approve? And I realize he really isn't worried about them at all, only about me. Here and now, we're free of them all. I want to remember this feeling forever. Maybe because of the cigarette, my voice sounds hoarse. Of course I do. Enough to do it again. After that, he comes to my room every night, except for the Thursday before we leave, when he and Dean go to a club in the local town and don't return until the early hours. The next afternoon, I learn that they thumbed a lift at dawn with a lorry driver, got dropped a mile away, and had to cross fields bogged with rainwater. Warren says there's cow pat on their shoes, and Mum has chucked the offending footwear onto the path outside. Not only that, but one of them has been sick on the bathroom floor, and they argue over which of them it was. When all this is related to me, they each gesture secretly behind the other's back, in a bid to convince me of their own innocence, and I feel suddenly at the centre of everyone's attention, at the centre of everything. Maybe that's it. That's the shift that Mum notices. The focus is no longer on her and Warren or even on Richie, but on me, little Dolly Lane. For the whole of the final weekend, she's walking about with her head angled to one side in that way she does when there's something niggling her, biting her lower lip in concentration, like she's trying to place a forgotten face or a half-familiar voice. It doesn't help that we're still trapped indoors the rain causing floods in the drains outside and making brooks of the pathways. The conditions that have brought Richie and me together have also conspired against us, and Mum has nothing to do but watch and listen. Olivia, what's going on re-Portugal? What am I supposed to tell the boys? Russell. As he waited in the cafe by his office for his sister-in-law to arrive, Russell examined the sent messages on his phone one by one, as if by looking at his own communications to his wife, he might be able to reshape his feelings, to spot some clue as to her lack of response. He sensed it was not a healthy activity, what am I supposed to tell the boys? Looking at the words, he could recall exactly how he'd felt as he pressed the send key. Self-righteous, and worse, hopeful. He'd even waited a full five minutes with the phone in his hand, genuinely expecting her call to come. He should have known it wouldn't. This thing with Olivia, whatever it was, whatever it was turning into, was not going to be resolved in a single phone call. She could not be manipulated with emotional blackmail. Nor could she, evidently, be manipulated with the reminder of their annual family holiday. With a single command, he deleted his collected pleas for mercy. Everything had changed anyway, hadn't it? And not for the simple matter of time. Two weeks was a break, but four was, what, a clean break? 
but ever since he'd done what he'd strictly forbidden himself to do, snoop. The previous evening, he'd burrowed himself in Olivia's papers, working his way through the various places she kept her documents and correspondence. The kitchen drawers, the bottom bookshelf in the living room, the overstuffed filing cabinet with the lower drawer that wouldn't close. He'd scanned everything from bank statements to birthday cards, even a stack of teenage love letters, in his bid to find something that might constitute a clue. And after two hours of looking, he had found it. It was in front of him now, a letter from his wife's GP, dating from over a year ago. Dear Mrs Chapman, thank you for coming to see me recently. Following our consultation and your subsequent meeting with our practice counsellor, Helen Meadows, I've concluded that you're probably suffering from moderate depression. Please phone our reception at your earliest convenience to book a further session with Ms Meadows. After she has made a full assessment, I will be better placed to advise you on a hospital referral. Yours sincerely, Dr Henley, Head of Mental Health, East Lane Surgery. Russell had not the first idea whether his wife had followed up this request, whether she'd booked one session or fifty with Ms Meadows, whether she had ever set foot in the hospital, and presumably what they were talking about here was its psychiatric unit. That was when he'd phoned Beth, his almost qualified counsellor sister-in-law. Beth, it's Russell. Could we get together sometime soon? Tomorrow, if you possibly can. I think I may have a bit of a problem. With Olivia. I could really do with your advice. He ordered cappuccinos for both of them, though coffee was the last thing he needed. He didn't think he'd ever been so aware of his adrenal glands. Thanks for coming into town like this. He said, I know it's out of your way. That's okay? Beth looked and sounded completely fresh. Her hair was in a kind of ballerina's bun, her glowing face bare of makeup. Her voice was balanced and sane. She was nothing like the over made up office girls who filled the tables around them, crashing the acoustics with their screeching conversations. Was it just him? Or was working life turning into a permanent hen night? Sometimes he feared for the men of Jamie's and Noah's generation. I can't believe she's still not back, Beth said, frowning. I was just asking Dean when I got your message. Aren't you guys going on holiday next week? Russell nodded. Yes. To be honest, I'm starting to get a bit worried. That's why I wanted to talk to you alone. We wondered about that. They'd have speculated about his phone message to within an inch of their lives he realised. Since meeting in the pub almost two weeks ago, he'd been reluctant to keep them up to date. Pride had prevented him. Until now. Whatever you need, Beth prompted politely. He breathed deeply. He had decided not to mention the GP's letter, which was, after all, a confidential document. I found a book about depression that Olivia was reading before she left. I think she might be having some sort of, you know, emotional problem. Emotional problem? Yes. A few days away to think about Maggie is one thing. A week or two even. But this long is something else, isn't it? He'd hoped for an immediate contradiction, but Beth looked only relieved that he had said it first. I agree, it's worrying. And to not come back for the holiday. Normally, she lives for these breaks, doesn't she? Russell didn't know quite how to respond to that. It sounded as if she thought Olivia had nothing else to live for. Was it as bad as all that? He couldn't bring himself to ask. Seeing him flounder, Beth took charge. OK, let me get completely up to date. You've found a book about mental health. Did you mention to Olivia that you found it? No. But you've spoken to her recently? Yes, a few times. Russell quoted the parts of the conversation that had made most sense to him. She's still taking time out. She can't say when she'll be ready to come back because she doesn't know herself. She feels better already. This last was from her first call weeks ago now. I feel better already, Russ. But he had begun to cling to it as to a lifebelt. 
He didn't add that the last experiences of speaking to her had been increasingly unsettling, even before his discovery of the letter. Something was wrong with Olivia, something he hadn't experienced before. There'd been an absentness about her, which, combined with the professions of personal emancipation, had made her sound sort of brainwashed. If she is having some sort of problem, then should I be looking for her a bit more seriously? Get the police involved or whatever. I've been trying to keep it low-key for the boy's sake, but I'm starting to think I should be a bit more proactive. No, I wouldn't contact the police, Beth said thoughtfully. Not if you're speaking to her regularly. She's obviously not at risk in any way. Would it not be easiest just to drive down there and talk to her face to face? Russell looked away, embarrassed. Well, it would. But the thing is, I'm not sure where she is. What? I thought you said she was... In Dorset, yes, but she's never actually told me where. All I know is it's by the sea somewhere near Weymouth, and it's hard to get a signal on the phone. It could be a hundred different places. I see. Beth paused to sip her coffee doing a decent job of hiding her shock. Has she been in touch with the boys? They've had a text most days, not saying much, just that she misses them, that kind of thing. But I asked her not to phone them for now, not while she's so unpredictable. But they may be able to find out where she is. I don't want to use them for that, Russell said firmly. I don't want them to know I don't know. Thank God for mobile phones, otherwise they'd be wanting an address to write to her. He tried to smile. Not often you hear that kind of sentiment from a parent, eh? Beth's smile began gamely enough, but faded quickly. Have they tried phoning her? Russell shook his head. She never picks up her phone. The signal problem, I suppose. She always has to call you back. And I must admit I haven't encouraged it. I've told them she needs a rest and shouldn't be bombarded with calls from us. If they phoned her and she didn't phone back... Well, I don't want them to be disappointed. She's never let them down before, or they'd be devastated. This way, I can keep them completely protected. She's never let them down before. There it was. He was finally acknowledging it publicly. He thought that what Olivia was doing was causing the boys damage. Okay, damage was too strong a word, but harm. If it went on much longer, yes, harm. He saw that Beth seemed to be struggling with herself, with the desire to admit something to him, he guessed. What is it? Don't hold anything back, Beth. This is getting serious. She nodded. I haven't told you this before, Russ, but I did mention medication to Olivia once. Medication? He wasn't expecting that. What kind of medication? You know, antidepressants. I thought it might be a help. Just in the short term, of course. I'm not saying she was at her lowest ebb. Just that, with everything going on, she must have been a lot lower than any of us realised. When was this? he asked. Last summer. A little over a year ago, maybe. So you've suspected she was depressed for a year? Beth gave another reluctant nod. But she said she didn't want to go there. And I respected her choice. Of course. Feeling his pulse quicken, Russell made a spontaneous decision. It was time to break his wife's confidence for the first time that he could consciously remember. Did Dee never tell you Olivia took something like that when she was younger? He could see that Beth was genuinely surprised. No. It was before I met her. She told me she'd been prescribed some kind of tranquilizer when she was at college. There'd been all those problems with Maggie coming and going during her A-levels, messing everything up. She doesn't talk about it much, but it's obvious from what she has said that it got pretty serious. I remember when I met her, she said she'd taken time out from college because she couldn't cope, and there was a psychiatrist she'd been seeing. She hadn't had a boyfriend for years. He groaned, overpowered suddenly by the idea of how little vigilance he'd displayed in this area over the course of their marriage. Or at least latterly. You might even describe it as negligence. 
but she changed so much after we got together, she was really happy. She stopped seeing the doctor. I assumed it had been a one-off thing, to do with teenage hormones and not having a normal mother to support her. Beth shook her head. God, that woman did just enough to screw them up, didn't she? To keep them hanging on by the umbilical cord. Russell couldn't have put it better himself. There was a silence of shared regret as they both turned to their coffees. Shit, he said, surfacing first. Is the same thing happening again? What the hell am I supposed to do next, Beth? Beth blinked brightly at him, and he sensed her determination to turn this crisis around. Well, the first thing is not to jump to conclusions, but to take her at her word. Accept that she's doing exactly what she says she is, clearing her mind, taking a break, a temporary one. Whatever she's feeling, it's obviously fairly controlled. Otherwise, she wouldn't be phoning you to check in like this. Plenty of people just disappear without a trace. That's when you really need to worry. This isn't an emergency like that, and it doesn't sound nearly as profound as what you've just described. Don't forget, this has stemmed from bereavement, Russ. It's important we keep it in perspective, not least for Olivia's sake. At this pronouncement, Russell felt his chest deflate with relief. He remembered the GP's wording in his letter. Olivia had moderate depression. Moderate meant manageable, salvageable. Should I give her some sort of ultimatum then, do you think? I mean, not in a heavy way, but if I keep on saying fine, no problem, maybe that's not what she needs to hear. It wasn't what he'd been saying, either, though he didn't tell Beth that. He was deeply ashamed of the way he'd spoken to Olivia that last time, not only for his attempt to force a deadline on her, but also for that accusation he'd made that she was with another man. The notion had surprised him as much as it evidently had her. In all his speculations, as each new day added itself to the one before and deepened his doubt, he had not once believed her capable of the most common motivation for a spouse's departure. Infidelity. No, I wouldn't get into any kind of deadline, Beth said. I'm learning on my course that mental health doesn't really respond to that. A fragile mind will read a deadline as a new threat, something to fear, and that would only cause another flight reaction. Great. Well done, Russ. You're right. And four weeks, a month, isn't that long, is it? It's not like she'd left the country, like Maggie did, when Olivia was Jamie's age. But neither of them said what he knew they were both thinking. Russell drained his coffee, licking the foam off his lips. I suppose I'm just going to have to try and find her from here. How will you do that? He thought of the accommodation list he'd downloaded that morning from a Weymouth tourist site. If you counted all the guest houses and B&Bs and holiday lets, there were hundreds of them. He would take an alphabetical approach. It was probably too little too late, even if some receptionist did remember her from weeks ago. What was to say she hadn't by now moved on from the area? But it was something. You could always use a private investigator, Beth suggested. They'd ferret her out in no time. Russell thought irrationally of images from television. Men in vans, tracing phone calls and watching surveillance footage. Uniformed teens swooping to capture. Large, itemised bills. Just thinking aloud, she added, seeing his face. It won't come to that, I'm sure. She'll probably be back in the next few days, in time for the holiday, and we'll all realise there was nothing to worry about. As they rose to leave, Russell asked, Will you fill Dean in for me? Absolutely, and I'm sure he'll agree this is the right thing to do, or not do. Russell nodded, remembered suddenly something Olivia had once said about him years ago. It's great that Dean rates Beth's opinion so highly, even if we don't always agree with her. How nice that she has that. Had she been suggesting that such unconditional devotion was something she did not get herself? That he fell short? What had he said in reply? He couldn't remember. 
He couldn't remember saying anything at all. He'd neglected to notice, and now here he was discussing her fragile mind. Beth kissed him on the cheek. Give my love to the boys, and if I don't see you before you go, try and have a great holiday. Without Olivia, that was what she meant. He nodded. They hadn't even parted yet, but already he felt completely alone. I'll try, he said. <laughs>